I think we should. Um, and uh, put them up on the screen. Yeah. You have also done incredibly well. Could I ask people to come take their seats? Well, good morning, everybody. And thank you for a very early start and uh, for uh, coming all uh, from across the country to be here. I'm Jeff Sachs uh, and could not be more thrilled to have all of us together for the launch of uh, the Sustainable Development Solutions Network for the US. 
and thank you for all being founding members. I think we're here for very important and exciting uh, times together and activities that I hope and trust will strengthen your activities, uh, your universities, and collectively uh, the United States and the world. And I can't tell you how pleased I am that when the invitations went out to all of you, the responses from all over the country were prompt and enthusiastic, an overwhelming agreement that we should get together and we should work together to help move the United States and the world towards sustainable development. And it was extremely exciting and gratifying for all of us to see this uh, flood of uh, positive and enthusiastic and warm and encouraging responses uh, come in from all over the country. We have uh, universities that as our, of our count last evening have a combined uh, enrollment of 1.7 million students uh, represented in the room. That's a pretty good start. Uh, we really represent a, a lot of uh, higher education in the United States. There are many other schools that want to join and will be joining the network. Today, we're getting oriented. Uh, getting to know each other. So please mingle, say hello, introduce yourselves. Um, it's the start of uh, a great collaboration together. And also a bit of an orientation around the sustainable development goals for some of you at least, and for the SDSN uh, more generally, which will try to explain uh, its purpose and organization over uh, the next uh, few hours. Uh, we'll be joined uh, by two wonderful congresswomen this afternoon uh, who will talk a bit about the Washington scene uh, and uh, the importance of sustainable development in that context uh, in our session on politics and outreach uh, at 2.30 this afternoon. I'm thrilled that uh, joining me uh, in um, helping to launch this activity uh, are Dan Esty of Yale uh, and Gordon McCord of UC San Diego. Uh, the three of us will be uh, the co-chairs of this process going forward, um, and we are going to be completely uh, eager to be in regular contact with you and discussing and brainstorming how to be highly effective and how to be supporting you in these activities. I wanted to start this morning just with a quick uh, discussion of the Sustainable Development Goals because they bring us together and they are the purpose of the network. And they, I think, uh, merit uh, just a few minutes of orientation. I'm sure that uh, all of you, one way or another, are engaged with the SDGs, but for me, they are important because they are uniquely the globally agreed objectives of the world's governments about cooperation for development in the 15-year period 2016 to 2030. In truth, you might not know it all the time that they're the globally agreed objectives, but uh, indeed on September 25th, 2015, the Sustainable Development Goals were adopted by acclamation in the UN General Assembly by the world's leaders. They are, as you know, embodied within a document called uh, Agenda 2030, which is the uh, statement of intent and purpose for a global collaboration to achieve sustainable development during this 15-year period. These goals were adopted on September 25th, 2015, and a few weeks after the Paris Climate Agreement was adopted on December 12, 2015. 
And it was the understanding in this process that these two agreements were linked at the hip. And indeed, SDG 13 at the time had an asterisk, which said that what the UN was agreeing on September 25th was what would be agreed in the Paris Climate Agreement on how to control human-induced climate change. So I like to think of this agenda and the agreements reached in Paris a few weeks later as part of the same strategy. And indeed, the Paris Climate Agreement opens in the preamble with the statement that this is an agreement under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, but to promote sustainable development worldwide. So sustainable development is the governing principle of these two global agreements. In the UN jargon, sustainable development means not exactly what Gru Brundtland said in 1987 about meeting the needs of the current generation in a way that allows future generations to meet their needs, but rather the triple bottom line is the real message that sustainable development means economic prosperity, social inclusion, and environmental sustainability. So the idea is a uh, three objectives simultaneously being satisfied. And the goals, the 17 goals in a way group to uh, aim to accomplish those goals, several economic objectives, starting with the end of extreme poverty by 2030, SDG 1, and the end of hunger as defined by FAO uh, by the year 2030, several uh, guarantees of universal access to basic needs and under the UN law, basic human rights, access to health, access to education, access to safe water and sanitation, access to modern energy services, SDGs 3, 4, 6, and 7. SDG 8 and 9 are about decent jobs and infrastructure. And those are the main economic objectives. In social inclusion, I would highlight SDG 5, gender equality and SDG 10 to reduce inequalities within and among nations, and SDG 16, which is for the rule of law and peaceful and inclusive societies. As you know, each of these has targets and agreed uh, measurements uh, alongside them. We'll be saying quite a bit about uh, measurement the official measurement system isn't really up to the task. So there's a lot of movement of new ways to measure and uh, getting new metrics and using what we can and developing uh, new kinds of uh, data, which is a very important part of uh, this process because without the measurement, there's no management and there's no accountability. And the official systems are very slow. So there's a lot of need for <coughs> improv for improvising or developing new measurements. But each of the goals that I'm mentioning has uh, within it, of course, several targets, sometimes very specific. SDG 3.1, maternal mortality should be below 70 deaths per 100,000 live births or uh, under five mortality below 24 deaths per thousand births and so forth. And others are more vague. There should be rule of law, reduce corruption, and so forth, and which require some definition, metrics, and, and so on. But it is a structure. Uh, and uh, the third dimension of uh, the uh, objectives is the environmental, and they are mainly 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15, uh, sustainable cities, uh, circular economy, SDG 12, uh, climate action, which is basically the Paris Climate Agreement, SDG 13, uh, conservation of marine ecology uh, and ecosystems, SDG 14, and 
conservation of terrestrial ecosystems and biodiversity, SDG 15. And then SDG 17 is that the world should work together in a variety of ways to achieve these goals, including several rather specific, completely unmet uh, objectives about financing that developed countries should provide uh, committed uh, official development assistance, the debt relief, which is SDG 17.4, should uh, support the poorest countries to achieve uh, the goals and so on. So these are the global aspirations. They're complicated. They are not right, in I'm a fundamental sense embedded in almost any country's politics with always the possible exception of Sweden, which does everything perfectly. But Sweden doesn't even have a government now, so you can't even say that about Sweden now. And in the United States, they are, mm, they're in our classes. They're mentioned once in a while, but you would not normally expect to hear very much about this from certain political leaders and uh, from Washington in general. And the concepts are not well known in the United States. And while some of the ideas are very much part of our politics, local, state, even occasionally national, uh, this as a framing is definitely not uh, something that has you know, quickly or at, even at all almost been embedded into our national discourse. I serve as special advisor to the Secretary General on the Sustainable Development Goals. <coughs> and my main lesson from that is there are a lot of countries in the UN, so I'm on the road or in the air all the time visiting uh, the 193 UN member states. And these goals actually play a surprisingly uh, present role in dozens of countries around the world. You wouldn't know it from our discourse in the United States, but in almost any other country, they're recognizable to the cabinet, for example. A president might make uh, remarks about the SDGs uh, in a speech. There will be an interministerial uh, uh, task force uh, there will be embedding the SDGs into a national plan, something like that. And so they have a resonance that is not uh, what you might guess in the U.S. context. And it's a few countries, maybe a couple of dozen, they have a very high prominence that a government official would naturally say, that is our framework. We must achieve the SDGs by 2030. Almost any planning minister or economy minister in the world would have this chart on their walls in the ministry and would be orienting around them and able to stand up and give a speech about what our government is doing to meet the SDGs. And we also have a UN process called the Voluntary National Review, which takes place each summer where governments report what they're doing. They generally, of course, report the good things and not the bad things. So the reporting is not very systematic. Uh, it's a lot of uh, cherry picking of uh, look at how good we are on SDGs 4, 7, and 12, not look at how miserable we are on uh, some of the others and so forth. But that voluntary national review will have involved 140 of the 193 governments by this coming summer, because there's a there, there's a list, uh, and I think about 110 countries have reported so far, and another uh, batch of 30 or 40 will report this July. This year in September, and this is for us to think about for, as an organization, uh, there will be a summit of heads of state about the SDGs because the idea is it's a 15 year period and every four years at the head of state level, there will be a, um, a, a summit 
This year's summit will be September 23, 24 in New York. We will have a meeting not on those two days, but on the days after that, uh, a conference on sustainable development, which you'll will tell you about and which you're all invited to. And we should think about organizing a meeting of the uh, SDSN USA at that time, certainly uh, around that week. So I'm hoping that that's a big week for public attention and public awareness worldwide on the sustainable development goals. Indeed, it better be because the whole purpose of having a summit at the level of heads of state is that you somehow break through uh, the confusion for a day or two to let people know and to have thousands of stories written around the world and to have television uh, coverage of the sustainable development goals. When the goals were first announced in 2012, uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon uh, and I spoke about engaging the world's universities in this effort. And we decided to launch the Sustainable Development Solutions Network uh, at uh, that moment. Ted Turner immediately gave some support uh, financially and organizationally to help us get started. So SDSN began in 2012. And so we're in the sixth year of trying to get the world's universities organized to play a leadership role in sustainable development and in climate change. There are now about 800 or so universities around the world that are engaged in this network. And there are, I think the count is, uh, we're going to hear about it in a moment, 27 chapters, some regional, some national, that have gotten organized or are getting organized. Uh, earlier this year, Canadian universities uh, joined together uh, as we are today at University of Waterloo to get started uh, in March next year. Uh, universities in Mexico will come together at uh, Tech de Monterey and UNAM uh, for the Mexican chapter. So we'll have a North American uh, grouping uh, that can also work together on a number of uh, regional issues. Last month, we launched the France SDSN and uh, also a network for the Black Sea region, which is very interesting including the Caucasus, Ukraine, Turkey, Greece. So a lot of countries that don't have easy relations with each other, the universities always have good relations. And so this is one of the wonderful things about us being at universities, which is we can speak and do speak the same language across uh, continents uh, and easily work together uh, at times when the political forces uh, are not as aligned as uh, the knowledge base, the science, the data, the evidence, and the ecosystems, which inevitably cut across uh, geographical and political jurisdictions as well. So just to conclude, we're here to help promote the SDGs and sustainable development in the United States and promote it by an alliance of universities. And yes. the alliance of universities should be well, leading in a number of ways. First, stand up training our students and educating our students. Uh, and I see so our President uh, Lee Bollinger at Columbia yes. University, and thank you, Lee, for being here. Uh, I was lucky to join Columbia the same day that President Bollinger started. and. From that moment, President Bollinger, I will say, championed the idea of teaching sustainable development. So we made a college major, a PhD program, many master's programs in sustainable development to have a full curriculum of sustainable development. That is one purpose of our gathering is to promote the teaching of sustainable development and develop a generation of young people who think systemically, intersectorally, 
uh, and with the, uh, the the end purpose, the telos of sustainable development. And that's obviously a fundamental role for all of us. A second is, of course, our research agenda. This group knows a lot about this subject and knows also uh, the areas where research is essential. Part of our purpose of being here is to do together research projects in a new way, I believe, in some sense, I hope, in part, we can act like a virtual think tank uh, that can be working together on applied research issues. For example, I hope we can, at least for many of us, those who are interested, <coughs> work together on how the U.S. energy system can be decarbonized in a short period of time, a fundamental need. And by virtue of having, by the way, we have 39 states represented here and universities coming from 39 states, and we'll have all 50 states given the responses uh, that uh, we've been getting. We'll have a unique opportunity to have local reality in a national scale uh, program. And so each of you will know a lot about your renewable energy resources uh, locally available, about uh, grid and regulatory uh, challenges and so forth. And that is a unique base for working together to produce a kind of study that otherwise cannot be produced by any of us individually. So that's a second part of what I hope we will get out of this. A third part is convening power and support for a political process that let's just say is very challenged. Uh, it is unfortunately the case in the United States <coughs> more than most high income countries that I know that we are not planning and thinking ahead. We don't have the institutions working right now in the United States to even have a 20 year energy transition. We literally don't have the organizational means. We don't have white papers anymore, green papers, policy documents, uh, assessments. The things that we used to have as tools for long-term thinking are almost gone in Washington. And so I think we have to help to fill a gap that is really a burdensome gap right now. And that means working with government officials, working with elected representatives, <coughs> helping them to understand the realities better and what can be done and actually some prospective design uh, uh, measures. As I mentioned, we'll have uh, two congresswomen joining us uh, in the afternoon. Uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Ortiz will join by Skype uh, and uh, um, Tulsi Gabbard uh, from Hawaii will join us in person. And this is wonderful. And when I mentioned it to them uh, that we're all meeting, they said, phenomenal. Uh, we need help. Uh, we need uh, the kind of uh, planning and knowledge base to enable us to do our jobs. Uh, and so I think that this is uh, really important for the whole U.S., but I would say especially at the national level right now, that if we can reflect a nationwide capacity to brainstorm and think and convene, it could be a real contribution. So all of that is to say I'm thrilled and uh, I have already spoken too long. Uh, I apologize uh, for that. But uh, I just want to tell you, thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. So, Jeff, thank you very much. Um, thank you all for being here. Maybe you should stand up because there's some people that won't see you otherwise. Yeah. So thank you all for being here. It's really a pleasure to see this group gathered. It's a special joy to have, uh, as one gets uh, later in an academic career, former students. Uh, in the audience, colleagues with whom I've written and worked, 
and then so many new faces. So it really is a joy to have uh, this knowledge network emerging. I am Dan Esty. I've been teaching at Yale for now almost 25 years um, and have been working on these issues of how we measure policy performance on sustainability issues uh, for almost that entire period. Uh, I've been developing over that time with uh, some of Jeff's colleagues at Columbia in the Earth Institute, uh, the Environmental Performance Index, which is a gauge of country scale performance on uh, about 24 different dimensions of particularly environmental sustainability. And I have seen through that, and I know all of you must see the same, the enormous value of having scorecards, of tracking performance quantitatively, of understanding who the leaders are, who the laggards are, uh, of spurring some competition to keep uh, those at the bottom of any league table from being complacent in that disappointing position. The value of identifying best practices and of disseminating them. And I do think that's what this network can help do with regard to the sustainable development goals. Uh, I've also spent time in government uh, in and out over those um, recent years. I spent the late 1980s and 19, early 1990s at the US Environmental Protection Agency doing a number of things, including trying to bring quantitative measurement to environmental policy, but also negotiating the Framework Convention on Climate Change of 1992. And I wanna just pause for a moment and say, um, we've learned a lot since 1992. Uh, it's an important moment to reflect on that uh, with President George H.W. Bush lying in state. But there was a moment in the 1990s when people worked together across party lines and got things done. Uh, and that agreement, uh, which remains the uh, uh, foundation on which climate action builds today, uh, was achieved with enormous bipartisan support. Uh, in fact, do any of you know what the final vote of the United States Senate was on the 1992 treaty? Which of course, no one would imagine bringing a treaty to the United States Senate today. This is a good cocktail party question. Ninety-eight zero is a good guess, but not correct. It was done by division of the House, or the Senate in this case, meaning they simply asked people to stand. The vote was so overwhelming, they didn't call the roll. They didn't bother to even take a vote uh, by name because the support was so overwhelming. What a change in the intervening generation. And that is why I think we're here. Because while some of us believe and continue to believe that government has an important role to play, it's clearly not enough. Uh, and clearly not enough at the national level. Uh, what we now know and what I think all of us are part of building out is that carrying the agenda of sustainability will have to overcome one of the mistakes of that 1992 framework convention and frankly of environmental policy in the 20th century more broadly, which was to think the answers would come top down. Uh, we now understand very clearly that a bottom-up structure of implementation is critical. Targets can still be set at the national and global level, but the implementation, the delivery of sustainability is going to have to happen uh, at the city scale with mayors in the lead, at the state and provincial scale with governors and premiers, uh, at the corporate scale. And one of the joys of the last 30 years is to see how many companies are now on this agenda as opposed to resisting it and fundamentally more broadly across civil society, which is where we come in. It's very clear that this agenda will only move uh, if we inspire a next generation of students to lift it uh, and to carry it. And uh, I wanna just close with one other thought, which is to say that people often ask me, having recently served in state government, where I was the commissioner of Connecticut's Department of Energy and Environmental Protection uh, for three years, uh, having left three years ago, People ask, what did you learn in government? What was most striking in trying to get things done at the state level? And here's the answer, that change is really hard to deliver even when the status quo is plainly broken. So we are all stepping into a world of a plainly broken political status quo, of an enormous need to take up sustainability as an overarching mission of the 21st century of what I like to say, the sustainability imperative and I believe that this group will be critical to ensuring that that agenda becomes embedded in the students of tomorrow, the leaders of tomorrow, and the game plan of the next few years. 
because it's not going to come alone, surely from Washington, and probably can't come from national governments uh, across the world. State, local, provincial, city scale, corporate scale, and university leadership is what's going to be required. So thank you all for being part of this network. We really do have an emerging community of interest. Uh, I think this knowledge network that we're creating today and will build out over the coming years is going to be fundamental. And thank you for being here as we get it launched. Morning, everybody. I'll be very brief so that we can get on with our agenda, but just to, to give everyone the welcome uh, as well, especially for those of you who have come from far away. My name's Gordon McCord. I'm a professor of economics at the School of Global Policy and Strategy at the University of California in San Diego. So between the Northeast and San Diego, we are certainly bookending the continental U.S., although the network extends, of course, to Hawaii and Alaska and should extend to all the U.S. territories. And that's uh, certainly Puerto Rico and the other territories we should include. Um, I'm a proud graduate of Columbia's PhD program in sustainable development, and so um, I work on issues that transcend health, development, and the environment, mostly in Africa and Latin America, uh, and now engage strongly with Mexico on its land use planning through an SDSN project that's called FABLE that I'm happy to talk more about with you over the course of the day. So thinking about trajectories for uh, land use in Mexico and the U.S. for the 21st century, um, and uh, also heavily involved in launching SDSN Mexico, and given the integration of our two societies, our economies in terms of our supply chains, the migration issues, the land use issues through agricultural trade were, you know, very, very linked to the Mexican challenges and they are our challenges as well. And so thinking uh, creatively with all of you about uh, and with the Mexico uh, SDSN as well, um, I look forward to thinking creatively with you, thinking about how this network becomes more than the sum of our individual parts, as, as Jeff mentioned earlier. And uh, I welcome all of you and thank you for being here. From uh, the, the very start of the program, we uh, have had a wonderful uh, colleague uh, who uh, helped get the idea and the practice of national and regional networks uh, started, uh, Maria Cortez Poop. Uh, from Spain, uh, and uh, she's uh, uh, been a migratory part of our network, uh, starting in Spain, working in Paris, now working in Ottawa, uh, but working uh, virtually all over the world to create uh, uh, and help to support and manage uh, all of the 27 uh, national and regional chapters. So Maria is going to give us a um, an explanation of what they are, where they are, and how they work. Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. It's so exciting to see such a packed room. I, I feel that I've spoken almost with every one of you in the past uh, two months. Um, let me see. Hang on. Where do I have to point? Um, there you go. OK. Uh, like that. Maybe yeah. towards the... Toward. <laughs> towards where? Somewhere. Here, let me try. Oh, there we go. Great. Yeah, it's um, so the SDSN Networks program spans six continents. Uh, Jeff was mentioning before we have about 900 member institutions across the world right now. And as of today, 27 national and regional networks, um, 17 national and 10 regional networks. The regional networks cover areas that make sense for some reason. So let's say, for example, the Amazon or uh, the Sahel. The overall objectives of these networks is to have universities working together on, number one, localizing the SDGs, so thinking really about what does this agenda specifically means for us. So this is very different for a country like Canada to a country like Spain or a country like Sudan. What are the specific challenges that we're going to face? Um, do we need more granular da data to um, observe progress in these specific challenges? These kind of questions our networks are focusing on. Um, they're promoting high-level uh, education and research. 
um, they're launching solution initiatives or very innovative projects uh, that address some of these specific challenges. And they're thinking about these long-term pathways for sustainable development, such as what Gordon uh, just mentioned with our project Fable. Um, this is the current coverage. So in green, you will see our national networks, in blue, our regional networks, and in gray, those networks that are about to be launched uh, very soon. So I think it's quite exciting that we launched the Canadian network this year. We're launching the US network today, and then in the next few months, we'll be launching Mexico. Um, other networks to come, China, uh, where we've already been working through our SDG center, uh, Argentina, Peru, uh, South Africa. So what are some of the initiatives that these networks are doing? Oops, sorry. Uh, let's go back. Here we go. So SDG localization. So um, um, Dan was uh, talking about how important data and scorecards are. So for example, our, our Spanish network has just recently launched its SDG index for Spanish cities. Um, you'll hear more about the US SDG index for cities, but uh, the Spanish network just did evaluated the performance of the 100 more, more populated cities in Spain uh, towards the SDGs. And they're using this uh, report as a tool to approach municipalities and work with them on policies. Um, the SD, also, the Spanish SDSN has produced a series of policy briefs uh, in collaboration with our health thematic network uh, on how to achieve SDG 3. So they're covering topics such as how do we pay for SDG 3 or what's the role of new technologies in providing uh, early uh, assistance. Our uh, South Korean network, for example, in the last five years has organized up to 15 events around the topic of the SDGs and the Paris Agreement. They have produced eight substantive reports on why these are relevant agendas for Korea. And they have uh, issued up to three different set of recommendations to the government either on their voluntary national review or on the way to define a strategy for implementation. Um, our Andean network, for example, has uh, launched a project on the Mira Basin. This is a region that is a hotspot for biodiversity. At a very uh, difficult political time, the network was able to put researchers from both Ecuador and Colombia to work together with community leaders and help local policymakers to draft uh, conservation strategies that were based on research results. Um, our Great Lakes Network, for example, has set up, so this is the African Great Lakes, has set up a, a, a series of, uh, of uh, conferences where they invite researchers from different member institutions to present their research findings and link them to the SDGs. Um, at the end, about 70% of our networks some have achieved some sort of formal mandate from their governments to help them design the implementation strategies for the SDGs or prepare the v their VNRs, the voluntary national reviews. In terms of education, some of our networks are conducting a very systematic review of how to incorporate the SDGs in high-level education. They do that in partnership with their national president's uh, association. Um, other uh, networks are launching new education programs. So for example, our Malaysian SDSN has been working with the SDG Academy that perhaps uh, some of you know already. This is a, a very high quality uh, in body of uh, education program online that uh, we've been producing with leaders across the world. So the, the SDSN Malaysia is working with these materials, but in a blended way. So they have in-person classes that are targeted at the Malaysian uh, students and very specific for the Malaysian context. Um, some of our networks are launching SDG-focused summer programs, such as our Mediterranean network, our Amazon network, and some are uh, devising global partnerships. So we're doing also online education with the Inter-American Development Bank, mobilizing our Spanish-speaking uh, networks. Some of our networks are very focused on solution initiatives, so very transformative, uh, innovative projects. Here we're not only talking about specific uh, technologies, we're also thinking about uh, new 
policy instruments. Um, our Scandinavian network, for example, has worked in two, two different years in specific topics. So oceans was the first year. The second year was around the topic of migration and integration of migrants, um, thinking about solutions that could apply to the Scandinavian context. These conferences were very successful because they managed to bring together very high level public officials, but then also the private sector and philanthropies. Um, they issued two reports that have been also uh, used by the government. Um, our Amazon network has done a platform to map uh, different solutions that are being conducted in the Amazon region. And some other uh, networks are looking for a specific initiative that is very promising, that seems could be quite impactful for a challenge that is very important in the region, and they're incubating it up, up to completion. Um, and then we, we believe uh, that the best model for our networks is to have a, a really bottom-up approach where they're led by local leaders, such as our three wonderful co-chairs, uh, and local institutions that are responsive to local challenges. But then they are also connected to SDSN and through SDSN to SDSN's programs, as well as other international organizations. So uh, Gordon mentioned Fable. Uh, I think we're going to hear about many of the work uh, that our SDG index uh, team has done. Uh, we have our thematic networks focusing on data, on extractive industries, agriculture, cities, and health. And these are also um, bodies of work that the different national and regional networks are connecting with. That's all from me. Uh, I encourage you all to get your institutions to sign up to the network. Um, and thank you so much once again for coming and for uh, your incredible enthusiasm. like to uh, invite, thank you very much, Maria. i uh, like to invite uh, President Lee Bollinger of Columbia to come greet you and say a few words. And thanks, Lee, for, for being here. So um, very briefly. But I'm an expert in welcoming people to conferences, so that's, <laughs> I'm incredibly shallow and um, I can do this. But actually, I want to say something fairly uh, serious on this occasion. I mean, this is a wonderful, uh, wonderful achievement to put together a group of uh, universities to do this, certainly in the United States and definitely all around the world. And uh, this is a tribute to Jeff and all his colleagues and uh, really the capacity of Jeff, which is extraordinary to charismatically bring together people and institutions to, uh, to work on serious things. And Jeff is also uh, one of the greatest dreamers uh, that lives on the planet. And uh, we all benefit from Jeff's dreams. Um, what I want to say to you is that uh, what you are trying to do, what you are doing, I think we have to acknowledge in a profound sense cuts against the structure and framework uh, and the incentives and the behavior of people within our institutions, that is, within universities. By that, I mean that um, we are organized in a way that no sane person would put together an institution uh, like this. It was just crazy. So we essentially take very young people train them in our fields, take uh, uh, some of the very best and put them right into a discipline, into a department and give them extraordinary autonomy. Uh, I mean, it is a fact of life that no faculty member uh, has any conception of a boss. Uh, so so you, you, you have to understand that uh, this extreme decentralization model uh, 
is very much inclined to produce people who think about problems in a quite different way from the ways in which you're trying to think about them. And I believe the way we're trying to think about all of this at Columbia. I also think that the movement of many disciplines over the past uh, generation or two generations <clears throat> has been away from practical problem solving uh, and much more towards uh, solving uh, puzzles within a disciplinary framework, more or less disconnected from uh, the real problems of uh, human beings. And you do not have any real instinct or any structure for collaboration other than every now and then we say we're going to create this center or institute and bring people together from different disciplines to work on big problems. Well, the problem is, first of all, the disciplines aren't necessarily what we would want to draw on for this. And secondly, there's no, there's no positive uh, role for this. The university allows it to happen, uh, maybe even encourages a little bit with money. Uh, but it happens or doesn't happen as people sort of come forward. All of this is, um, uh, you know, a system I love dearly and I believe uh, has advanced human welfare in many ways uh, to extraordinary, uh, to an extraordinary degree. But it does have to be, we have to fight against that. We have to work against that. And so when you set out to create an alliance of universities, uh, especially in the magnitude that we're talking about here, and you really want to work on serious problems of the world, uh, you, you have this problem, we have this problem of how do you uh, take institutions, not just by the representatives here, but more broadly, and to actually bring them into a life, an intellectual life, a practical life, that they may be um, ill-equipped to handle or uh, not predisposed to want to be part of. I say all this by way of just a, a candid acknowledgement that universities do need to do what you are doing. Uh, and we have various things at Columbia, led in many ways by the Earth Institute, which is designed to try to do what you're doing. Yeah, but we have many more now because it is a belief of the institution that providing institutional purpose to this kind of thing is what's needed. So we now talk about four purposes of the university uh, at Columbia. Research, teaching, Public service, which is a kind of we need to do things for the communities that we're in. And we have to engage research and um, not just at Columbia, but broadly with practical problems, working with outside institutions that actually are very good at this. I mean, in many respects, we have to also be very modest about what it is that we can do. We can do some things very well, but we can't do them uh, as well as uh, needs to be done, and so we need outside partners, and forming partnerships is not also easy. So being practical, being oriented towards uh, human problems, working collaboratively at the institutional and uh, other levels is all a very great challenge. It even ought to be one of the sustainable development goals how do you take universities and make them more uh, involved with um, with human issues? So that's my um, that's my serious uh, issue, and I'll return to the shallow part and say we're really delighted to have this here at Columbia. Very proud of what it is that uh, Jeff is working on and his colleagues and all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lee. You can see uh, truly, uh, colleagues, why we're able to make uh, such uh, initiatives and headway at Columbia University because of President Bollinger. And uh, all through his speech, uh, Dan Asti was leaning over to me saying, that's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> and, and Lee, it is amazing. And we're really, really grateful to you. Thank you so much.
We're going to turn to uh, measurement issues and some of the measurements for the United States. And let me preface this by uh, saying a few quick remarks about uh, measurement. Um, there is a, a difficulty with 17 uh, targets, I'm sorry, 17 goals and 169 targets and a list of about 300 official indicators, many of which have no data in them uh, <clears throat> for many, many countries on assessing sustainable development. This is a multi-objective challenge by definition, and it's not easy indeed to measure precisely, meaningfully, and accurately most of these dimensions, much less all of them in some kind of program. At SDSN, we decided to work informally on this challenge from the start because the official processes which engage the national statistical offices across the world are, as one might expect, both conservative and very cautious. And so there's a quite long process of developing global consistent indicators, and it's very incomplete, and yet the world is moving very fast. At the same time, ironically, we're in the world of big data and instantaneous data, so in principle, we could know almost minute to minute about a lot of these things, and probably Google does, uh, or the National uh, Security Agency does, uh, but for those who are doing development work, sometimes we're using data five years out of date based on household surveys done seven years ago and reported uh, by the World Bank uh, years after that. And so we're in a measurement challenge. And the measurement has to be for understanding the state of the system as well as for management of change as well as accountability of governments for what is happening or not happening. And accountability can be on the basis of outcomes and on the basis of policies or on the basis of investments in particular areas. It's a big challenge. We've been producing at the SDSN for several years uh, a worldwide uh, report card, and it gets better each year. It's a kind of ad hoc operation, uh, but you can find it online. It's called SDG Index and Dashboards, and with the downloadable data sets uh, in Excel and Stata, and country rankings and diagnostics and so forth. <laughs> the United States, in uh, this most recent report, ranks 35th in the world on the state of sustainable development, because in many of the goals, in absolute terms, our wealth shows through. But on many of the goals, especially the environmental and the social objectives, the United States ranks quite poorly, uh, in fact. The country at uh, the top of the list is Sweden uh, this year, and always the Nordic countries show up at the top of the list because they combine high prosperity with low levels of inequality, high access to essential services, and a green, relatively green economy, though no one's really green. Everybody's emissions of greenhouse gases is far beyond anything remotely sustainable uh, in the high income world. So then we turn to the US in the last couple of years to do assessments at the state level. And we're you're about to hear the details of that in a moment, so I'm not going to give you the bottom line, but please pick up uh, the uh, issue of uh, Sustainable Development Report of the United States 2018 and also argue with it. This is a first time out, and you'll look at your state and say, what? That's crazy. That's not right, which is very likely true of a lot of the information in here because you collect it from standardized sources that can be themselves out of date or inaccurate and so on. But there's a very interesting information in here. 
A final uh, point that I want to mention, and it's something for us to think about, we brainstormed a year ago on the question of politically how to try to get these ideas more effectively into the U.S. politics. And I want to just introduce <laughs> one idea that uh, we've had, which is a tentative idea, and that was to try to simplify the 17 for the U.S context to focus on what are the priorities for the U.S. in this regard. And so actually in a bipartisan exercise, uh, we tried to summarize a subset which we called America's goals to uh, with focus groups and some polling to see how they resonate with the public. Very enthusiastic, by the way. Uh, so focusing on access to health care, access to uh, lower cost education, especially at the tertiary level, uh, focusing on political reform, because that's a major issue. It's part of SDG 16, but in the United States, it's felt to be a, at a crisis uh, dimension. And so we chose eight goals and called them America's goals and also have on the back a report card on those as well. So it's two different metrics, but basically all SDG based. We're going to have a, a quick summary of the findings uh, by the uh, the team that has uh, been doing this. I'm not sure who, Caroline, are you starting? Or So who's starting? Jess. Oh, you're here. Okay. So we've done this at the cities, at the state level, and uh, Jessica led the city's work, and Jessica's about to come talk to you about that. Uh, Jessica Espy, please. Thanks, Jeff. Before I start, a quick logistical point. I was encouraged to tell people to please come forward because there's more seats at the front and there's a lot of people standing. Um, so it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, my name is Jessica Espy. I'm a senior advisor to SDSN. And for the last few years, I've had the pleasure of directing our cities and our data work. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work we've been doing in the United States. Um, as Jeff said, I think going back to the point that was made before uh, by President Bollinger about Jeff's dreams, um, in 2013-14, before the SDGs had even been agreed, Jeff and Sonia, who's also here, said to me, let's go to Detroit and let's go to Baltimore and let's go to all these places and talk about the relevance and the feasibility of the Sustainable Development Goals in those contexts. Because if we can't do it here, where can we do it? So even before the SDGs were agreed, we um, somewhat precociously kicked off a, a project to work with a range of different cities across the United States um, on the Sustainable Development Goals. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about that and then hand over to my colleagues to talk a little bit more about the data and the metrics. Um, Firstly, I don't think I really need to, to go through this with everyone here because I think we're all converts to this important agenda. But one of the things that we often encounter when we start conversations with different city stakeholders, be they representatives from government or residents or so on, is why do the SDGs matter? Why do they matter for my city? Why do they matter for me? Uh, why would I care about them in my particular constituency? And the first thing to say is that in the United States, it's where approximately 80% of the population live within cities and the broader um, urban environments and urban areas surrounding um, those particular cities. So it is the concentration of where most of this kind of activity is going to happen. And the second thing to say is that the SDGs are unique in that for the first time ever, really, we have a global common non-partisan way of talking about these really complex global challenges. And so it's an incredibly valuable tool just to engage with res residents and different stakeholders and use a common language to talk about these issues. I'm not going to go through all of these issues in turn, but another one that I think we'll come back to is that related to that point about this being a sort of common non-partisan language is the SDGs are a really useful framework for peer-to-peer -peer discussions and engagement. And of course, that's something that the, the network aims to try and support. But particularly for cities across the United States, we've already found it's an incredibly powerful tool to start conversations between um, administrations that are Democratic or Republican to talk about um, you know, there are different complex sustainable development challenges on climate, environment, urban planning, CO2 reduction, etc. 
Um, and put fundamentally, I mean, the Secretary General summed this up himself incredibly well, what he said in 2015, the battle for the SDGs will be won or lost in cities. So it really is, as I said before, kind of the nexus of where a lot of this is happening. So um, I mentioned at the beginning, we started this project called the USA Sustainable Cities Initiative. And what we've been trying to do with that for the last few years is to provide technical support, uh, technical resources and guidance to different cities who have expressed a strong interest and willingness to um, in embark on the SDGs. And that's really what I'm excited to think that this network will be taking forward in a much bigger, much more sophisticated way. Um, we anchored it at local universities, so we started working with SJSU, so that's San Jose State University in California, and with Stanford, uh, with the University of Baltimore, as well as, of course, with Columbia. And then through those universities, started engaging with different city stakeholders. And I can't emphasize the importance of this arrangement enough because Baltimore provides an incredibly good example. We had a mayoral transition during the time that we were working on these issues in Baltimore. And what was incredible, and I'm actually gonna jump straight to this slide a bit further down, is that Mayor Catherine Pugh came in when this process had already been working for a while. But San Jose State University had already looked at the SDGs. They'd already looked at their relevance. They'd already tailored them to that particular city. They'd looked at the city's metrics and what was available and where the city was ranking on different aspects. And the mayor came in and she said, this is great. This is a, an interesting, nonpartisan, useful technical framework for analyzing sustainable development. And she jumped on it straight away, no questions asked. And so in 2016, she immediately endorsed the sustainable development goals as a priority for the city, and they were embedded into the sustainable development plan for the city. So working with those kind of neutral academic institutions has been just a brilliant way of, of anchoring all this work. Anyway, just to jump back, other things that we've included in the project have been um, sort of inclusive dialogues with different communities and residents. Um, we've worked specifically on technical processes of uh, in San Jose, for example, they were doing their um, climate smart San Jose plan. Um, in Baltimore, they were doing their new sustainability plan. And we're gonna hear more from, from Dan really in a minute about New York and the one NYC strategy. And what's been really crucial is to work with those existing mechanisms and see how you integrate all of the broader tenants of sustainable development into those, those frameworks. And then in the process of doing this, there's been a range of different kind of ways of approaching it. On the top, you'll see the 17 sustainable development goals tailored to San Jose. And in the bottom, you'll see the 17 sustainable development goals tailored to Baltimore. These were both developed by local stakeholders in those cities so that when they talk to their residents, they could say, These are, this is a, a global agenda, but what do they mean for you? And then for each of these goals, they teased out specific targets and indicators and so on to start a meaningful dialogue. I've already referred to this about political engagement. The other thing we've done is we've worked on technical tools. So for example, with Stanford University, in San, uh, we're working in San Jose, we developed an SDG dashboard, which was to enable us to get really granular block level data on some of the different aspects of sustainable development and to make it accessible in a really user friendly dashboard where you could look really as low as you know, your grid of streets to see how you're performing on your CO2 emissions or whatever. So there's been a way of different trialing this, of kind of testing new approaches. Um, and excitingly, we've seen more and more attention to this. We're seeing more and more cities becoming engaged. Um, I'm excited we have a representative from Los Angeles here today. Um, they're now a new partner that we're working with very closely to try and advance this in, in certain cities across the United States. So moving forward, um, we're partnering with more and more cities. Uh, we are trying to work with other uh, US networks. Of course, this one is the anchor institution, but with also with groups like um, the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, uh, the Urban Institute and so on, who are also starting to think about this. A really crucial partnership is the US Conference of Mayors as kind of the coordinating body for local government in the United States. And we're very excited that um, the SDGs are becoming much more prominent in the Conference of Mayors itself. And we're optimistic there's gonna be an SDG summit in Hawaii next year for mayors across the United States. And then as Jeff mentioned, we've also developed kind of advocacy oriented and technical reference materials, including the US Cities Index, which we produced in 2017 and in 2018. I'm not gonna go into huge detail on this index because we're gonna do a deep dive on the state level index, which is the complementary product. And they're very similar. Um, but we found this to be an incredibly helpful tool for starting a dialogue, particularly with uh, policymakers and local governments. Um, and it, it, they include a range of different tools. Uh, we have dashboards which show different um, cities and metropolitan areas performance across the different goals using a color coded chart. Mm -hmm. um, 
We've shown overall index scores weighted by population bubbles in the bottom left there. We show the average score for all MSAs by different SDGs, so cities by different SDGs, and so on. And each of these more technical resources, again, have just been invaluable, both to actually have a very evidence-based discussion about progress, but also to kickstart a conversation amongst um, the city administration, but also residents on what this really means in the particular area. So that's what we've been doing to date, and this is really the work that I hope that this network can uh, advance on, take forward, build upon, um, and do so in a much more rigorous way than we in our little initial pilot phase were doing. Um, so yeah, really excited to be here today for this very exciting occasion. So with that, I'm gonna hand over to Dan Zarilli um, from New York City. Dan has been anchoring the process around One NYC, um, and of course that is very closely aligned with the SDGs, so he's gonna give us a bit more of a tailored discussion about uh, what New York's been doing on this and why at the SDGs matter here in our host city. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jess. Uh, good morning, everybody. I hope you're all enjoying a nice, uh, I guess, fall, early winter day in New York City. Um, on behalf of Mayor Bill de Blasio, I'm just I'm thrilled to be here. I want to thank Jeff for uh, the invitation to be able to come and uh, address uh, you today and all of you for, for pulling time out of your day to really think about these important issues of uh, sustainable development. Uh, my name is Dan Zarilli. Uh, I'm the One NYC director for New York City, which One NYC is a, a word that probably doesn't mean too much to anybody outside of uh, city government at this point. But it's really New York City's strategic plan and the, and the way that we're preparing ourselves for the challenges of the future. Uh, and there's a little bit of um, uh, history that I'll walk through in terms of what that has actually meant for us since 2015 and even before, and what that means for us now. Um, in a lot of ways, New York City was shaken to consciousness by an event, Hurricane Sandy, uh, about six years ago, that launched us on a whole different trajectory for how we think about uh, the issues of climate, sustainability, uh, what it means to be a global 21st century leader, given uh, threats that we face. And from that moment on, it caused us to, to think anew about these challenges, which ultimately in 2015 culminated in the, the first release of our One NYC document, our strategic plan that in various forms uh, is was the world's first resilience strategy through our partnership with 100 Resilient Cities. And in, in, in so many ways, and with Jeff's leadership as our the co-chair of our advisory board, was the is a, a first local manifestation of the sustainable development goals. In fact, predated by a few months um, because we had a little bit of a heads up of what was coming, predated the sustainable development goals to the point where we've even mapped our strategic plan against the SDGs. Let me give you a little sense of what that actually means. Um, we, as we were going through the challenges that are facing New York City, much like you would look at the challenges facing the globe, we're, we're a growing city. We're gonna be nine million people by 2040. Uh, that population is aging. That population uh, continues to be uh, a high percentage of foreign born. We're understanding what that means for our city and how the city services need to react. Um, at the same time, we have a, a continuing inequality crisis in New York City. At the time of our st strategic plan release in 2015, 45.1% of New Yorkers living at or near the poverty line. Um, we are also facing other challenges, of course, climate near the top of that list, our transportation system needing renewal, um, a number of areas where the quality of life here in New York City um, could be at risk if we don't do the right things and put in place the right strategies to address them. And so in 2015, with the release of One NYC, we put forth a new vision for New York City, a, city a, a blueprint to build a strong and just city across four primary visions or pillars of growth, that we're a growing city, but we also need to make sure that we're managing that growth smartly and investing in uh, economic development and jobs and transportation and housing. At the same time, confronting, and for the first time in, the, in any city strategic plan here in New York City, calling out equity as a prime pillar uh, as, a, as, a, as a driving force of what we're doing in New York City government to address that inequality crisis and that 45.1% uh, 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 poverty level here in New York City. And for the first time laid out a target that we're gonna lift 800,000 New Yorkers out of poverty or near poverty over 10 years uh, and fighting for the, the wage increases that we need in here in New York City and uh, um, uh, paid leave and other elements that really provide economic security and a safety net uh, to those that need it here in New York City. And, at this, and then moving on, our sustainability goals, setting uh, and, and adopting at the time an 80 by 50 target, 80% 80 reduction of our greenhouse gases by 2050, 
and making sure that we're investing what we need to do, coming back to that point around Sandy, that we know the threats are coming from climate change, investing to make sure that we are uh, uh, preparing for those threats, for, for more heat, for more rain, for sea level rise, and all of the implications that that means for a city like New York. New York. And so, you know, and I'm, of course, taking this down to the local level. Um, the SDGs have had incredibly important focus for us in order to connect what we're doing to the larger global conversation of making sure that we are meeting the goals. And in a, in a context when the American government is withdrawing from national, from global agreements, whether it's the Paris Agreement or really not focusing, as Jeff said, uh, in any substantive way on the sustainable development goals, what we find is that it's, it's the cities of the United States that are stepping up to fill that void in leadership. And uh, colleagues from LA here know this for, for sure. Uh, cities across the country are stepping up to fill that void and making sure that we're keeping ourselves on track and, uh, and really demonstrating that whatever's going on in Washington, D.C., the political leadership across the country is still connected and, uh, and aware of the global goals and acting and investing to meet them. So all of that being said, um, we now have been uh, nearly four years, three and a half years past the release of our strategic plan. And you could look at this as a test case for how to deliver on sustainable development, how to deliver on the, the challenge of what we have in New York City. And we release a progress report every year in which we actually lay out Here's how we're doing against the targets we've set. 800,000 New Yorkers out of poverty, 80% reduction in greenhouse gases. And we've been very transparent laying out the fact that, um, you know, we've been doing really good. I think there's a number of indicators across the city where we're at record low unemployment, jobs are at record highs, crime is low. Um, at the same time, we've cut our greenhouse gases 15% since, uh, since our 2005 baseline. A lot of trajectories going in the right direction, but we have so much more to do. Uh, before we'll ever be satisfied because we know these challenges are only growing. And we are updating now that strategic plan. In 2019, we're going to be releasing an update, uh, a revision to that strategic plan to make sure that we are keeping ourselves on track, uh, to make sure that we are uh, really taking into account the way that the world continues to change on us. And believe me, the world has changed quite a bit since 2015 when you look back at over the last couple of years. And all of that has uh, made us think anew about the challenges we face. And yes, our population growth and what's happening with inequality, uh, certainly everything we've been seeing and the drumbeat of bad news on climate has caused us to, one, accelerate our own actions and divesting from fossil fuels and investing in climate solutions, but also to look uh, even wider at the types of the type of city we want to be in 2050 and, uh, and making sure that we are uh, on track to deliver on the commitments that we've set um, as a city and as part of our uh, initiative into the globe. Now, one way that this has actually really come to life uh, in, a, in a very direct way with the SDGs is in July, our, uh, in cooperation with our Office of uh, International Affairs, we released, and, and Jeff mentioned the, uh, the voluntary national reviews. Well, because the United States wasn't actually doing a voluntary national review, we thought let's, maybe there's a way to, to spur some conversation and to uh, you know, adopt that leadership mantle ourselves here on SDGs. And we released our own local, a voluntary local review um, of New York City's actions against the SDGs, uh, which very much draws on our 1NYC statistics and the, the progress reports we've been releasing every year. But we've, we took that into, um, into the SDG language and translated some of the, the local things that we have on 1NYC into, our, into the global language to really demonstrate that cities can step up and be part of this conversation. And since that point, um, other cities have indicated interest in doing that. They've been reaching out to us to figure out how to do that. Helsinki has, uh, as one notable example, has committed to doing a voluntary local review based on what we've been able to adopt. And I think others are going to step up and do that as well, um, particularly here in the United States as a way to connect to the, to the larger global conversation. Um, so I, I wanted to just come in and I thought it was important uh, to make sure that the connection to the local here becomes real in cities and to make sure to demonstrate that American cities are in this conversation and are feeling the weight of what's happening in Washington, D.C. and finding ways to step up our own action. And we applaud everyone here in this room for stepping up and, and helping support that effort across the, the entirety of uh, the SDSN network across the U.S. 
and make sure that we are connecting the university space and professionals and practitioners uh, and uh, cities and states where the action is actually happening here. And so uh, it's, it is my pleasure to be here this morning with you and to address the crowd. Uh, and um, thank you to Jeff for having me here today and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Anna Lopresti. I'm from the SDSN USA Network team. Um, my colleagues, Caroline Fox and Elena Lynch, will also be speaking um, because we'll be helping out managing the network. We wanted you to get a little bit of face time with all three of us, but I'll be introducing the um, concept of localizing the SDGs to the state level. Uh, any thoughts on this? Great, so um, as Jan, uh, Jess and Dan both mentioned, there's such a concentration of population and economic activity um, and activity around the SDGs in cities. And when you think about a land use perspective, the state becomes increasingly important because that 96% of land that's not within cities supports um, those populations and those economies. And the state level is uniquely positioned to deal with some of those challenges because they have to think about that nexus of land use mixes. Um, and on top of that, they also incorporate the rural populations that are often very important to the Leave No One Behind agenda. And I think that states can start to follow suit the way that cities have on stepping up on, on this type of agenda. That being said, um, we produced earlier this year um, a 50 state ranking of the SDGs at the state level. It uses 103 indicators that were locally available data for all 50 states. It, um, includes 15 of the 17 SDGs, and it's in conjunction with the cities and the global index that has already been produced. So we just wanted to highlight here that these three indices that SDSN has produced, um, they can function as an individual tool, but they also function really well together as a collective tool that can be used. Um, we had the advantage of producing the state index last, so we intentionally tried to align the data from the city's level and from the global level into the state index. So the numbers on this diagram show the number of indicators that overlap between all three levels, and we think that this provides a good deal of coherence. You can scale up or scale down depending on the issue that you're looking at and that it kind of can be used as a, a three-tiered tool in and of itself. So this is a map of the results of the 2018 Sustainable Development Report. Um, we'd like to highlight that the scale here is from zero to 100, where 100 would be a dark green and zero is a dark red. Um, and you can see that not a single state on here is green, uh, which really means that even the states that are performing the best have a long way to go to be on track for achieving these uh, SDGs by 2030. And there is a big range um, within the goals, but on that zero to 100 scale, the best performing state had a score of 61 out of 100, um, and the worst performing state had a score of 31. So there's a lot of progress to be made here. If you look at the overall map, it, there's a really strong geographic clustering. This is a map of the nine census regions in the US by their score. Um, and of course, all the SDGs are interrelated, but as Jeff mentioned earlier, if you do break them into these three general categories of social, economic, and environmental goals, you can start to see that even within the regional variation, there's also variation across performance when you look at the type of goals. So um, I think it's quite telling that across all regions um, on the social subset of SDGs, the states perform significantly worse. Um, here's the dashboard of results. So across the top are the SDGs that were included in the index, and then down the side are the states in rank order, which are quite small. Um, but really what we'd like to show here is that even um, the SDGs that are have made the most progress still are not doing particularly well on this index. You can see that the two goals that have made the most progress across the states are clean water and sanitation and responsible consumption, which is goal 12. The three that have made the least progress are no poverty, climate action, and uh, peace, justice, and strong institutions. And you can kind of visually see that with these red lines running straight up the dashboard, even for the, the best performing states at the top of that ranking. And 
Um, I think this is just to say that as we move forward with the rest of the day, um, it's important to think about localization at different scales. The city has uh, particular issues, the state has particular issues, and uh, combining forces and looking at the SDGs at different scales can kind of provide more nuance and more context. And our index results showed that there is a lot of progress to be made in, in the states, and there are some specific areas that we think are the most pressing, so I'll pass it off to my colleague Elena to discuss that. Thank you, Anna. Um, as Jess mentioned earlier, uh, these indices are an opportunity to mobilize action, spur collaboration, and are a tool for um, connecting stakeholders across the public, private, and academic spheres. And with that in mind, we wanted to talk about um, opportunities for further action by highlighting the gaps in progress. And then later, my colleague Caroline will uh, highlight gaps in understanding that may be food for thought for you as you have conversations today and brainstorm about how you might want to work together um, with this network. So one of the major findings that we had in this index, and also um, this aligns with the work from the city's index as well, is that urgent action on the leave no one behind agenda is needed. Um, the leave no one behind agenda came out of the Millennium Development Goals, the UN's first set of development goals. Um, and that leave no one behind agenda basically says that those who are the furthest behind need to be reached first. Um, and who might be furthest behind will vary across cultural and geographic context, but these are the general identities that are covered by the Leave No One Behind agenda, and they include the poor, the elderly, children, uh, religious and ethnic minorities, women and gender nonconforming individuals, migrants, refugees, indigenous people, and people in rural areas. Um, overall, inequality is a major part of the Leave No One Behind agenda, as Dan had just mentioned. Um, and this is high in the U.S. That's probably not a surprise to anyone in this room, as it's high in New York City and probably where you live as well. One of the indicators we included in our report was the Gini uh, coefficient, and that indeed showed that inequality is high across the U.S. But there are other ways to see inequality reaching into this agenda. We included um, several Leave No One Behind indicators as a way to measure um, impact of progress from the most marginalized. These are the eight indicators that we included that specifically look at the Leave No One Behind agenda and that all of them require urgent action. For example, um, contraceptive deserts in this best performing state, 78% of women in need are not live in contraceptive deserts. Um, similarly, around um, affordable housing, on average, only 39 affordable and available rental units are available for 100 families who are in need of those services. So you can see that we have a significant progress to be made on these leave no one behind um, indicators. But there is significant progress to be made also at the goal level. If we look at the goals that are performing most poorly, we see that the poverty goal, the gender equality, and the justice goal are the worst performing indicators. And this, again, goes back to the inequality that's central to this leave no one behind agenda. Um, I'll highlight one last example as a food for thought. Um, this is the energy burden in the U.S. You can see that not only is there serious inequality when it comes to energy burden, but there's inequality across the states. So energy burden is a, both an energy indicator and a leave no one behind indicator. And even the best state um, has, a, is, has 10 times the energy burden that is recommended to hit the 2030 target. And the worst state is 20 times. So there is quite a bit of progress to be made, particularly around this agenda. Um, I'll leave you with, no matter what way we cut it, we are leaving people behind here in the U.S. Um, I hope that this energy burden example can help you think about no matter what industry or area you're working on, the Leave No One Behind agenda has something to offer you, and that the Leave No One Behind agenda and the work around that can be included in no matter what project you're thinking about. Um, it's clear that to make all of this progress, it will require the coordinated effort of everyone in this room, and so I'm so glad that you're here to help us think about that. Um, I'll now turn to Caroline. Hi, everyone. I am Caroline Fox. I'm thrilled to be here with you today launching this network and really excited um, to hear from you coming after this presentation as we begin the discussion around these ideas and uh, continue it through the day as we have different presenters come forward. 
So Elena talked about the need to uh, close gaps on progress to achieve the SDGs. But Jeff mentioned earlier that there are a number of measurement challenges that we face as well. Um, so I'm just going to touch on a few examples that we think might uh, be interesting ways to consider approaching these issues across state lines, across city lines, and across the traditional silos that many of us experience in the institutions that uh, we all work in. <laughs> Excuse me, working. So this is a map of um, Indian land areas and American Indian reservations. As Elena highlighted, in order to achieve the SDGs in the U.S., we'll need to pay particular attention to groups that are marginalized, including indigenous populations. And as you can see here, uh, these groups, uh, these territories cover more than 35 states in the U.S., and they're not they're not within particular states. We can't look at this when we're uh, doing, for example, the state index that we're discussing now or the city index that was spoken about earlier. Some indigenous peoples live on reservations, others in sovereign tribal lands with federal, federally nationalized treaties, and still others are embedded in larger communities throughout the countries. For minority and ma marginalized communities in the U.S., we have to grapple with the lack of data availability. We have to think about uh, there's, there's a lack of disaggregation and small sample sizes. Achieving the goals will require all of us to look beyond the geographic boundaries, to look beyond the boundaries of the data that we have presently, and think through how can we address these transboundary issues within our country. This is a map that shows the impact of fertilizer runoff from the Great Plains and Midwest into the Gulf of Mexico, creating a dead zone. Uh, which has a terrible impact, as you can imagine, on the ecosystem health and on uh, life below water, which is our goal 14. It will strike you if you look at our state index that we weren't able to measure goal 14 at the state level. Although we can see that even uh, states that are non-coastal are having an impact on our oceans, we don't have a way to measure this. And trying to think about it at the state level is quite difficult. Um, thinking about it at the city level, is also quite difficult. So we, we need to think more broadly beyond our, our local efforts. Um, while, as many people have mentioned, this agenda requires us to build from the bottom up and work locally, some of these issues expand beyond our communities and the impacts of our individual and collective actions can't be measured through the traditional mechanisms that we have in place. So uh, target 17 is another one that we were unable to include in our state report because the indicators that are provided or, or suggested by the UN, um, don't, they're all focused on global collaboration. So uh, you know, I think in this room today we're here because we understand that in the US we have uh, an, states and cities and um, the amount of people here is beyond what exists in many countries throughout the world. In fact, most individual states have uh, larger populations than countries. Uh, some of that are doing very well, by the way, on the global rankings. So our, our challenges are really unique. And I think that we need to consider um, applying the global partnerships mentality to our work here. And I think that's why we're in the room today. So I'm hopeful that we can continue the conversation about how we address transboundary issues and think about um, how we can escape our silos to work on some of these broad, um, overarching, and multidisciplinary uh, tasks that we need to achieve the SDGs. Thank you. I look forward to talking with you all. Well, thank, thanks a lot. And uh, if uh, Caroline, Elena, and Anna could stand up one more time, I want you to know them because they're holding uh, the all of the efforts together, uh, and um, and doing uh, great analytical work and the reports. And uh, they were in outreach uh, with all of you in in recent weeks to bring us together uh, together with uh, Maria. So. Phenomenal work, and we're most grateful. Um, I also want to thank uh, Jen Gross, who is here. Uh, Jen, if you would uh, stand up to say hello. Uh, Jen Gross uh, is uh, 
a wonderful leader in sustainable development and um, uh, a wonderful uh, supporter of all of this effort, a great philanthropist and um, an incredible friend of SDSN from the very beginning and makes it possible for us to be here and is supporting the work. And so we really want to, want to thank you. Impossible without you. So thank you so much. Um, I hope that uh, part of uh, the, the resonance with you uh, in campuses uh, around the country is uh, engagement with your cities and with the states and uh, that we can think about and you will be thinking about uh, ways to do that. Many things are underway, no doubt, but new things could be underway. One idea that's already come up uh, from one of the universities is a state network that the university would host uh, and uh, bring together some of the smaller colleges uh, and, uh, um, uh, and universities around the state in order to engage with the state legislature, the governor, uh, the uh, uh, state level problems. And that is a wonderful idea. And so if we had networks of networks, I want to encourage that this is an open brainstorming process of how to uh, continue to scale, but probably having uh, a, a an SDSN with, at a state level that you could champion to bring together other schools and uh, the major cities the, uh, and, the, and the state uh, governments could be a tremendous opportunity for engagement and for research and for analysis. We heard from Dan Zarilli just now with the idea of cities doing SDG voluntary reporting. Of course, first they have to do alignments. And when we speak to mayors, they're interested. It's a new tool for them. Uh, they may not know about it, but it actually fits the city need. And it's not a stretch. It's a helpful tool uh, if they want accountability and if they want uh, metrics and direction. This is something that only you could really champion uh, at the local level uh, to make it possible with engagement, uh, data, and so on. The national effort will support you in that uh, with uh, ideas, with metrics, with uh, uh, examples, uh, with consultation, uh, if that's helpful. But it's something that I would like you to, uh, to uh, take up and uh, come up with uh, ideas that make sense for you. The uh, leave no one behind agenda is, is really very well poignantly and powerfully put analytically in uh, what you've just seen. But I think it behooves us to note that last week we learned that life expectancy has declined for the third consecutive year in the United States. This is absolutely unprecedented in the high income world. We've had three consecutive years of life expectancy declining by a tenth of a year each year since 2014. And no other high income country in the world is experiencing this. This is an epidemic of opioid overdoses, of suicides, of despair. We have a massive depressive disorder epidemic in the United States. People are not only uh, falling behind, but they're losing their lives to an extent that it's showing up in a metric that was almost inconceivable as a national trend until recently. So this is not a fine point. This is a crisis. And again, I think uh, addressing this at the national and the state level or at the global level, but using a nationwide network is something that we should uh, really contemplate uh, as, as a group. We're going to now turn to uh, a, an issue that I think is one of the most important and uh, policy relevant and where only a group like this could do the deep work that's required. Vijay uh, Modi, uh, you're going to come up here. Yeah, uh, my uh, wonderful colleague uh, in the engineering school at Columbia, 
VJ uh, professor of civil engineering, but uh, just to put it uh, in general, whenever I need to understand something, I call VJ because he, I don't know how, but he knows everything about everything. So uh, he always uh, explains to me what's, uh, what's going on, uh, especially around our physical world and technology. Um, and we're going to be joined uh, on uh, Skype uh, with Jim Williams. Jim Williams is a remarkable energy modeler who has produced, uh, he produced what I found to be the best, clearest study uh, in, published in science, I think in 2012, but it was an incredible eye-opener for me on how to make a pathway analysis to deep decarbonization. And that was done first for California and then he helped lead a global effort under SDSN where 16 country teams took on the challenge. How would you get, at that point, it was down 80% in emissions by 2050. Now the IPCC tells us we have to get down to zero basically by 2050. But Jim has been doing wonderful modeling work. And I do have a dream that as a group, we somehow present what doesn't exist right now is a detailed, locally articulated, nationally linked U.S. strategy for decarbonization. And uh, this is what the next session will discuss. Jim is going first, or me? I'm going, okay, then uh, that's not mine. Um, oh, you want Jim first? Yeah. Hello. Should I start? Oh, yes. Jim, we can hear you well, so please uh, okay. go ahead. Great, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, okay, so I'm going to um, give an update on the SDSN's activities in the area of deep decarbonization that I've been involved in. Um, uh, it started um, about five years ago when um, SDSN and its partner IDRI in France um, initiated the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project, um, where uh, research teams from the 16 highest emitting countries around the world um, uh, developed national blueprints for limiting uh, global warming. Uh, and our goal was to change the climate policy uh, discussion um, from a, a focus on marginal changes to one on transformational changes and to take a long-term perspective on that problem. Um, and uh, the result of that was the um, development of um, uh, individual studies for each of those 16 countries that were published before um, the uh, COP21 in Paris that described blueprints for achieving um, deep levels of carbon reduction uh, by mid-century. And the... Um, uh, Is everybody seeing my cards, my uh, slides? Um, Jim, can you press um, play, play on your screen there at the bottom? We can see the grid. We just need you to press play at the bottom left. You had your, you just had your mouse on it on the slideshow view, bottom left of your screen. Bottom left of my screen. Just, just play. Full, full screen for the PowerPoint, Jim. It's at the very bottom, the third tab. 
Sorry, everybody. Um, you can also press play at the top there, top right, above the IDB one. Yeah. Nope, not it, seeing it. It's right there above the IDB slide. It says play, a big green triangle. Yep. A little bit That's more to not the right. It, it's not how it appears on mine. I'm I'm very sorry. Um, should we change the order of the presentation? Because I'm not seeing the screen that you're talking about. Um, go ahead and keep presenting. We have your PowerPoint slides back here, so we might pull them up. Just let us know, and we'll we'll press we'll advance the slides if you just let us know when to. Okay. Oh, click, so click right now, click. <laughs> How about now? Click. Oh. All right. Keep presenting, and we'll we'll download your slides and just let us know when to advance. Does that work? Yeah. Sure. Okay. So. Oh, okay. Um, Great. Thanks. So I meant the slide that has the Eiffel Tower on it. Wait a minute. Are you able to show that, Cheyenne? Hold on. I apologize for the technical difficulties, but I'm not seeing the same thing that you're describing, I'm afraid. If we can meanwhile download Jim's slides and then we can advance it locally here, that may work very well. So should I, if you want, I can go. Okay, perfect. We can see you, Jim, and your slide is up. Okay, great. Thank you. Sorry for the technical difficulty. Yep. So anyway, um, the, um, the work of the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project and the development of all of those um, feasible strategies for um, achieving high levels of carbon reduction influenced the outcome of the Paris Agreement. And Article uh, 4, Paragraph 19, all parties should strive to formulate and communicate long-term greenhouse gas emission development strategies, I think was a, a direct product of the work of the DDPP. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that have followed from that work. Um, one was uh, the development of a 2050 Pathways Handbook by the European Climate Foundation that uh, uh, was really an extraction of the lessons learned by the project. I co-authored this with my counterpart, um, Henri Weissman at IDRI. Uh, the Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, this year launched uh, a new project called Deep Decarbonization in Latin America and the Caribbean with participation from the countries shown in this slide. And um, uh, it is a, a, a direct follow-on to the DDPP um, in the, uh, in the um, South American region. Um, in the United States, the uh, work that we did for the DDPP uh, is contained in two reports, Pathways to Deep Decarbonization in the United States and, and Policy Implications of Deep Decarbonization in the United States. And the questions that those, um, those uh, reports asked were, is it technically feasible to achieve 80% greenhouse gas reduction below 1990 levels by 2050? What would it cost? And what physical changes are required? And uh, what are the policy implications? And so, uh, very briefly, the um, the result of that was uh, a demonstration of uh, multiple feasible technology pathways that do achieve an 80% reduction by uh, 1990. They're shown here. Uh, and that the cost of this effort is affordable. Um, uh, that uh, taking into account increased cost for um, some kinds of higher uh, efficiency and, and low carbon uh, technologies um, and the avoided cost of uh, consuming fossil fuels, that the net cost of supplying and using uh, energy was less uh, than about 1% of GDP. Jim, Jim uh, can yes. I just, okay. We are on the U.S. Pathways Analysis slide. Could you just say next slide when you want us to switch? Okay, so move forward two slides to one that says deep decarbonization cost is affordable. Okay, we are there, and next time you want to switch, just let us know. Great. Thank you. Sorry for the difficulties here. 
Um, so the, the point is, number one, uh, we found that deep decarbonization in the United States is, um, is technically feasible, that there are multiple pathways to achieve it, so that if some technologies don't materialize, there's other ways of doing it. And that is, this slide shows that the cost um, is affordable. A, um, an analysis of our results by a third party um, that's shown in the bottom left uh, looked at the macroeconomic um, implications of this and actually found that uh, these low carbon scenarios led to uh, gains in GDP and jobs um, in the United States as a whole, although um, not in all regions of the United States. Next slide. Um, so uh, the, th these results are, are founded on three pillars that said in all cases, um, uh, regardless of what the specific technology approach is um, to achieve deep decarbonization, you need a combination of high levels of energy efficiency, of um, very low carbon electricity, and uh, of electrification of end uses, that is switching from direct fossil fuel combustion to using electricity itself or electric uh, fuels that are produced from electricity, such as hydrogen or synthetic natural gas. Um, some of the um, effects of that work are reflected uh, in the next slide. Um, uh, the U.S. mid-century strategy uh, developed uh, by the Obama administration was strongly influenced by that work. Um, next slide. Um, and uh, there are two other studies that um, uh, actually used uh, the U.S. DDPP analysis as their foundation. On the left, uh, that's the risky business um, groups uh, 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 from risk to return, investing in a clean energy economy. On the right side, uh, NRDC's America's Clean Energy Frontier. Uh, both of those are uh, draw heavily from the work. Next slide. Um, uh, the work uh, really began and continues on in California, um, uh, where pathways analysis has been um, a foundation of California's energy and climate policy um, for uh, a long time. It actually goes back to uh, 2006, where the same kind of analysis uh, has been done for state agencies uh, that are planning the low carbon transition in California. Next slide. Um, some more recent work includes studies of deep decarbonization in the Northeast, on the left-hand side, you see the cover of a report from this year um, that looked at the uh, cooperation with, with Hydro-Quebec to uh, basically repurpose its hydro system in order to support high levels of renewable development in the Northeast to reach uh, low carbon um, uh, electricity generation required for deep decarbonization. On the right-hand side, um, this is deep decarbonization in the Northwest, specifically uh, Washington State. The governor's office um, uh, did a similar kind of study for the state of Washington. Next slide. Um, some other sort of uh, directions that that work has gone. Uh, this summer uh, in the trade journal in the electricity business, uh, IEEE's Power and Energy magazine, it was dedicated to um, uh, the, the importance of electrification in low carbon energy systems. And um, we were invited to write the lead editorial on that um, uh, out of sort of recognition of the, of the role that um, uh, SDSN's work has in, in raising the profile of this, of this issue in the industry. Um, another direction that the work has gone is in the relationship between low carbon energy and land use. Um, uh, and uh, that uh, next slide um, uh, recently led to a, uh, uh, a meeting under, of the Low Emission Solutions Conference 
uh, in California during the Global Climate Action Summit on land, energy, and climate change that was hosted at my uh, home institution, the University of San Francisco, but we had um, uh, uh, well over 200 people attend an all-day meeting that looked at the um, interface between uh, land, energy, and climate change. And that uh, topic is a, a, a key focus of another SDSN initiative, the FABLE initiative. You may hear more about FABLE today, so I won't uh, go into that. Uh, next slide. Um, many of you are probably aware of the recent IPCC report on global warming of 1.5 degrees C. Next slide. Um, uh, this slide shows some of Jim Hansen's uh, work on where the planet needs to get to in um, uh, its emissions trajectories in order to keep uh, temperatures well below 1.5 degrees C and on a uh, path toward return to climate normalcy. Um, at the target that he has identified is uh, reaching 350 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere by the end of the 21st century. Next slide. So this uh, shows very briefly uh, a preliminary result for um, work that we're doing that we hope to be published um, uh, early next year um, that has 350 ppm scenarios. We believe that this is uh, the first time that uh, such scenarios have been um, modeled within a specific country and in the level of um, technical detail that, um, that's been applied in this case. And the basic answer is yes, uh, 350 ppm um, uh, is an achievable trajectory for the United States. That is 350 ppm compatible. Um, and uh, we are in the process of laying out what exactly that will uh, require. Um, next slide. Another direction the uh, work is taken is um, uh, a book project led by uh, Michael Gerard uh, of, of Columbia University and his colleague uh, John Dernbach uh, called uh, Legal Pathways to Deep Decarbonization in the United States. Um, there's a short version of that uh, being published um, anytime now and then uh, there will be a rollout of the full book um, of many hundreds of pages produced by uh, about 40 legal scholars who are looking at all the different aspects of deep decarbonization sometime in the spring. And you may hear uh, from, from Michael or you might hear from Elena uh, in contact with Michael uh, more about um, the planning for that rollout, uh, which will happen also in an SDSN venue. Um, and a, a, a final um, uh, activity, uh, uh, more on my personal level, but it's uh, uh, another legal related one, which is the uh, Juliana uh, versus United States lawsuit, also known as our Children's Trust. And so um, uh, I've been asked to be one of the expert witnesses on behalf of the uh, plaintiffs who are um, who are asking the United States government to take um, much stronger action on uh, climate change. And that work is based on the US, uh, the expert report, the testimony I've given uh, has been based on the US deep decarbonization uh, work. Next slide. Uh, and that's, that's it for me. Okay, sorry for the technical difficulties, but I hope that um, gives people an idea of um, of what we've been up to for the last couple of years. And uh, you can call me to that. Thanks, Jim. Are you gonna be able to stay on the line to answer some questions after Vijay's presentation before we break? I actually have another presentation <laughs> in, in just a few minutes. Okay. Um, no worries so I'm then. Afraid we won't. But anyway, thank you all very much. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Vijay. Okay, after, Jim has given us a wonderful kind of very big picture overview. I'll try to zoom in a little bit into New York State and New York City. Okay, first of all, I'm kind of the glass half full guy, so 
I will focus on opportunities and not challenges. Okay. This is the beautiful city we live in. In fact, the photo is taken not far from here. Maybe you can even see this from Jeff's office. So you can bombard his office. But almost, not almost, all of the work is done by young students. So I'm just taking credit. Okay. So next, <laughs> next slide. <laughs> I just want to, New York State, I just want to say one simple thing, and this is not, this is going to be a situation for many cities. It's sort of, we are below that green arc. Half of the demand is below that green arc. But the actual low carbon sources are very small below the green arc and about to get even smaller if we retire Indian Point Nuclear. I'm not going to take positions there. Above the green arc, fur further out you go, that's where the resources are. Okay, and then I'll come to offshore in a minute. But onshore resources of wind are there, land is there. I think it's going to be extremely important that those people upstate who have to do something for their land, do not feel they are doing it for, you know, $4 cappuccino drinkers in the city. So I think this is going to be a very big issue, right? And we need, interestingly, there are solutions, there are lessons, there are, and it doesn't cost a whole lot. So I think being sensitive to people who are poor, who are going to actually contribute somehow and, and rewarding them is going to be very important. Uh, we have done models which take into account transmission, storage, onshore, solar, offshore, various constraints of demand. But I just want to give you one simple next slide result for New York State. So, you know, that's New York State on the left. But the most important point I want to make here is that actually getting to 50 or 60 percent renewables is not hard. And because academics fret about analyzing 80 and 100 percent, which is hard today at today's technologies, I hope we don't create a kind of paralysis by analysis. So we need to send the message that the first 50, 60 is actually not that hard. There are, of course, issues, right? But we, they, are, they are solvable. And it's not like we need absolutely say, oh, unless we develop new batteries, we can't do it. Unless we do, you know, tens of gigawatts of transmission, we can't do it. So I, I think the most important message is this graph starts at 50 percent. At 50%, you see the green line, transmission, the purple line, storage. Not a big deal. We do need to worry about distribution lines, distribution uh, wire, and that's where the action is going to be. But I don't think we have to, and, and you increasingly see the role, the yellow line of offshore wind. It's a phenomenal resource. I'll come to that in a slide down the road. So I think. The point is, okay, so the next slide, and I want to zoom into one issue. Let me ask you, if you, if, if, as New York City, if you look at four things, transportation, industry, buildings, and agriculture, which one has the most contributor to emissions? It's not agriculture. Built environment has the biggest now so the but the point is before we go to the next slide is of that built environment not because our buildings are inefficient yes there are in part in some places but at a macro level that's not the message the message is because we don't do agriculture here because we are good with transportation and because we don't have massive industry buildings show up to be important but what's important is the dominant emissions from buildings are not due to electricity today. Our electricity actually is fairly clean to start with. We will get cleaner as I showed in the earlier slide. 
our biggest challenge is heating because that comes exclusively from oil and gas okay and i'll come to that and the point is to we need to figure out how to protect the poor and vulnerable as we make that transition and i want to say that ability it should not come at sacrificing comfort for the poor it should not come at higher cost for the poor and yet it can be green and i'm going to say automation is going to play a big role in this so next slide so i already said that you know so next slide now what's interesting is that the challenge right now focus on the lowest curve which shows that the peak electricity demand in new york city is in the summer because of air conditioning utilities are used to it everything is used to that as we go to decarbonize heating you can see that the curve which is a monthly curve completely flips and it becomes peak in the winter but what's good news first of all the most important good news is that to go to 30% of electric heating you don't violate the summer peak you actually sell more electricity if you are a utility without massively upgrading capacity that we should leverage as an initial ability to go to 30% in heating without even then the next slide shows that interestingly the blue curve which is wind is better aligned with the new peaks right so we have and if we do this for offshore it's even better and i'll come to that in a minute so my point is i'm just trying to show the opportunities where the glass is half full okay next slide so and you can you can sort of uh, so yeah the the point of this arrows is you know those are monthly averages those are monthly averages and wind will fluctuate everywhere from zero to the peak but yet so if we can go back to the previous slide just yet it can actually help reduce our current gas consumption through automation and the reason is that the scale at which the time scale at which the gas system works is much longer than the time scale of variability in the wind so those of you who were here last christmas and this past new year we had 10 straight days in the northeast where the average temperature was below 15 degree fahrenheit the mean temperature we had our gas prices our electricity prices went through the roof 50 times on gas 10 50 times we need to address that and this can be addressed because we have background storage in gas but we can get to significant reduction and leverage the existing gas system to get there so it will not be just one or the other right away it will be like a hybrid car but hopefully cheaper next time next slide now i think understanding heating at a national level is important this is literally fresh off the press i'm not even sure if it's 100% right but but in the sense of like 100% accurate right but but it's the it is driven by census track level data you can see who heats with natural gas this is going to be important you can see who heats with natural gas you say hey what happened in upstate new york what's new hampshire vermont maine what's happening there so you go to the next slide they are heating with oil and propane okay so so we now know where the challenges are now interestingly parts of the country which didn't require too much heat and had cheap electricity which is the next slide shows that they are already using electricity okay but it is a it is somewhat of a kind of miss you know it, it it's like the map that the republicans might show for where they won right is it it's a very low density areas with very low consumption has a hard time getting gas pipeline so they are electric but the bulk of the people 
are not and the bulk of the consumption where it is cold is not where you see the dark part. So I just want to point out. I think the next slide is what gets all electricity planners worried. And I think the question is we need to figure out solutions to that worry. So this shows that if you decarbonize heating, you will create a peak that is much larger than the current peak. And what is the ratio of the new peak to the current peak? Because that new peak will be last only a few days. Note that it is much colder compared to 72 Fahrenheit than it is hotter. Right? Therefore, the peak from electric is much, electric heating is much higher than the peak from air conditioning. And that ratio is worst in two parts of the country. It's in the Northeast, because we use very little electricity for heating and it is cold. It also happens to be in another part of the country that I'm not studying too much, so I won't say much about that. Okay. But the point is that we can address this and on that little cartoon thing on the right, you see that we have a phenomenal offshore wind resource. That offshore wind resource is literally 20, 30 miles from where we are sitting here, not having to build massive transmission lines, right? Now I want to, there we have another challenge, but I want to highlight that. When we bid, did the state call for bidding two years ago, the price was 23, 24 cents. A year later, it was nearly half of that. This year, it might be half of that. It's not that we suddenly figured out in New York State how to make the price one fourth. It's just when you get a new industry started, all the supply chains, all the mechanisms of all the different uh, people and skills that are needed have to ramp up. But we have ramped up pretty quickly. Two years. So I think there should be also acceptance of the fact that initially to develop a new industry, new sources, new supply chains, new skills does take some resources. In the big picture, we did it very efficiently. Only with 90 megawatt, we got to half. Another 800 megawatt, we got to further half. So that's pretty good. You know, so I just want to point that out. That's not just saying Oh, we are making a better turbine blade. That's just through creating economies of scale in installation. So the other remark I want to make is that I think the next step here, and you know, we, I, I'm not going to go into great details of all the models we are doing, but what I showed on the electricity side is that 60% is not hard. On the heating side, 30% is not hard. This peak will stay the same for the first 30%. And I think we should do that. And we should figure out the how to protect the vulnerable. We don't want to be in the Paris situation where it's, oh, gas prices and you know you have to change your clunker car because you are you know it's not so good so we have to figure that out and i think that will require a you know deeply sensitive collaborative conversation but the point is that actually the poor and the vulnerable can play a very big role in this some of these technologies are actually going to increase their thermal comfort if we figure out a way to direct our policies to do some of this in their buildings first, again, all four things have to be done. It has to be enhanced thermal comfort. It has to create saving. It has to reduce emissions. And at the same time, it will be through automation. So I want to show just the last two, three slides very quickly that that automation we are doing in other parts of the world. This mini grid, completely digital, completely automated, was installed in two days. Next slide. You know, we are doing data analytics. 
to manage real time loads this is in uganda the previous slide okay next slide this is in uganda also low cost smart internet of things devices that robustly control things this is sort of the low cost version of what goes on in a hybrid car but for a home and next slide is we are doing flexibility of load for farmers where you are scheduling load so farmers are adapting to the solar supply rather than supply having to adapt to demand driving down cost so i think these are the same principles we need to do here it was actually easier to do in many places where they didn't have electricity because there was nobody in the way so finally that's where i'm going to end with the next slide thank you and there are many opportunities i'm i've sort of highlighted them just to give you an ironic example we are working with the government of qatar which has asked us to figure out how to be lower emissions and it's fascinating that ice storage in the bottom middle may play an important role and cost effectively do it in a country with one of the lowest gas prices but also happens to have the most wonderful sunshine so uh, thank you very much and uh, you know that that's that's my presentation yeah we can go to the last slide if needed oops yeah i'm not give any question yeah. Amazing, yeah, uh, uh, really uh, fantastic. I I have a question and a uh, a thought, which is, how can we do this kind of planning as a group nationwide? Does, does that make sense? What would it be? And the reason is uh, just a one one quick uh, thought. We cannot win. this uh climate debate without credible plans for what to do it's not enough actually to show that there's a horror happening and a horror ahead without an agenda of what the transformation looks like as far as i know there is no detailed national strategy uh it's never been made the department of energy has never done it when we had steven chu who's brilliant and could have done it uh the politics uh, did not allow him to do it um so we don't have this kind of analysis therefore the politics is completely divorced from the potential and i think no congress person knows what does this mean for my district what would the energy alternatives really be other than what he or she might be able to gather in a newspaper in some ill informed uh column today the wall street journal does its usual weekly bullshit of uh uh say there's no no use to this why are we wasting our time the riots in paris show uh this agenda of uh, decarbonization is bad politics a waste of time why are we even discussing this that by the way is one of the most pernicious effects of uh, in world today is rupert murdock and and what he has meant in the public policy discussion no serious analysis at all so i want to ask you vj and i want to ask people here what would it mean does it is it sensible i I would love this my very naive view of this I'd like to see a map of the United States with the grid lines attached what new things need to be built where could they be built not as the only way to do it but here is a model of transformation where uh a congress person would be able to look and say oh oh I see uh, we're going to have wind here we need one new power line here according to this uh and we can tap uh, so and so and 30% of our electricity is going to come from solar in the next state and 10% is going to come here and so forth is that feasible to actually articulate a more detailed engineering vision 
that isn't the only one, but is one that shows, okay, here's a map given our resources of what make what might make sense. So I'd like to open it uh, to the floor and, of, uh, of course, get uh, Vijay's uh, comments uh, first. My perhaps. quick reaction is, first of all, absolutely. To me, I want to just highlight that we are we have Jim talked about California. I want to just applaud New York City and New York State that our political leadership actually is asking for this. So not every state has that luxury. And I think that to me, and I'm I'm sure through the work of SDSN, there are many others. This is, you know, we have amazing universities. We only, you know, this is three PhD students work over five years. It's not, and a lot of states may have already done this. So I think this to answer is yes, this should be done. It, it requires painful sort of gathering of data, proxy data, utilities are not always kind of, you know, they've used sort of cybersecurity and privacy and, you know, all this is, you know, not disclosing some of that, but I think it can be overcome. I think it can be done, but I think it's important to open the floor. Please, and could uh, you introduce yourself? Uh, here comes a mic, uh, we'll have a roving mic. Please say who you are, stand up, uh, meet uh, your colleagues and, uh, and uh, make a comment or ask a question. Hello, yes, I'm Salim Ali from the University of Delaware, and I wanted to offer that um, uh, Delaware has the Institute for Energy Conversion, which has been uh, uh, operating since 1972. And we would be very happy to help uh, SDSN, especially because of our very unique location that we're mm -hmm. close to, of course, not far from New York, but also very close to other bordering states. So from a policy perspective, the transboundary aspect would be very interesting to uh, work on. We also have a major uh, investment in vehicle to grid mm -hmm. technology uh, and so uh, we have a U.S. Department of Energy Center of Excellence in some of these areas so we'd be very happy to uh, work with especially our regional um, colleges and universities in the uh, greater Philadelphia area. Sure and by the way Delaware is very no well known for their energy work your university. So. Please Paul. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to connect this last presentation with the remarks Jeff and others have made earlier. Um, I'm Paul Shravastava. I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer for Penn State University. And uh, we are working very hard in the energy area. We are probably among the top five universities in terms of number of publications on energy. We have 450 energy researchers at the university. And when I arrived a year ago, I asked, where is our energy transition plan? And there was complete silence in the room. <laughs> we are also a state which has uh, one trillion cubic feet of natural gas under it, and we are fracking central. So my question is, uh, given that this network wants to prioritize a political discourse on sustainability issues, particularly energy issues, how do we take a set of 500, 600 researchers with six major energy institutes within the university to focus on what would be to anybody in this room, the primary question of energy transition. Not only do we not have a discourse on it, we don't even have a language in science that could prioritize questions like this. So I would like to connect the energy challenge to the, the third priority that the the network mentioned, one of making central the political action and, and, and what are the reward system limitations and barriers within university that prevent our very brilliant scientists from doing that. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, please. I'm Neil Leary from Dickinson College. Um, these presentations this morning have been excellent. Um, I think these ideas of the kinds of transitions that were presented, um, largely from an engineering kind of perspective, are very useful. We've been showing, though, what's feasible for a long time. And one of the areas I think our network might be able to, to add light to, and this is an area I don't have much expertise in, but 
the idea of how do we go from what's feasible to what can actually be implemented. And we've talked about the absence of plans. We also heard earlier that the language of the SDGs is nonpartisan. The word planning, sadly, <laughs> is very partisan. And so to what extent are we able to, if like we, we identify offshore wind as something that would be necessary to make the kind of transition that was discussed, how does that actually happen? Is FERC really driving plans? Is DOE? Is it state level? Is it the private sector? Maybe sort of sharing and understanding sort of who are the players who actually make these things happen? Because right now we don't really have a planning orientation in this country towards energy so far as I understand it. Can I have a one sentence response? Nobody knows this, but on our electricity bill, we pay a very small fraction of percent that is called the clean energy charge. It's not called the carbon tax. It collects 1.4 billion a year in New York State. I'll just stop there. I think uh, my own sense is that, uh, first of all, the US government certainly will not make such a plan uh, during this administration. That is uh, absolutely uh, not going to happen. On the other hand, uh, we're going to hear from uh, two congressmen uh, who are saying we need a, we need uh, plans and we need help. That is also a reality. The government actually does not have planning capacity. I don't think it's such a bad word in the public opinion. It is in Washington. Uh, very oddly, uh, the, the, the lesson of winning the Cold War was stop all thinking. Uh, plans are evil, uh, therefore we don't think anymore. And we've been in a non-thinking mode for, uh, I would say, a quarter century. In, in the formal sense that our institutions do not make these forward analyses. That's been both kinds of administration, both parties, and it is a, a fact of life. I would posit uh, from my experience that, and from actually testing, even surveying and focus groups and so forth, the public wants to see a pathway. What does it mean? How could we do this? What are you even talking about? because this is not understood, this language, and the idea of climate change control at a soundbite level is, I'm supposed to pay more for my electricity, or I can't drive my car, I can't get to work anymore. It's so simplistic, by design, by the way, because we're up against powerful interests, we're not just up against sheer inertia. It's both interests and design incapacity and uh, accidental incapacity. But I do think that this is where we need to put our efforts because when it is explained that it's not just a problem, but there's a solution, and life in that solution has a lot of desirable characteristics, even beyond avoiding disaster, which is one of them, I think that the uh, public response will be powerful. So we're not going to crack by ourselves particular political problems in Washington right now, but we can lay a foundation for change through knowledge. And that, I would say, is the theory of change that I would propound, which is serious, uh, deep analysis, uh, I'm just amazed when I listen to VJ or Jim. God, I've been doing this for 20 years and I don't know what I'm talking about because I could not have given that talk or even pointed out relevant parameters. So I personally love to listen to engineers talk about this and I want to get the economists out of the way for a moment and let the engineers tell us what would be needed for the specs of such a system and then we can go back and calculate some of the costs and some of the transfers and some of the ways to protect uh, vulnerable populations. But it turns out the costs are not that high to begin with. The solutions are pretty nifty. 
and we need an engineering perspective for a lot of it. But I would say, and this is, uh, I would say it is not the case, in my opinion, that we've shown plan after plan and it just doesn't go anywhere. We've hardly shown a specific plan anywhere. And at the national level, never. We've never shown what a transition would look like. But my dream is that you have, if it were translated in political terms, you'd be able to click on a congressional district and understand what does this mean for my district? And a candidate or congressperson would be able to say, this works for us. In fact, we've got lots of wind. We've got lots of solar. We're already on the grid. This works in terms of our peaks, in terms of our uh, technologies and so on. That we don't have in an operational way. Please. Microphone here. Oh, sorry. One here and then coming to you afterwards. Yeah. Hey there. Zach Sado from Barclays. V Vijay, what would you like to see and what are your thoughts for where the, inv the investment community comes in? Because I'd imagine that uh, uh, infrastructure, energy investors would love to participate in opportunities like this and collaborate also with academia. Mm -hmm. Just a short answer to that. I think it's important to, and I didn't have time to go into this, the issues of financing, issues of risk, and issues of long-term sort of transition that are buried into this, which I think we really need the finance community to sit down and have that conversation together, right? Because it will require massive investments over the next 30 years. So, so I think we should talk about it. Yeah, what I would like the industry to do on a pre-commercial basis is to support the analytics because the investment opportunities will clearly be there. And on a commercial basis, they will be there, but you can't invest without a plan. And the kinds of solutions are only semi-market based. When you're talking about which grids, which major energy reservoirs to tap, that is a systems dynamics that is pre-market. And some of it is not at all a market based. It's a it, it's a network that is has to be established as a matter of public policy. Then financing that becomes a, a proposition for the banks. But the idea that this is just going to emerge out of market forces is not feasible. You have to plan a grid. You have to know what kinds of energy you're tapping into. We have to decide what our transboundary uh, challenges are. Uh, we don't have systems that are aligned right now, even across states for uh, regional markets, much less across Canada, Mexico, U.S., which is also relevant for much of this. So I would like you to go back to the industry leaders and say, come on, let's put some resources into this pre-commercially to enable the universities to actually carry out the kind of detailed work and analysis that's needed to get this done. Because it, it uh, cannot be simply floating bonds and financing this because we don't know what to do. And we're paralyzed right now uh, for a lot of reasons, interests, of course, but also because there isn't a, a build out that is uh, understood except in a few places in the country. I think over here, yeah, please uh, stand up and introduce yourself. I think it's on. Hi, yeah. sorry. Hi, I'm Damien White, uh, Rhode Island School of Design. I'm uh, a little um, confused about this notion that there's not plans out there. It seems to me that if you do a review of the literature, there's, you know, there's, there's a big field of plans now. I mean, just to take one example, Mark Jacobson at Stanford has done some pretty detailed uh, 50 state plans for 100% renewables over the last two, three years, which are at least sketching possibilities. Um, we've then got a second layer of that debate where the debate is around whether the focus should be on 100% renewables or 100% carbon free. 
Um, and then more recently, obviously, we, we might hear more about that this afternoon. We're seeing the horizon of uh, a Green New Deal being proposed, which is explicitly trying to put a more programmatic turn in other quarters where the focus is not just on a kind of energy reductionist focus, but energy is linked to jobs, jobs to justice, ju justice to racial, social, um, equity issues. Um, so, so there's a lot out there and couldn't we uh, think about this network in terms of connecting all those circles and having some you know, robust debates as well about the, uh, the complexities of decarbonization and the politics that we need to do to get there. Yeah, well, we're going to connect with the Green New Deal champions this afternoon, but they're looking for, uh, they're, they're looking for an action agenda. They are exactly along the lines of sustainable development for an integrated vision, but it's a vision. Uh, and uh, the question of what is that implementation is not done by anybody. There is no detailed uh, programming. Uh, so that's the sense in which things are, are not uh, in place. Michael, I don't know if you would say a few words at this juncture about, uh, about uh, the legal structural changes that would be needed to implement, because this is another dimension of the problem that's highly complex that also you're taking up in a pioneering way that has not been done up until now. Thank you, Jeff. I'm Michael Gerard. I'm on the faculty of the law school here and director of the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law. We took the pathways to deep decarbonization report that Jim Williams and others put together and asked the question, how does U.S. law need to change in order to be on that pathway? U.S. law at the federal and state and local levels. And for the last three years we've been working on a project called Legal Pathways to Deep Decarbonization of the United States, um, the, uh, leading to a book of about 1,200 pages uh, co-authored by 35 uh, law professors and practitioners around the country that will come out in March that will have more than a thousand specific recommendations on how do we achieve the goals in terms of efficiency and renewables and uh, and uh, electrification. And so uh, that is, uh, much of it is to be done at the state level. And we now are going to, about to have 23 states with about 51% of the U.S. population in states with Democratic governors. So I think that in the next two years, whereas not a lot is going to happen at the federal level, other than coming up with things for hopefully the next administration, a great deal is possible at the state level. And so we'll be circulating information about how to how to get the deep de legal pathways to deep decarbonization book to all of you. And we hope that it'll give some very specific ideas on how to uh, move forward in your own states. I would say at the state level, party does not play the same role that it plays at the national level either, because it's not such a brutal divide. With some governors it does, but much, we'll, we'll, see how that, uh, yeah. we'll see how that turns out. And we're, we're also putting together a, a team of pro bono lawyers to do a lot of the legal drafting and legislative drafting and ordinance drafting and so forth necessary to implement these recommendations. Okay. Thank you. Okay, okay, so just one comment on, first of all, I think it was great that Jacobson spurred us all to think about 100% renewable. But I think now has come a time that we should see all, there are multiple entities and we need to get granular. And I think a state or a region is a fantastic way to get that granularity where you need to worry about NYSERDA, the ISO, the con ads of the thing and all those constraints. And I think there both legal issues as well as how tariff reform will work that satisfies both the existing players and their importance as well as the new things is going to be very important. So I think that starts to be pretty granular and I think we need to start to get down to that, working with those agencies right from the get-go. Uh, so that's, uh, I want to say that that's what's also needed. So not just academics, but also work with the utilities, work with your public service commissions, work with your equivalent of NYSERDAs and, and, and at the city's uh, level as well. 
I would have imagined also that building part of the physical infrastructure is a federal issue and a shared federal state issue on building out the new grid and where, and those decisions have hardly even been explicitly addressed. We've not had an infrastructure program anywhere that is based on the kind of underlying yes. energy transformation dynamics. So that part has not been analyzed at all. It does strike me that many of you probably could approach the governor's office in your state of whether there is this kind of transformation planning underway to get to zero, uh, which is even prudentially a state should do that. Even if they don't believe it, they understand that that may become public policy soon enough because that is what is mandated actually if we're to meet global goals. So for a state to say, I don't believe it, may not be uh, sufficient to not do it. In other words, uh, every state should have an analysis. Quickly, they'll learn, I'm not alone. The neighbors make a big difference. The region makes a big difference. And uh, also the underlying technology assumptions where our national discussion within this network can make a huge difference as well. But I do think engaging with your state government on this issue, and my guess is most states do not have such a planning process in place, much less a specific idea of what transformation is going to be made. California, yes, to a significant extent. Washington, probably yes. New York, to some extent. But it pretty quickly uh, goes down from there, would be my guess. I may be wrong, but that would be my, my assumption. Who else would like to join in uh, at the moment? Please, yeah, CB. Hi, I'm C.B. Bhattacharya from the University of Pittsburgh. Um, my question again relates to another stakeholder group, which is the uh, private sector. So we heard about the utilities and the need to engage with the utilities, but uh, what about the companies that exist um, in these regions? So I come from a region where we have, uh, you know, U.S. Steel and, and Alcoa and several others. Um, with, who are some of whom are on board, but several of them are not. How do we engage? How does the network engage mm -hmm. and get the buy-in from the corporates so that um, you know we can as well leverage their knowledge and expertise uh, in this area? I, I think that's a very good point. And you know, in talking about New York City, I kind of didn't highlight the importance of industry, which is of course very important private industry and I you know what is interesting is that if you look at what happened in Europe Dong which is you know a big offshore wind installer for example changed its name it stood for Danish oil and natural gas but nobody want, they don't want anybody to know that anymore they go by D-O-N-G as one word stat oil has changed its name so Actually, there are many legacy industrial players which are just as important to this transition. And I think sort of seeing where they actually have equally a role to play. There's going to be steel involved in all this stuff. There's going to be aluminum involved. There's going to be many things involved. So. Yeah. Stat oil is Equinor now, yes. if, if you haven't heard. So it's a sign of the times. Uh, one last comment by Clayton. Hey, good morning, Professor. Uh, I'm Clayton Lewis Ferrara. I'm a biologist and the executive director of Ideas for Us. I just wanted to share something that I think is an important element here. Uh, my organization is based out of Orlando, and that's where we live. Orlando is fortunate enough to be now one of five cities in the entire country that's integrated the SDGs into our sustainability plan. We need a lot more of that. There's a lot of this work that's being done in many different silos, and you almost have to build kind of an A-team of an engineer, a publicist, a marketer, someone who deals with politicians to kind of bring these groups together. I think that it's really important that we understand that we need to play to each individual audience. I look at why we're 
able to make so much headway in Orlando compared to other cities, some uh, uh, in Florida in particular, one of the reasons that's been brought up is that we have a very agreeable mayor. But when it comes down to working with the people in the different departments and commissioners within that city, you have to play to the audience tremendously. So for many of the things that we've done, we've brought in sociologists or people who deal with uh, understanding political parties to be able to present this information in a way that's extremely, uh, you know, at their level, not asking them to stretch tremendously in understanding a bunch of climate science in order to see how something will drive economic development in their community. And what this has led to is even with our municipality that we have, OUC, we've started a discussion of decommissioning the power plant and uh, stopping a massive multi-million dollar loan that they were going to take out to update it. And uh, we brought in a coalition at that particular time, but we did it with marketers and engineers and many, many, many different people at the table. I think that there's a model that can be created from best practices to come into a city and to be able to turn key, get them on the path to first adopting the SDGs, but then also integrating them into a lot of various things. And I think that if we were to collectively work on something like that to kind of, uh, I hate the term dumb down the science, but you've got- Yeah, to, don't use it. Yeah. Well, you've got to be able to market it then, right? Don't use that either. Okay. Just, so look, good knowledge, evidence-based, and uh, sure. adult discussions that are serious on what we need to do. Yep. Good. Clayton, thank you very much. And uh, Orlando is indeed uh, doing a lot of tremendous things. I think for all of us in campuses, we're in our city, so engaging really should be a natural thing, and engaging with the mayor first is not hard. Yeah. Your, by the way, your institutions are uh, probably the major employers uh, in the city, uh, the major business of the city in most cases. Uh, there's no difficulty in having the discussion. Of course, the difficulty also is in having our institutions being effective counterparts and being able to, to work on this. Yeah, just, just real quick, there's also a, a great deal of magic that can happen when cities uh, align with their university systems that are there. Yep. In Orlando, we're fortunate that we've got five colleges that are operating there. Since I last saw you in Rome, we've had a sit-down meeting with all of them to have them begin measuring their collective impact as those colleges together, then in tandem with the city as well in regards to the SDGs, and that's very powerful. Wonderful. I just want to say one sentence. The National Science Foundation wants exactly this and has created a program called the Sustainability Research Networks for multiple universities to work with cities and come together. So I'll, I'll, I'll say we should talk over coffee break. And that is a good segue to coffee break. Thank you.
In, we met in beautiful Bellagio. Bill Selecki. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's always a problem to, to fix or something. We, we, met, we, we talked about uh, SDG, what you think of SDG 11.
But uh, is it, is it the biodiversity group developing like a whole new like ICC? Like, like, so he could be the you know the, the grand one of the grand poobahs of that. Yeah. He's got a little bit of an ego, I think. Yeah. <laughs> We all do. I was a little. I'm just teasing. No, no, no. no I'm just, I need to. It's ego used for good purposes. Hi, everyone. I think we'll be starting in the next five minutes. If you can find your way to your seat. Yeah, I mean, when I'm with 
Hi, everybody. We're going to get started in just a minute. Hey everybody, we're about to get started. Thank you for grabbing the coffee and taking your seats. Great, thank you guys. Um, so did everybody get some caffeine? We're all set? Okay. Uh, so I'm Jean Holm. Uh, I'm with the City of Los Angeles. How many people are here representing cities today? Wait, I, hey, I've talked to some city people. How many people are here representing cities? A couple of brave hands. Okay, how many people are here representing universities or research organizations? Wow, okay. So how many of you live in cities? 
<laughs> All right, awesome. And how many of you have a smartphone or have ever used a computer? All right, so this is the session for you. All right, so we're talking about smart cities, our connected cities. We're talking about ICT and how technologies can make a connection. And we're hoping this is going to be a super engaging, lively discussion. All right, so Bill and I are going to talk a little bit about what we're kind of doing and give some context. Um, Sanjeev had a family emergency and can't be here today, but I'm, uh, he and I work very closely together, and so I've got some of his slides and we'll represent his work. Um, and so if you want to challenge us, I didn't ask him, Bill, if this is okay. If you want to challenge us, just like raise your hand and interrupt us. We'll have lots of time for discussion at the end as well. So let's start with Bill. Okay. Um, well, thanks to, to Jeff and the organizers for inviting me. Uh, my name is Bill Selecki. I'm a professor of geography here at the City, uh, City University of New York, Hunter College. Um, and as was sort of mentioned, uh, I've been doing sort of a lot of work sort of connected to this issue of, of sustainable cities. I was the, uh, just a, a 10 second sort of background just to sort of give you a sense of, of who's in front of you. Um, um, I was the co-founder of something, uh, founder, however you want to say it, of something called the Institute for Sustainable Cities. Um, and we sort of uh, operated it uh, and continue to do so, sort of looking at this question of how to integrate um, sustainable practice you know, into the context of cities. This is something we've been going on for about uh, 10 years. The other sort of major thread of my work, in fact, some of which I'll, I'll reflect on now, is specifically on climate change in cities. Um, and a lot of that work is uh, with a, a co-researcher, uh, um, Cynthia Rosenzweig, who's also uh, connected here with, with Columbia. And, and actually, it's in this literally, this building where uh, some of the early work, uh, we've been, uh, about more than 20 years ago, we asked, we were asked to sort of put together an assessment of climate change impacts on cities, particularly the New York metropolitan region. We had some of the uh, closing events um, on campus. And then literally about uh, 10 years or so ago, we founded something called the Urban Climate Change Research Network um, in like downstairs in one room over. Um, and the other thing that we sort of like to sort of connect with is that uh, one, of, one of my other hats is I'm the um, co-chair of the New York City Panel on Climate Change. So we provide the city of New York with uh, in-depth information about uh, climate change with respect to the city. And we've been doing that over a series of, of reports over the past 10 years. And one of the things that we also uh, like to sort of, you know, put our little cap on is that while Michael Bloomberg, when mayor, took on the mantle of climate change specifically for mitigation sometime around 2005, 2006, we and, and our work and our collective work really encouraged him to sort of get engaged in the question of adaptation as well. Um, and that in some ways sort of fostered the development of the New York City Panel on Climate Change. So that's sort of, um, you know, some of the things that, that we bring together. Um, a lot of uh, very explicit sort of connection between university work and community and city. Um, and Shifting back for a moment to my work with the, um, the Institute for Sustainable Cities, one of the things that I recognize, and this is why I'm really excited to be here today, is this issue of the role and power and capacity of cities to be transformative. I mean, all of you, as you just saw, you know, or maybe most of you live in cities, but of course cities, you know, in, as part of their history, have overcome challenges. That's basically the definition of the city existing today. We, my colleague here from Los Angeles, I mean, Los Angeles Basin has approximately water available naturally for maybe 100,000 people. Um, they're now in Southern California, there's about 20 million or so. Um, so something has happened. Something has sort of created a possibility of sustaining that population. Now, whether or not those issues are quote unquote sustainable in terms of water supply, conveyance, et cetera, that's another, another sort of fundamental question. But the idea that cities have met challenges and overcome them um, and continue to thrive is sort of a, something that I look toward in the context of the sustainable development challenge today, as well as the sort of more specific question on sustainability, uh, I see, on, on climate change. So one of the things that sort of struck me, uh, just as an sort of intro comment, um, there are a couple of things that have always sort of guided my thinking. One is this, this issue of, you know, we, we heard about this previously about the context of planning. And while we recognize that that's always complicated in the, in the context of the United States and sort of the issue of developing plans and implementing them, you know, that, that's always a challenge. 
But I think one of the things we keep in mind for cities is that, the, that we can see other examples of places that have, in other contexts, where transformative planning has been put into place and changed the daily life of those locations. And I'm specifically talking about rural America. And one of the things that guided my thinking in the early days of some of the work at the Institute was how do we borrow some of the elements of the extension service and the land grant institution tradition in the great colleges and, and universities of, of the country and translate that to activities and operations within cities. I mean, and we, of course we know many of you from states where those, those extension services dramatically transformed the everyday life of city and excel as, of, of rural areas and accelerated the process of integration of new technologies such as smart technologies, their equivalent in the early 20th century into rural America. Electrification, uh, agricultural practice, um, uh, hydrologic uh, you know, transformations, all these things that we are familiar with. So one of the things that I was particularly sort of driven by is how do you telescope that process and accelerate it in the context of cities? We've tried to do that in the context of, of the Institute. I know many of, of the other institutions and, and sort of um, centers, et cetera, that are represented here have done that as well. So that's, I think, sort of this, this really interesting charge for this group and, and, the, uh, and the SDN uh, activities writ large. Now, with all that as a brief intro, and I know I've probably already used up many of my minutes. I don't know, the, well, to see. Um, one of my other sort of requests that, that were brought to me was to sort of talk a little bit in the broader context um, and I, about one, the 1 1.5 report. Um, I was a, a co-author on that. I also was a co-author on the just recently released National Climate Assessment, the one, the, the Black Friday report, which I like as a sort of a moniker for it, um, that came out last week. Um, so there's a tremendous amount of knowledge that's now available to understand um, some of these questions. Of course, there's also the SACA report, which was the quiet report that also came out on Black Friday, not, uh, not um, not just the, N the NCA4, but also this national or sort of uh, continental scale evaluation of, of the carbon, uh, carbon conditions for the, for, the, uh, for the region. So what I want to do in that context is just sort of thumb through a few things uh, from the 1.5 report. I think it, it's relevant to the SDGs because in truth the articulation of the 1.5 report is, is closely connected to the SDGs and having just um, lived through, experienced, uh, uh, you know, suffered through many, many, many uh, IPCC meetings regarding this, SDGs and, the, and their importance were translated into the report and then I think become a, a, a good vehicle for picking up some of that discussion. So um, we have the report, a very, very colorful, um, colorful cover. Um, it was re released last month, of course, and now has become, you know, one of the uh, uh, issues of debate uh, in uh, Katowice, where they're uh, breathing in lots of coal smoke and um, eating lots of beef from what I saw on the news today. Um, but none, nonetheless, some of the challenges that are embedded in, in our work. Um, and this is actually the title of the report. And why, why do I put this in? One, it's like the, you know, the world's longest title of a report. Um, but also, it, it, it actually illustrates the ambition of this whole project. Because it's not just keeping um, temperatures, uh, global warming temperatures below 2 degrees C toward 1.5 but also it tries to sort of create a mechanism through a set of pathways to not only achieve um, that, but also to engage with sustainable, sustainable development, SDGs, and as well, of course, uh, let's also eradicate poverty. Um, so a small, a small remit, but that's its, that's its title. Um, so wh what has the report said? There are sort of four major takeaways. Um, and you know some of this you've probably already seen, so I'm, I'm going to quickly jot over, and maybe in the Q and A I'll come back to as needed. Uh, we know that climate change is impacting um, the the world. Uh, clearly, there are clear benefits to sort of keep below two and then toward 1.5, um, and that uh, these last two are particularly relevant for this discussion in cities. One is that it's uh, it's challenging, but it is possible and the, the term we've used is, is feasible. Um, and one of the things we wanted to highlight here is that, and we've already heard it a little bit, the technology is present in many cases to achieve these goals, to implement um, issues. But the other thing is that the institutions, um, the social norms, financing are some of the, 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 the highest barriers, at least that's what the assessment report uh, noted. And of course, very strongly is this link to um, these SDG goals. 
Um, and of course, there's a, a full assessment of that in the report. Um, I'll just sort of toggle through this a little bit. Um, you know, we're at one degree C, we're sort of galloping uh, toward um, 1.5, probably somewhere in the range of um, the early 2040s. Now, again, why is that relevant? Of course, because the SDGs in, the con in their context are basically sort of running along, along in a parallel path. And of course, within the context of that, cities are especially important because we know almost all of the population growth in, in the globe during that time, either through the SDG time period or toward 1.5, are going to be in cities. Almost all that population growth that we're going to be experiencing, much of it in uh, low and moderate income countries for sure, but we'll see increasing sort of population growth, certainly um, ur uh, urban population growth in, in the U.S. as well. Um, so these are just some of the, some of the context questions. Um, and what does this sort of mean for for some of the uh, questions of carbon emissions, and again, going to back to this, this issue of um, smart cities and, and interconnectedness, what we basically need to do is accelerate, dramatically accelerate the process of decarbonization. We've heard this already, but it is really, you know, in this next 10 years and, of course, in this next 20 years where we need to sort of dramatically sort of uh, launch a whole set of initiatives and the capacity of using smart technologies is going to be one of the vehicles to, to achieve that. Um, and, oops, I'm sorry, moving too fast here. So this range of technologies, again, embedded in the report, and there's too much just maybe in the Q&A, I can highlight some of these things, but in Chapter 4 particularly, there is a kind of a clear articulation of some of these capacities of new, of using new and emerging technologies, and the idea of smart technologies, which in some ways I think we see sort of entering into a second generation. Obviously, a lot of these technologies and the idea of it, of a smart city, has been uh, at least present in the literature for 10 or 15 years. Some of the, the, the failings or limitations of those approaches have been recognized. But one of the things in the assessment report really highlighted some of the opportunities to sort of move on from those, uh, some of those questions and integrate some of the new and emerging perspectives. And um, we have a, a broad set of impacts that potentially could be uh, taken uh, place and of course in the context of cities we see some of these these issues sort of playing out very specifically whether it's sort of um, uh, the issue of, of specific uh, change in energy mix but also the role of the connection between cities and rural areas because in some cases some of the uh, carbon emissions practices will be very relevant um, uh, in rural areas and so the, some of the city solutions are going to be played out in the rural context as well. Um, I'm getting the note that we're sort of moving toward the end of time uh, in terms of my own uh, um, few minutes here. I just wanted to sort of end off with, just as a, as a further kind of um, lean toward this question of smart cities. In the context of the report, there was really the issue of climate resilient development pathways, and that was sort of the, 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 the broader rubric. And one of the things that, that came out in the in the report specifically to the question of cities and, and more particularly to the issue of uh, technologies and, and, and in this case smart technologies that we need to sort of think about ways of accelerating this process of learning um, particularly in the post-event context I mean many of you are in cities that have experienced droughts or, or, or strong storms unprecedented events a lot of the literature sort of seems to illustrate that those are a key events for learning and, and engaging not just in, in adaptation strategies, but also um, new um, questions of, of climate re uh, emissions reduction and mitigation. Um, also within this, all the practices need to sort of engage. I mean, a lot of the smart technologies uh, initially were thought of as top down. I think we see a second generation, more bottom up, more citizen science, more, more community instrumentation and sensing. It's in that context where a lot of the more effective efforts have emerged in terms of um, you know, community engagement um, and also sort of dealing with sort of disempowered populations as well. So that's a, a huge issue and a lot of the work that we do is in the city and other locations, it has to connect to the everyday and the life conditions and neighborhood conditions of, of the residents. I think the other sort of closing point, which is obvious, in some ways is obvious from this discussion, is that there's a lot of knowledge capacity that is emerging. And there's some things like C40, the Urban Climate Change Research Network, many others, um, SDSN. And I think it's in accelerating that through multiple partnerships in each city that the, the vehicle for change seems to be most significant. Um, so with that, I think I'm just going to close. I, again, what I tried to do is sort of couch some of these intro comments with respect to 
the, the 1.5 challenge and some of the, the technological issues that sort of start to emerge from that discussion. But I know uh, Gene is going to sort of pick up that very specifically. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Bill. So um, just to give you a quick context, I've uh, worked in and around the government for 35 years. I spent 32 of those at NASA, um, another five with the White House for the Obama administration as the evangelist, the only person in the federal government that title, evangelist for data.gov and open data initiatives. Um, so hopefully you've downloaded some of our data. Uh, and then I spent a few years with the World Bank uh, working throughout Central Africa, Russia, and India on open data initiatives. Now I'm in the amazing city of Los Angeles, my hometown, working for the best mayor in the country. There's a throwdown. Um, Eric Garcetti is a visionary and um, has been very uh, supportive of our work around the SDGs. So LA, like Orlando, um, has adopted. Yeah. <laughs> Um, has adopted the SDGs as a framework for how we can better manage our city. Um, we do this in conjunction with uh, some very generous support from the Hilton Foundation uh, and the mayor's office. We have a mayor's fund as well. Um, and uh, Sanjeev Kagram, who couldn't be here today, uh, was representing Occidental College and is now in Arizona at Arizona State University. So I just want to kind of call out those partnerships. Um, and so what are, what are we doing in Los Angeles that makes us even want to consider the SDGs at a, at a subnational level? And I think this is really important. So we are really working towards being a smart city. Not that we were a dumb city before, but we want to be a smarter city. And really this for us means connections amongst all of our Angelinos, particularly as we think about the future of technology around autonomous vehicles. They're here today. Autonomous flying vehicles. We will be testing them at the end of next year in Los Angeles. So Uber Air and Elevate are coming to LA. Um, uh, robotics and a whole variety of technologies. And really our focus, as some of the others have said, is really around equity. So what makes it different than any other technology initiative is we are looking at how to connect the most impoverished county in the country. So once you factor in the fact that housing is incredibly expensive in Los Angeles, we are poorer than any other county. Housing costs often 50% of somebody's uh, income. And so when you factor that in, as well as other issues and transportation costs, suddenly you have a lot of people who are on the verge of homelessness or becoming homeless. And so how do we think differently when as a city, like we don't control poverty or hunger, like those are at different governmental levels, but as a city, we have a responsibility to help people have a better quality of life. So we are using a ton of technologies. I'm not going to talk about all of these. Um, everything from gamification, which is a pretty cool set of technologies we're using with Riot and Blizzard games. I'm a gamer, so I'm just going to put it right out there. So if you are the gamers, we can talk about World of Warcraft in the back. Um, but gamification is a great way to connect with young people about issues going on in the city and to gather data. So we're doing gamification around climate change, actually. So we're about to launch Agents of Climate, where kids can go and using virtual reality and augmented reality in the city parks, capture different kinds of creatures, identify different kinds of plants, and also take temperature readings. So starting to get that awareness built into the next generation of our citizen scientists. Um, and then, of course, machine learning and Internet of Things and all these other aspects. So I don't know about you guys, but I never have like people at the organization that know all these things. And so we created, so this is kind of my normal day to day, right? <laughs> so no budget. You can't hire anybody. All my city staff has older skills. I'm younger. I'm 57, and I'm younger than the average age of the city, so that's not a good place to be. Um, and our outcome is we have to change the world. So <laughs> other than that, all's good. Um, so what I did is, uh, in addition to the other stuff, I've been a professor at UCLA for 20 years. Um, and my students had other challenges. So how do you, and maybe you guys can relate to some of this. How do you get students who are working on projects to have access to real data? How do you let them feel empowered that their experiences in the classroom will make a difference in the world around them? How can you make sure that they're coming out with the skills employers want? And how do you make sure that they're engaged in the classroom? OK, so I don't know if you relate to any of those. <laughs> but that's like my life day to day at UCLA. Either at UCLA or I also teach in China for the university. And so what I did is when I came to the city a couple years ago, 
I said, I'm going to fix two problems at once. <laughs> I'm going to fix that zero budget, no city skills problem, and I'm going to fix the problem where students out in the universities don't have access to data and they don't know a pathway. And there was a third problem, which is we have 48,000 employees at the city of Los Angeles, and as part of that, 20,000 are retiring in the next five years because they're all older than me. <laughs> so we need to hire. <laughs> And so I wanted our students coming out of the universities locally to stay in Los Angeles, come work for the city, or at least be more informed about city data issues. So I created the Data Science Federation with 17 local universities. We serve not only the needs of the city of Los Angeles, but the 88 other Southern California cities. Um, we are open to partnering with the other cities around the country as well. Um, we host uh, students from a lot of different places. In fact, shout out to University of Chicago. Uh, we hosted a University of Chicago student here as part of our Data Science Federation working on a homelessness project. Um, we are open to lots of partnerships. And the way we do this is we create uh, data sharing agreements and intellectual property uh, agreements and do all those stupid legal stuff. Sorry, the important, important legal stuff up front. And then we can go like full bore with all the professors at the university across multiple departments who are interested in doing research around issues that are important to the city but we don't know how to solve. And again, we've opened this up just recently through the Southern California Association of Governments to 88 other cities. And so the kinds of challenges that we look at are smart city technologies. We're doing an earthquake early warning app. This is my life right now because it rolls out in four weeks. Um, so you'll be able to download an app that will tell you an earthquake is happening before you feel it and help you get to be safe. Um, if you want it, let me know or look in the App Store on December 31st, because I said by the end of the year. Um, we work on homelessness issues, predicting who is at risk of homelessness to stop it before it starts. Uh, that was the University of Chicago student and a partnership with UCLA's California Policy Lab and USC's uh, Homeless Policy Research Institute. And then we're looking at more tactical things like access to housing and how to make it affordable, um, how to make sure people's housing rights are protected, and then making sure we do all sorts of really cool stuff like cannabis regulations are bringing in a huge amount of new um, revenue to the city. So how do we make sure that we're you know, managing these new opportunities in really good ways? So our students do tons of stuff. But we also have an amazing civic hacking community, which many of you guys also do. Um, and so we work with our Hack for LA, which is our local Code for America organization. And we bring in all sorts of people to work on these challenges as well. And this group meets twice a week, uh, two nights a week uh, across the city and really uh, looks at interesting projects. And so one of the major areas we wanted to get all of these young people looking with a different perspective is at the Sustainable Development Goals. So we have focused for the last year a whole cohort of students from multiple universities to look at these um, challenges. And so I'm just going to talk about a couple of things briefly. Um, so first is around SDG 1, around poverty. So the city doesn't actually fund issues around poverty. Like we don't really have control over poverty. It's a county organized set of initiatives, but that doesn't mean we don't have the responsibility or that there's things we can contribute to help to measure whether or not we're being effective. So we, as I said, live in an incredibly impoverished space, even though we also have some of the richest people in the world in Los Angeles. So it's this dichotomy between the Kardashians and the people living on the streets. Um, and then like in South LA, which is one of our most impoverished companies, uh, uh, areas of the city, um, this is an area where 82% of families struggle just to get by. And so in that community, for example, only 50% of the homes have internet access at home because it's just not, like it's not affordable. Like $15 a month is simply not affordable as an option. And yet think about all the opportunities they could have if they could get job training and access. So we're working actually with a 5G initiative. We're the first 5G city on the planet. Um, and, uh, and as part of that, all of our telecommunication companies have to build out in our low-income neighborhoods affordably and as fast as anywhere else in the city. And so what are we doing? Well, we're looking at, as to have the students look at all of the SDGs, we ask them to tell us what are we doing well and what do we have to improve and how can we do that in a different way. And so this is something we've never thought about before at the city. I know, it's a little crazy. But the reason we haven't thought about it is because we don't have the authority or the budget for it. 
And so the SDGs give us this framework to think differently about it. And the partnerships with the universities, the Data Science Federation, allow us to bring in tons of new ideas. And these students, of course, aren't just people who live in Los, I mean, they currently live in Los Angeles, but they're students who come from lots of different countries. And so we are getting an amazing perspective across the SDGs and how we can think differently about them and how we can hold ourselves accountable for things that we maybe haven't in the past in a different way because of partnerships with organizations like all of you. And then we also looked at the issues around uh, gender equity. So we have some amazing things that the mayor has done. 50% um, of our commissioners, the, those are appointed people, um, are women. 52% of our general managers, those are the people who really run the city, are women, including for our airport and port and transportation. And yet we find that when we looked at our budget, we don't have funding for gender programs. So kind of where your money, put your money where your mouth is. Uh, we realize that there's more things we can do. And for LA, the way we ended up localizing this SDG was the fact that for us, the LGBTQIA community is super important. It's a big part of why Los Angeles feels that we're representative of a diverse or, uh, community. And so for us, gender becomes a spectrum. It's not a binary. And that means that as we look at the indicators, for us, we want to localize those in a way that makes contextual sense for our community. And then I'm just going to briefly mention that we also did a ton around uh, sustainable communities and then climate action. But I think Bill kind of um, spoke to some of that. But again, we, like many of you, live in a city where there's a sustainability officer, a sustainability plan, or some other activity. So we actually mapped back and forth between all of these plans that get published. And I'm not really sure what happens with some of the plans. <laughs> some of the plans are great. Some of the plans are not so great. Um, and so what we did is we mapped all of those things we said we were going to do back to the SDGs. And then we looked at what other cities were doing. So San Francisco, New York, Boston, lots of folks have been doing amazing work in this area. And so we've tried to learn from them. And uh, SDSN has been super helpful in making sure that we get connected to them as well as some of the other networks we're part of. And so I just want to kind of mention that as a result, this partnership of universities and cities with a focus on the SDGs has really transformed the kind of things that we look at and the way we prioritize our policies and the way we look at sometimes favored programs like, oh, everybody loves this program, but it doesn't really have good outcomes. Um, so sometimes, you know, things that, that are spoken about in a qualitative way, once you put some quantitative data behind it, doesn't really pay off. And there are other ways you can make investments or partnerships that make a bigger difference for the people who live in and around your city. And so we actually have a dashboard. This is a mayor's dashboard that we portray some of the work on the SDGs. So we can tell if we're red, yellow, green. We try to be very transparent and open about this. Um, and then the last thing was really like, how do we make this sustainable? Because lots of people get up at conferences like this and they talk about <laughs> what they're going to do and then they don't do it or they leave and then it doesn't happen. And so the way we did that is we had a huge motivator, is we had the Olympics coming in 2028, which coincidentally is just before the 2030 goals. <laughs> so all of the city departments are highly motivated to be able to actually do something for the Olympics. And as a result, we are using that as a way of connecting the SDGs in a sustainable way to actually build stuff out. So, um, so it's been a great partnership across universities with the cities. Um, I'm open to hearing about anybody who wants to be part of our Data Science Federation or learn from it and do your own Data Science Federation. Um, and just thanks to all the research and work going on at the universities. So do you want to take any questions? Okay. So we're going to move to the next panel, which is uh, health, nutrition, and well-being. So can I ask uh, our next presenters uh, to come up, and we'll get them introduced. Thank you. 
Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Uh, good morning. I'm uh, happy to be here. I'm Erwin Redliner, and uh, I'm at Columbia University, where I, not related to this talk, but run the National Center for Disaster Preparedness and a small uh, program called the Program on Child Well-Being and Resilience. And um, uh, the crew asked me to come and talk to you about the SDGs in relationship to one of the more important goals, although I, I feel overwhelmed by the climate and energy stuff and a little guilty that I'm not working on that, but I do work on healthcare. <laughs> and I, I, I want to present uh, our sense of what we mean by healthcare and why it is a relevant uh, topic and a very important topic for the literally the well-being of, uh, of Americans. And I, I'm, going to, I'm going to try to cover some basic points. We only have uh, 10 or 12 minutes per speaker. And then there's going to be two other speakers, and then we'll do uh, Q and A. So first of all, I I want to make sure that we are all talking about the same thing. And one of the things that uh, has impressed me over the years of doing a lot of work on healthcare, especially for underserved populations, is that we are very, very definitionally challenged. And I'm going to talk to you about what that actually means because. We don't actually know how to define healthcare, nor do we know how to define access to healthcare, and that's a real problem if we're trying to design policies to address this big uh, problem. So I'm going to try to put us on common ground and then uh, conclude with some uh, comments about the role of the university, universities individually, universities and consortiums, to deal with some of these problems on this other topic out here. Um, I'm also then going to introduce you. I'm going to tell you about them very quickly right now, and then they're going to come up and speak uh, uh, shortly. Uh, first, will be, uh, after me is Shauna Downs, who's a very interesting food systems researcher. She's going to talk about nutrition, not in terms of what should be in your diet, but what are the systems that, that make sure that good and nutritious food products go from wherever they came from into your onto your kitchen table. And this is a really important part of the nutritional conundrum and challenge that we actually don't talk about enough, and Shauna will. She's a uh, food systems researcher at the Rutgers School of Public Health, and we'll hear from Shauna shortly. And then uh, possibly one of the more interesting titled individuals I have encountered in many years will be uh, Alejandro Adler. He directs the international education at the Positive Psychology Center at the University of Pennsylvania. Just an absolutely fascinating, evocative, provocative <laughs> title, and uh, Alejandro is going to talk to us about how to integrate the principles of positive psychology into the curricula of, uh, of universities, and I'm looking forward to that talk as well. So let me dive into healthcare. We'll go on a quick trip here and see if we can uh, figure out what we need to do. First of all, some common data. The, the documents, the books, the reports that Jeff and others have been talking about are available. They're extraordinary, I must say, filled with data. But I'm just, uh, just a couple of quick slides to make sure that we're coming from the same place on this. First of all, as Jeff mentioned earlier, this, this mind-blowing uh, decline of life expectancy in the United States is something we really need to pay attention to. Why that has happened? What's, what are all the factors? Is it part? Excuse me. Partly the opium epidemic. Is it partly uh, a sustained level of poverty around the country, et cetera? That's for other discussions to deal with. But we're just here to say that we have a remarkable drop in life expectancy. Very unfortunate. Secondly, uh, the uh, the projected expenditures on health care in the United States uh, will by 2020. I don't see how this is going to be stopped, but let's maybe it will be. It's going to approach. Uh, uh, literally 20% of the GDP of the U.S., uh, a, a, an insane number uh, that is really virtually unaffordable and an economic time bomb if you ever wanted to see one. Uh, thirdly, the rate of people uninsured, the percentage of people uninsured in America uh, is going back up. So the Affordable Care Act in 2009, just over beyond the left uh, perimeter of the, uh, of the graph here. Uh, we were doing, you know, we had to get settled into the Affordable Care Act, and then uh, Medicaid expansion has resulted, did result, in a very significant drop in the number of uninsured Americans. However, that's beginning to climb back up again, and there's a lot of reasons for that. I'm not going to, cannot have time to dwell on that, but that's the third point. The other point is that one of the things I'm very interested in is this nexus between 
insurance and the financing of healthcare and the actual delivery of healthcare, your access to healthcare. So if you stop by one of the emergency rooms, even in our spectacular health centers here in New York or anywhere around the country, in most ERs, you will see this. You'll see it right now. You'll see it in the middle of the night. It'll be twice as uh, bad as this on the weekends. It is a reflection of a major problem in what other kinds of services people have access to. So I'm going to talk a bit about access. And one of the things that you should uh, be aware of, in case you're not, is this there's a federal designation called health professional shortage areas. Those that work in this field, we, we familiarly call them HIPSAs. But HIPSAs uh, cover huge portions of the United States. So for primary care, a HIPSA is a geographic area where there's less than one primary care doctor for 3,000 people. And if you look at the map of the U.S., the uh, spread of HIPSAs around the United States is startling, it's dramatic, and it's not easily fixable. Uh, which, uh, and here's another aspect of this, is that the level of, uh, of um, HIPSAs and the uh, relationship of providers to patient population is extremely variable. So this is a, this is a, a really crazy reality. So if you live uh, on the border of a state that's got really good uh, distribution of physicians and availability, relatively speaking, uh, that's fine. But you may go... 10 miles across the border, and then you're in a state that has absolutely lousy distribution and availability of doctors. So we can't solve health care if we don't pay attention to uh, the reality of where the providers are. And this is one of the things that's extremely localized on a state level, so it becomes an agenda for universities in states that do have serious problems with uh, provider shortages, and it, it presents an agenda that is politically salient in those uh, states. Uh, many other things. One other point I just want to make is this: things like transportation can be a barrier to, or the lack of transportation, a barrier to healthcare. In a couple of surveys that we did over the years, uh, this is just one of the studies: a lack of adequate transportation cited as a barrier to healthcare in 37 of the 50 states. It's it's really extraordinary, and it's one of the things that lends itself to analysis and advocacy by universities. So here's the definitional challenges. So we all want access to health care that's affordable, which, of course, suggests three questions. What do we mean by access? What is health care? And what actually is affordable? And let me, let me talk to you about it in this way. So if you ask your mom what access to health care is, she, like my mom, would say, well, can I, get to the doc can I get the doctor on the phone, get an appointment this afternoon, and maybe, maybe I'll get a house call. My mother used to think that. Uh, what healthcare means to meant to my mom and maybe yours too is sort of a rambling, random medical history conducted by a very friendly doctor, and somehow culminating in a prescription, and you're you're done. And affordable to my mother was, you know, uh, she'll know when she sees it. But you should also be aware of the fact that uh, at least six hundred thousand uh, bankruptcies uh, in uh, the United States, family bankruptcies, are associated with unaffordable. Uh, medical bills that simply cannot be paid, which is a really horrible thing. Ask a politician what's access? Well, having health insurance. Well, okay. And what's health care? Well, whatever. Go to the emergency room. And literally, I've had conversations with political leaders who should know better who actually have this point of view. And if you talk to them about affordable health care, it's what? What is that? What do you mean? And, uh, you know, this, is a, this engenders all kinds of conversations and situations uh, to deal with on the political level. If you ask a modern doctor what's access, it really is about getting the patient and the provider in the same place at the same time and the right time. So I'm going to now hit this button and I'm going to show you what a modern doctor or provider or citizen really wants when they say healthcare. It's comprehensive, family-centered, system-based, affordable services that include screening, prevention, acute and chronic disease management, uh, access to primary and subspecialty uh, providers, as well as needed ancillary services, et cetera. It's what some, some of us in the field are calling a uh, medical home. And uh, this getting there is what we want. How we get there to this definition, this standard of care, which we should have for every human being in the United States, is a real uh, challenge. Affordable, is that a medical term? 
because none of my colleagues would think that it even remotely is something that they need to think about, unfortunately. So the essential point here, and I'm going to conclude this uh, shortly, is this is something, to, this is the take home here. An insurance card does not equal access to quality health care. And this is something that has to be pried loose from the minds of uh, political leaders who think, oh, I got you insurance, if I did, and now let's move on to another topic. And that we can't, uh, we can't have that. So let me uh, conclude with talking specifically about some potential roles for universities in meeting some of the challenges I've talked about. First of all, there's the obvious. There's new technologies, artificial intelligence. How do those new perspectives, new sciences, new technologies help uh, create and provide access to uh, the appropriate kind of health care? Uh, universities can help put out the, no the word that we want, we want all of healthcare to be focused on evidence and science and public health. I'm, I'm a very big fan of universities having public health courses and majors at the undergraduate level. Really important and can really make a difference. If it was up to me, I would not let anyone into medical school without a public health background. It's too critical and it's too important to understand, even if you're in a private practice in a suburb doing cardiology, Understanding the context from a public health point of view is absolutely critical. Uh, there's lots to learn and teach about the, what's called the social determinants of health and well-being, which I can't really go into now. Uh, universities can uh, incentivize a lot of cross-disciplinary collaboration, uh, and I think that's important for students to experience so that they, when they become faculty members, they go into the professions, they've already been trained to appreciate and use interdisciplinary collaboration. And finally, I think uh, the universities as think tanks relative to some of these problems is an incredibly important role. What, what is it that the universities can come up with to solve the physician maldistribution problems? How do we instill social values and advocacy among the people that are gonna be helping to work on policy? And this is the promise of the last slide. So the biggest in my view, SDG uh, USA impact of universities, especially on healthcare, is teaching to an extended student body. The walls have to come down between you and the outside world. So I'm suggesting that your new sense of your student body responsibilities include the public, includes media, and includes the uh, political system. Um, so how do we get from where we are now to not only talking about it, but instilling a sense of responsibility to the community. You teach, yes, you should, that's what your role is. But I'm saying, let's kind of think about how wide and deep we can go outside our own campuses. So I'm gonna leave it at that. And uh, Shauna, would you come up and chat with us? Is someone gonna put my slides up? Okay. So I'm gonna talk about nutrition and food and why it matters in the US context when we're thinking about the SDGs. So even though when we think about SDG two, which is about hunger, but also about nutrition um, and sustainable agriculture, um, we often think about South Asia or Sub-Saharan Africa, but we're, when we're thinking about food insecurity, there's actually still really high rates of food insecurity in the US. So one in eight Americans are, were food insecure in 2017. And when you think of households that have children, that number is even higher. And if you think of, about specific cities, for example, that number is higher. So Baltimore, as an example, almost a quarter of the population is food insecure. At the same time, when we think about overweight and obesity, and part of SDG2 is actually looking at uh, childhood obesity, so uh, childhood overweight, I should say, under five, uh, in the U.S., about 14% of children that are two to five years old are obese. When you look at the data for children that are 10 to 17, that gets even higher. And most states have overweight or obesity rates of over 25%. And actually, if you were to go back to the previous slide, you can pretty much overlay the overweight and obesity, and you see similar trends. So the places that have the highest rates of food insecurity also have really high rates of overweight and obesity. 
And when we think about SDG3, thinking about health and well-being, diets are really important in terms of the risk factors for disease in the U.S. Um, actually, around the world, dietary risk factors or poor diets are the number one contributor to the global burden of disease. And in the U.S., we see high body mass index, so overweight and obesity, uh, which is very much diet related, uh, as the number one cause, and dietary risk factors are number three. So those are on the rise, whereas tobacco is actually on the decline when we're thinking about what is driving morbidity and mortality in the U.S. So the situation isn't great. And when we look at diets, so this slide is looking at the foods that we should be eating or not be eating and where we, where we stand at the moment. For the foods that we, are, we should be consuming more of, we're not eating enough of those foods. Um, when you think about nutrients that we should be avoiding, so on the bottom there you have added sugar, saturated fat, and sodium. We tend to be consuming too much of those foods. So our diets aren't good, um, and there's many, many reasons for this. And I think why I do food systems research is because there are so many underlying drivers that are leading to this. This isn't a matter of people not knowing that they should eat fruits and vegetables. It's a matter of affordability. It's a matter of access, of inequality. Um, so when we're thinking about SDG2 or nutrition and food, we, think, we need to think a lot more broadly. Um, and think beyond SDG2 when we're, ta when we're talking about food. So for example, looking at food waste as one, as one example. This is um, from the US, this is millions of metric tons, and you can see approximately one third of food um, in the US and worldwide actually is wasted. And when you think, when you look at which foods are more likely to be wasted, uh, it tends to be a lot of time the, the more healthy foods, so like fruits and vegetables as an example. And that's being wasted mostly at the consumer level, which is in the green part of the bars. In terms of diets, um, when you look at which food is being wasted, we're actually losing a lot of nutrients. So this, these graphs are looking at the percentage on the left, the percentage of the U.S. adult population that is not getting um, the nutrients they need based on food that is being wasted. So if that food wasn't being wasted, they would be able to meet their dietary recommendations in many cases. And then if you think about SDG 13 and think about climate um, and the carbon footprint of the diets that we're eating, it becomes very clear that something needs to be done. We need to shift our diets, not just in terms of health, but also in terms of the environment. <laughs> this slide is looking at different food groups. On the far right, we have beef, and it's looking at land use. Um, land use in the green, in the blue, water, and the orange is greenhouse gas emissions. And you can see beef is off the charts when we're looking at um, the carbon or the environmental footprint. Um, about you know a third of greenhouse gas emissions come from agricultural production and the way that food moves along the value chain. Um, and as Americans, we're consuming a lot of, of meat. Um, over, I think it's around 200 pounds of, of meat <laughs> per year is the average uh, American consumption. And that's driving huge, um, huge carbon, a huge carbon footprint. So this is something that needs to shift um, in terms of what we're eating. And when we're thinking about nutrition and what the role of the SDGs are, there tends to be obviously the focus on SDG 2 and SDG 3, um, which are highlighted here in this slide. But really, if you want to improve diets and you want to improve nutrition and health outcomes, all of the SDGs need to be addressed. And this figure is actually looking how every single one of the SDGs can influence nutrition. So if we think of sanitation and hygiene as an example, um, that's not that's a huge issue in terms of nutrition in many parts of the world where there's not access to clean water. But if you think of the US, there are pockets of the population that still have um, limited access to safe water. Um, just as one example, if we, if we think of poverty, people often aren't able to buy the nutritious foods. As I mentioned before, it's not just a matter of not knowing that what to eat or what might be healthy. It's a matter of being able to afford those foods. And so if we don't address the broader issues of the system and the 
the misalignment of incentives in the food system um, that make some of these unhealthy foods more affordable, um, that drive consumers to demand those products through advertising. Um, if we don't address those issues, we won't actually fix the food system in the US. So I'm going to just uh, end off on what might be the role of universities. And this is just really to instigate discussion, but we can go a lot further um, on these points. In terms of education, I think it's really important to teach students about the complexities and the challenges related to the food systems or issues related to SDG2 or SDG3, um, and to really teach them to work across disciplines to identify solutions that might be outside of the box or outside of the disciplinary box. Um, that kind of aligned to what uh, President Bollinger was saying earlier in, in the day, we really need to, to get students to be thinking about these problems from a cross-disciplinary perspective. Um, same goes for research. So as I'm a train, trained as a nutritionist, um, then went into public health and now do work in the food system. And so I'm constantly trying to find across my universities, um, where are the people in climate science that are interested in food, um, in agriculture who are interested in the food system, and trying to, to work across the universities and across disciplines. But that becomes very difficult in a lot of universities because they're quite siloed. Um, so that's something that's really important to, to think about. And then lastly, in terms of practice, kind of aligned in terms of what Erwin said, um, getting students to, to expand their, their experience is really important. And from a nutrition and food perspective, I think having um, opportunities for field work is really important so that people understand the complexities of the food system and understand that it's not just going to be one easy fix and that there's going to have to be policies and programming all the way from agricultural production through to processing distribution and down to the consumer level in order to, to really address the, the challenges that the U.S. food system faces. So I think I'll end off there and I look forward to the discussion. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's funny that I'm about to tell you a little bit about happiness and well-being when I'm the last guy between uh, a large group of people with particularly large-sized brains, high-calorie consumption brains, and lunch. Not particularly the happiest place to be. <laughs> um, and um, I'll take the great compliment that Erwin um, paid me uh, about the fascinating title I had until a month ago. Uh, and even though I no longer have that title, and I'm proudly now at both Columbia and SDSN, hoping to bridge research and uh, practice, I hope the presentation I'm giving you uh, today is still fascinating. And uh, more specifically, I'm going to talk about how research, if it is to have an impact on policy and ultimately practice, can and should be translated and packaged as number one, fun, two, attractive, and three, relevant. And this is really hacking into what we know about psychological science and uh, what the title is, which is behavior change. Uh, even though we know the SDGs, the research side of it is interdisciplinary, the implementation policy of side of it is intersectorial, it's a systems-based research metrics and implementation, Behavior change, I'm going to strongly argue, is the biggest contributor towards the SDGs at the individual and social level. And achieving or at least approximating the SDGs has empirically been shown to contribute to health, healthy, happy well-being uh, in people's lives. So um, the corporate world has definitely realized that we're evolutionarily hardwired to what Confucius, Aristotle, said uh, 2,500 and 3,000 years ago, which is we, the human condition is to avoid suffering and seek happiness and well-being. And that's why uh, Coca-Cola, with an open happiness marketing campaign, was tremendously successful in selling us stuff that we often don't need or want and contributing, in this case, to a growing uh, obesity uh, crisis around the world. So 
what I'm going to argue is that we can use the same psychological mechanisms that the corporate world has definitely hacked in making people consume things that are not good for them, that they're good for GDP, to actually achieve the SDGs via research and evidence-based policy. So uh, moving on to well-being, we've uh, now luckily in the world of positive psychology uh, and well-being science developed the psychometric tools to answer what is well-being. It's no longer only a philosophical um, Aristotelian question. We can now empirically answer that well-being is multidimensional. And when I'm with my research colleagues and we see uh, factor analyses with five different samples, that is 18, 18 different uh, items, we get very, very excited. Uh, we ask people in Bhutan, India, the US, what is it that you pursue as an end in and of itself? We have things like positive affect and happiness, engagement, belonging, meaning, purpose. But this, outside of academia, doesn't really move the needle. It doesn't lead to behavior change. And that's one of the reasons I um, left. Penn is a wonderful university, but like many universities, it's incredibly siloed. And the opportunity to come to Columbia and translate the work we've been doing into policy work translates into putting that science into what I think are incredibly fun, attractive and relevant reports like the World Happiness Reports that the Sustainable Development Solutions Network has been publishing since 2012. The OECD, uh, we were ju just in Korea for an OECD World Forum on the future of well-being. And they have an amazing Better Life Index that is as robust, rigorous as an academic would love it to be, and as attractive, fun, and relevant that really moves the needle. And I think this is the real fear in academics, that trivializing or simplifying research too much might really dilute the rigor. Uh, and there's now MOOCs, Coursera, Foundations in Positive Psychology, SDG Academy. There are really excellent ways of making research, again, fun, attractive, relevant. So well-being measurement, moving on to why this is now a science, uh, is multi-method. And we have an amazing uh, group of colleagues at the Positive Psychology Center who are computer scientists. And when I approach them, I, uh, in the fMRI labs, we see how the brains of healthy individuals are actually different than the brains of uh, depressed, clinically depressed individuals in the prefrontal cortex and amygdala. And when I look at the data behind these fMRI uh, scans, uh, they look like this, which, you know, you, I see my computer scientist friends jumping up and down, and when I really don't understand why they're so uh, joyous, the best they'll do is maybe put a little chart like that for me uh, so that I know why they're so excited about um, about these data. And, and this is great. The, the research, the rigorous research is necessary, but we need something like this, which really makes it relevant. This is a better approximation. This is essentially showing us the Easterlin paradox, which is after a certain income per capita, life satisfaction doesn't increase very much. So for poorer countries, increasing GDP is definitely desirable. After a certain amount, equality and equity are much more important than GDP per capita. But even better than that, um, and we actually worked interdisciplinary with people in the business school, marketing communications to be able to translate these big data measurements of well-being into something that's relevant, calling it the World Well-Being Project. And we can now map the well-being, making it relevant to SDSN USA of the US in real time using big data, using Twitter, Facebook tweets, and other uh, psychometric real-time uh, data to map the well-being of the US by uh, at the county level. And you can see that well-being is pretty unevenly distributed. That for me is already pretty attractive. What made it fun earlier today is I decided to look up New York. And uh, okay, wow, New York uh, is overall higher than average. But when we zoom in a little bit, we can see that I'm, I've only been here in New York a little over a month. So Kings, New York, I assume is the wealthier county in New York has uh, is pretty high up. It's in the highest 
uh, quintile, 86.2 percentile in terms of overall well-being. And again, this is combining fMRI data, survey data, real-time Twitter data. When you look at the Bronx, it's a little above average at the 54th or 55th percentile. When you look at uh, Richmond, New York, uh, that's significantly lower. So again, making it relevant, I think the graphics make it pretty uh, user-friendly, fun, and it's much better, at least for me, uh, than seeing just a lot of, uh, um, I, I think that was R or, uh, or, or, or some uh, computer language that I personally don't understand. And finally, well-being we now know is malleable and buildable. And again, this is a meta-analysis of meditation and mindfulness interventions. We know uh, work reliably using these uh, pretty statistically robust t-tests uh, with high p-values. But when we show this to policymakers particularly, or even uh, these larger interventions using large-scale cognitive therapy, this doesn't move the needle in our experience outside of academia. What we need uh, and this is uh, my own uh, research uh, with colleagues, of course, in, in Bhutan. And this to us is pretty compelling, the fact that we can move something on a graph and chart. But only when we translate this to say, where are you in rankings in a way that's compelling, engaging, fun, and especially are you close to the bottom of the ranking? These are rankings for happiness in countries around the world. And beyond that, uh, how do we adapt to something that's locally and contextually relevant? After the data we had, we created a national gross national happiness initiative in education. Gross national happiness is what Bhutan uses rather than GDP to measure progress. And uh, finally, and this is kind of self-serving, but how do we get to create an enduring University of Pennsylvania with the Ministry of Education of, of Bhutan uh, long-term collaborative, collaborative research is you personalize this. You have to show pictures, you have to show that there are real people behind the data um, and humanize that. And again, leverage what we know about positive, uh, about psychology to really move the needle and be able to replicate this. We've been able to replicate this around the world, not in the US uh, yet, I, I like to think. And just a few, to finish off, just a few uh, data points. I know I'm out of time. I think the sustainable development goals, beyond being incredibly virtuous, virtuous, the goals themselves have those three elements. They're attractive, they're fun, I like to think so, and they're definitely relevant. But we can make the metrics and particularly the implementation and policy components much more so. With things like showing in the US, even though income has per capita has increased significantly and consistently since 1950s, the percentage of people who are very happy has remained stable at 30%. And as Jeff said earlier, uh, there are opioid epidemics, depression, anxiety is going up. Why, if income keeps going up, is happiness not going up? Social capital and social cohesion, trust, and so on are diminishing at a pretty alarming rate. Um, income, uh, uh, sorry, is not only, it's not only income, but well-being is unequally distributed. And finally, uh, we know, and this is the last point that I'll make, that SDG, or sorry, happiness rankings, which we see on the left, and SDG rankings, which we see in that middle column, are highly correlated. The correlation is about 0.75. The causal direction we are yet to find which it is, whether SDGs lead to well-being or the other way around. And by the way, uh, taxes, effective tax rates are also pretty highly correlated to meeting the SDGs and happiness and well-being. So behavior change ahead, I think I'm actually quite optimistic if we're able to translate the research so that it's fun, actionable, attractive, and above all relevant. So uh, with that, let's take the best of what the corporate world has hacked, eliminate the worst, and let's get to work. Thank you. Higher authorities have informed me that we'll have 10 minutes for a Q&A. So uh, anybody have any comments, questions for any of these panels? Yes, sir. Okay, well, go ahead. Well, he's... 
Uh, Basil Daher from uh, Texas A&M University. Uh, I'd like to just build on the discussion that uh, uh, was mentioned on the city, specifically in Los Angeles, and also the following discussion on the SDGs and their connections and the role of universities and understanding those. Uh, in that context, I'd like to mention uh, an initiative where we're working on at uh, Texas A&M University, the Water Energy Food Nexus Initiative, which is a uh, three years old now, we've been focusing on specifically looking at the interconnections between the water, energy, and food SDGs, and have been specifically uh, focusing on the city of San Antonio in Texas, which is one of the uh, rapidly uh, urbanizing cities, uh, neighboring uh, the Eagle Fort Shale, where we have a lot of hydraulic fracturing happening and a lot of energy development, as well as a lot of agricultural activity also neighboring the city. Um, so in, in that context, I'd like to ask uh, Jean a question. Uh, after developing the analytics and the tools w within an interdisciplinary team on campus and assessing the different trade-offs associated with different policy interventions, different technology interventions, and different also social and behavioral interventions, we had the chance to meet with the community and with the stakeholders, uh, including the city and other water and energy food uh, stakeholders and, and the city. And we realized that despite their knowledge about the need for them to communicate more because of how interdependent they are, they did not necessarily have the, the mandate within their institutions to do that. So there were several barriers that, that were discussed. Uh, what are your thoughts on how we could better uh, engage those um, uh, um, institutions and organizations that need to work better together so we're not only limit, limiting the discussion of interdisciplinarity to the research area but also at the stakeholder level and what role could the city have uh, in good, good question that? sure so uh, just to keep it brief the we try to have transparency through the whole process like probably too transparent at the end of the projects everything goes up on github and open source so anybody else can use what we're doing and be able to comment on it or improve it. At the beginning, what we do is we work with the city departments to find out what's important to them that they're struggling with, and we get them to sign up. And then they sign an agreement with our Data Science Federation that says you will not adopt what the students recommend, but like listen attentively and try to see where that connects into your programs to make a change. And then we um, work really at the very beginning to connect other departments into that. So we structure it um, on a very city-centric aspect at the beginning. And then to pull the universities in, we put all of our projects out to all of our universities at an open call. And so many universities might partner on a single project, and then we get some interesting interdisciplinary um, research. But I think getting transparent at the beginning that those departments are going to, that, that you're addressing something they want and that they sign up to make a change. Great. Right. Somebody there, sir? Oh, next. Hi. Uh, this is a question for the city's presentation. Uh, so we are sort of assuming that the growth of cities is inexorable, that it is un uh, unavoidable, that most people are going to continue to live in cities while at the same time we realize that cities are patently unsustainable from an ecological standpoint. So I'd like to recall a conversation with the chief resilience officer for Pittsburgh, Urban Grant Urban, who said that all his urban sustainability problems in Pittsburgh actually originate in the rural areas, whether it's transportation, whether it is water shortages, everything originates in the rural areas. So is, uh, are we imagining that cities can become sustainable without fixing the relationships between cities and their rural hinterlands and uh, and how would that be done how would we make cities sustainable while also making the hinterland sustainable sounds like a good question for bill yeah um that's yeah it's a fun fun question thank you um you know and of course we know that cities um you know through their historical development became um, open cities i mean the whole you know sort of uh, process of a further further extraction of a wood or water uh, et cetera, as part of a city's history, um, that involved bitter conflict um, and bitter contestation. Uh, I think in some ways the issue of uh, resolving of some of the questions of climate change and particularly those land-based solutions will kind of 
recall some of those tensions. So I, I, I very much agree with you. I think, you know, the, the issue of, of urban sustainability has to be embedded in this sort of um, rural um, urban connection. Um, there are some discussions about how to sort of approach that. Um, certainly in the context of the U.S., there's been a lot of legal agreements. I mean, the city of New York's water supply, and Mike is still here, Mike Gerard. But I mean, that's a fascinating history of, 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 uh, of resource extraction from a city, but also reconciliation over time. So I, those are uh, unanswered, but profound questions. Thank yeah. You. Uh, Thomas, did you? Yeah, Tom Gloria, Harvard University. This is uh, directed as Bill as well, and uh, it's just more of a shout out. The IPCC report, 1.5, your, your report. You know, it's making curriculum incredibly fun and engaging right now. Table 5.2, page 481. It is in <laughs> six-point type going through each one of the SDGs right. and the interrelationship of each one of them in actions. This is the kind of deep thinking that we need. And then you set a nice precedent in that report, and I just want to thank you for doing it. Nice. Yeah. I can't take too much for that, but other than that, that I was that was heavily debated and contested on how to make that. So, you know, the integration of the SDGs and the implications of those are extremely interesting to to be exploring. And university settings are a place where that can actually happen. And some cautionary tales here is that uh, you know the suggestions of policies to deal with a particular problem can and often does have unintended consequences, and being able to think well beyond the present and try to figure that out is really important. And so like this sort of big uh, whack-a-mole game here, you kind of deal with one thing, well, I'm sorry, well, there was a down, downside, a cascading event that you didn't think of beforehand. And I think uh, putting scholars on the task of trying to make sure that we do everything we can to avoid those downstream problems from upstream uh, uh, policy decisions, something it's a big challenge, and I think we're all up to it. Somebody else? Yes, sir. Neil Leary from Dickinson College. Uh, Bill earlier made reference to this idea of extension services of land-grant universities that has been focused in rural areas and thinking about whether we can apply that uh, model in, in urban settings. It seems to me that um, in the areas of health, nutrition, public health, a lot of our institutions are doing things that, that mimic extension services. Um, and maybe um, if some of the panelists could talk a bit about how that works and, and is this um, the way that participatory action research, service learning, community-based research, um, break out of the bounds of where it's in public health schools and sociology, can we apply this in ways that address more of the SDGs? Is this a model that we can use for our network to think about how we get involved with our communities? Who would like to respond to that? How about Shauna? Do you, do you, sure. Yeah. I can I can start. Um, yeah, I think that's a great idea. And I think definitely I know at Rutgers the extension agents are going beyond just agriculture. They're you know, they're providing um, nutrition education and that type of thing. But I think we can also learn um, from some of the experiences in the developing world. Like in New York, there's community health workers. We don't often think about that. We think about that as being very much in a developing world context. And they can actually be really nice in terms of what you're saying with the participatory kind of action and coming from the community and, and going up rather than being so top, top down. So I think there's a lot of opportunities. And I think once we start, um, you know, speaking together, because I think at least my experience at Rutgers, which is a mammoth university, I have no idea what's going on. Um, and then I learn about things and I'm like, wow, that's really cool. And that's like fits within the, the type of work I do, but I'm just not aware of it. So I think, you know, we have to communicate better um, amongst ourselves um, to see what's going on and see how we might leverage those different, um, different activities that are already ongoing. Good. Thanks. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Here. Oh, here it goes. Just identify yourself, please. Um, I'm Elsa Moreno from uh, Texas A&M University, the Borlaug Institute for International Agriculture and Development. And I just wanted to echo the words of Shauna just now um, and to underscore the fact that uh, extension services, extension systems at Lang Grant University are not only in the rural areas. Yeah. Okay? They are very much in the cities. We have a, a big project at Texas A&M. Uh, healthy South Texas, because the southern part of Texas, really by the border, is where you have a lot of issues with lack of 
adequate nutrition and diversity of the diet and, and many other things, chronic diseases, diabetes, et cetera. So I just wanted to make sure that there was no misunderstanding Good that point. we have to somehow recreate something that actually already exists and works very well in urban context. Thank you. One more question. Yes, sir. Uh, John Hardy, Millennium Institute, but this is, this is more of a personal comment and uh, directed your good self, uh, Professor Redlner. You, you correctly have the title up there, U.S. Health, i.e. not the same as the rest of the world's health. Why is that? Why is it we still, you will still be addressing a system that is so dramatically different from that in virtually any other developed country that it's astonishing you're the best you can do is tinker with it. It still won't get where everybody else already is. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, I'm going to ask Jeff to come. <laughs> you ready? No, no. I, well, I mean, look, the problems are, are widespread globally, uh, and we're we're trying to deal right now with the SDGs as they apply to the enormous challenges in America. I don't. I'm not suggesting tinkering in any way, shape, or form. I wish we had a very, very different kind of healthcare system because. We're not going to get to those places that I talked about of a truly comprehensive, high-quality, evidence-based system uh, in the absence of, of getting better at advocating for it. And so I, I don't, uh, not sure what you're saying, but I think we'll, we'll talk about that later. But I, and I would say one other point in my last few seconds here at the uh, podium, that we have to understand when we need to stop researching and start applying. This is a really important thing. I found a, a Carnegie uh, Institute report, I think it was 15 years old, about this happened to be about um, early childhood development. Every single principle and conclusion in that report was relevant today. They could have put 2018 uh, in that book and it would have been entirely relevant. Yet we keep researching, we keep doing model programs. And I think it's time for the universities to say, yeah, we get it, the research is the basis for what we want to do, but now we're into another agenda, and that agenda is making stuff happen. And not just in more development uh, of, uh, you know, the development projects, pilot programs, it's time that we got serious about the macro changes that are going to help us uh, save the planet. So with that, have a good lunch. Thank you. No, not yet. Oh my God, okay, yes sir. One more minute of unhappiness. <laughs> Oh, that, that was wonderful uh, presentations by everybody. And I, I was going to uh, say what Erwin said, so instead I'm going to just put an exclamation point in underlining. If you think about the challenges that we just heard, on health care, the United States is more than twice as expensive as any other country at this point. Uh, I think that's right, but basically that is true. We're at more than $9,000 per capita uh, for a system that is delivering less than many, many other high-income countries and with falling life expectancy, as I noted. So we have a health cost crisis and an access crisis and a design crisis that is extraordinary by some dimensions, uh, well, by the dimensions of the rich world, uh, unique, actually. If you look at the share of uh, national income going to health care, the U.S. stands alone. And then all the rest of the countries come at about 18 percent of GDP. Next is 12. And then a large block between 9 and 12 percent of GDP. That's an operational issue. And there is now a move to an all-payer system or a single-payer system uh, uh, and Medicare for all is on the political agenda. This is for us to take up as an extraordinary issue because it is maybe the number one political issue in the country, but for a reason. And the pictures that Irwin showed, but then the costs associated with that extraordinary, extraordinarily oddly stretched and in many ways ineffective or impossible to navigate system, make the situation in the United States extraordinary. That's one of the reasons why we're here. If you uh, think about nutrition, 
of course, in any country of the world, you could give a nutrition talk about uh, the importance of nutrition, but the United States has by far the highest obesity epidemic in the entire world. We have 70% overweight or obese and about 40% adult obesity. That's extraordinary. And part of that is because that picture of, uh, that Alejandro showed of Coca-Cola should say unhappiness coming out of the soda beverage because Coca-Cola is one of the champions, unfortunately, uh, of uh, the obesity epidemic because we know that soda beverages are among the most obesogenic uh, products that we have. We and, and Coca-Cola and others have to get serious about that. So it's not academic, if I may say to fellow academics, that we're just looking at the normal situation. We're looking at extremes. And while uh, the United States uh, emissions uh, is reduced of uh, CO2 emissions and we had uh, the president chortle about that uh, a few days ago because he doesn't understand the difference of change in levels. The United States is emitting 16 tons of CO2 per capita, about the highest in the world and for a large major economy, uh, absolutely devastating from the point of view of our role on climate change. This is not academic in the sense, in the pejorative sense of that word, it means an action agenda. But I would argue an action agenda is not a non-academic agenda. An action agenda requires every bit as much of technical excellence, scientific base, evidence base, uh, management and systems thinking, and an interdisciplinary frame for real implementation and application. For some of these issues, this can be done at the city level, for some at the state level, for some at the regional level, for some at the national level. But that's what we should be focusing on. These are not close calls of the U.S. in the pack. These are incredible, weird outcomes. We're the only major country with falling life expectancy. And when you think about opioids, obesity epidemic, depression epidemic. It's not surprising we have, and the inequality, it's not surprising we have falling life expectancy, but that's an extraordinary social crisis. And by the way, when we analyze our happiness or our SDG index against individual determinants, the uh, as our team has uh, shown us, uh, the single strongest correlation is with life expectancy. It's kind of an overall measure of are things working or are they falling apart? And to actually have a rich country, even in a business cycle peak with falling life expectancy is really odd. Peacetime, more or less, uh, high employment, and falling life expectancy. That's a social crisis. It reflects many phenomena, but it's why we should be energized to an action agenda, not a non-academic agenda, not a non-rigorous agenda, not a PR agenda, but an action agenda. I do believe our strongest point is not, we're not the best PR people. We're not the, uh, best packaging people, although Alejandro says we should package our work more happily. I'm sure that's true. But we are, I hope, systematic science, evidence-based, technology-based thinkers, and now with an opportunity to do this together at a, at a large scale. On the question of why the U.S., uh, two issues I'd like to, to raise. One, the obvious one, we are the U.S. chapter of SDSN. But at the same time, let me state something we haven't discussed, which is that the SDGs call for action within each country and for each country to contribute to solutions globally. We've not really talked about the U.S. role internationally. 
we used to have a positive agenda uh, about the US. We didn't call it America first. We didn't call it only us or whatever. We did for a while have a very, uh, we invented development assistance, uh, literally uh, as a uh, matter of uh, modern statecraft. We did uh, in this country a, a lot of important contributions. We still do, by the way, and uh, not on a partisan basis, by the way. The president that was absolutely the most dynamic in the modern period in development assistance was George W. Bush Jr., by far. Uh, he made the PEPFAR program, the president's malaria initiative, the founding member of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria. And I can tell you, because I've been involved in this, President Clinton and President Obama did basically treading water or even cutting while George Bush did a major expansion. So this is not partisan at all. But the U.S. has a role also globally. Almost, I'm sure all of you are working globally in that regard and in a very constructive way, one way or another. It should be part of our, our work as well. And we haven't discussed that so much, but I do think the time we just spent on these issues, think about it not as the normal background challenges. Think of it as crisis. There's a crisis. We may not, we're lucky probably, most of us, we're not feeling the crisis exactly in our daily lives, but we can tell in our country, this is a crisis. And therefore, I think we need to be engaged in the crisis solving. Uh, and I think that that was Irwin's message. The final point I want to make, we were going to <coughs> have the chance to uh, meet Jackie Corbelli, uh, who is a leading a business person in New York City, uh, a CEO of a major company here in IT and media, and uh, a very great friend of the Sustainable Development Goals. She's uh, not feeling well today, so unfortunately couldn't join the meeting. But she has stepped forward to say that she wants to help lead the outreach to the business community and to civil society in a number of ways, and to put together a citizens coalition for America's goals, uh, she wants to call it. and. I want you to be in touch with her. We don't have the chance to meet her today, but she sends her regards. Just woke up not feeling uh, well. Um, she's been a bit under the weather, but is very dynamic and very, very keen for us to have one part of this as real outreach to the business world, because this is uh, absolutely um, a, an all of society effort. We're holding the academic side, but we need to reach out, uh, of course, to, uh, as we've been discussing, the, the mayors, which we're very much engaged uh, with, uh, to the Governor's Association, to Washington, and we'll hear a couple of leading lights from Washington after lunch, uh, and to the business community. And so Jackie's going to really help us uh, do a great job on that, and uh, she sends her regards. Lunchtime. Thank you all very much.
Hello? Hi, Alex, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi, I'm really sorry for the background noise. Uh, this is Cheyenne Maddox. I'm here with, um, with Professor Jeffrey Sachs. Oh, no way. This is, this is Alex. What? Alexandria. This is Alex. She's on the phone. Oh, Alexandria? Hi, hey. How's it going? Good, good. Just got into uh, Boston and we're settling in, getting ready for our third leg of orientation to start. Oh, great. Were you with Bernie last night? Yeah, yeah, we were at the climate change town hall last night. Did that go well? Oh, it went really, really well. Fantastic. That, that's great. Let me tell you <clears throat> very quickly about the room here. Everyone's very excited to, to see you and uh, to hear from you. We put together about, uh, I think it's 60 or 70 universities from across the country. There are 39 states represented. Uh, we counted up, uh, add up uh, the enrollments across all the universities here. It's 1.7 million students. So it's a good, uh, good, good catchment. And the whole discussion is around the sustainable development goals and how to achieve them in the U.S. So how to move to sustainable development. We're not framing it, you know, in the internal discussion as Green New Deal, but you should uh, and can, and uh, it will all uh, be understood and resonate that way. We've talked about, uh, you know, of course, the energy agenda, climate resilience, uh, healthcare access and costs, uh, nutrition crisis uh, in the U.S., uh, the city's agenda. Uh, with a lot of very uh, sophisticated people. And I'm trying to, uh, I, I want this to become a kind of virtual think tank for you and colleagues. So that okay. Tap this as, and I'm going to push them uh, just so you know by the end of the day, let's have by September, or if you tell me sooner, let's have a, a draft policy framework, say, for decarbonization. A lot of sophisticated engineers, and I want to combine both their knowledge and their legitimacy as representing universities across the country so that this is not one place, one school, one region making a claim, but actually emerging as a consensus of 50 state of uh, colleges and universities from 50 states. And I'll uh, work on that, you know, in, in the coming weeks and months. And I want you to kind of give them the charge that this would be really helpful in Washington, uh, that it's important that, that, that the universities in the U.S. step up to these very big challenges and use the best knowledge and thinking and coordinate together and that Congress is going to be working exactly on these issues in the coming months. And the more we can hear of solid ideas and so on, uh, this is going to be helpful uh, helpful to you. So uh, every, everyone's thrilled you're coming in. Uh, I should uh, let you know that um, Tulsi Gold, uh, Gabbard is in town. And, uh, oh, fabulous. She's, coming in. She's going to come in in the room uh, sometime between 2.15, 3.30. So she'll be physically uh, present. Um, you'll be speaking by Skype. We could have you both, uh, you know, saying hi to each other if the timing works out. Yeah, um, that'd be great. Yeah. But uh, she's she's obviously wonderful and a huge fan of yours. So it's a, it's it's a, as we all are. Uh, so it's a, a fantastic thing. So I I think it's a, a great uh, constituency and a wonderful group. And the the energy level is high and the the mood is very good and. Uh, you know, giving them a sense of uh, empowerment that uh, we we need to hear from you, uh, and we need to fill in uh, with the, uh, you know, the deep knowledge uh, what what a what a, a green new deal means, how it can be implemented, how we can get the country uh, turned in uh, in this uh, these uh, new directions is, will be the key, and you know, speak however uh, long you like, but five, 10 minutes uh, opening, maybe a question or two, um, and you know, we'll play it, uh, play it by ear, but as, as you'd like. Yeah, absolutely. No, that sounds perfect. And I can't thank you enough for 
bringing all these people together, that's really, you know, I think that's really how we're going to not just build uh, the political power for this, but really just get the most comprehensive policy possible. And yeah. I'm really looking forward to us, you know, us really kind of cracking this nut in in policy making. And I feel like we're very we're very much on track where sometimes uh, movements and activist groups feel disconnected from the academic consensus, from the legal uh, frameworks. And I'm really excited because I feel like all of these pieces are coming together before exactly. any laws are written. So that's yeah. going to be really exciting. And uh, with Shaikat, you know, he was uh, asking me, uh, oh, my God, you know, all these schools, what are we, what are we supposed to do? And I will help you coordinate that. That's my, my role on that, to make sure that we are kind of steering, coordinating, moving together uh, and so on. But that's that's really the goal of uh, uh, of the whole thing. And I do think we can, uh, you know, bring bring the pieces together. And what I'm hoping is as even more schools join. You know some of uh, some of, some of your new colleagues who are not uh, so enthusiastic on this agenda will find that their leading uh, colleges and universities, of which they are very proud, are telling them, uh, Congressman, this works. This is important. Uh, please get on the case. So I think it can actually work uh, in in an almost in a district by district way also. So that that's part of. Uh, mm -hmm. how we yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm excited. I'm excited. Wonderful. We'll see you in a little while. And uh, okay. have, have fun at Harvard. And uh, we'll see you on the screen in just a few minutes. <laughs> Will do. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Talk to you. Bye. -bye. Bye.
We'll be getting started in just a couple minutes. Glenn. Glenn Galloway. Hi. Is a is Glenn, is Glenn here? Caroline? Glenn Galloway? Hey, Glenn. Great. Wonderful. Uh, can, do we have uh, name cards? Up? And Tom. I just saw Tom. Oh, you're here. Good. Okay, perfect. Great. Great, thank you. So uh, we're going to turn to uh, a an absolute uh, core area for all of us, and that is teaching, uh, and hear about uh, ideas and thoughts and brainstorming on uh, teaching sustainable development. We'll start with uh, Tom Gloria at Harvard, and then uh, uh, Glenn Galloway, University of Florida. Oh, you're switching it. Okay, Tom is going to start, please. I said, that's what I said. I said starting with Tom. Exactly. And I'm Glenn. And no, I'm but who's starting? You're starting. Yes, I'm yes. starting. Oh, that's what, I that's what I said when I switched. Okay, good, good. You're right. Okay. Keystone Cops, we're starting with Glenn Galloway right here. And then we will go to Tom Gloria. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, so let's see how this thing. Okay. Uh, first of all, I want to thank um, Maria and, and, and Jeff for the invitation to come and share some experiences with you. Uh, I'm from the University of Florida, and I'm, I'm the director of the Master of Sustainable Development Practice Program. It's really part of a, a program that I'm going to be discussing this afternoon, which is the Master of Development Practice Program. And uh, I'll be providing you a little bit of background on this program so you understand what it is. And then I will... Uh, some of the important lessons and experiences that we've had over the last 10 years since the program was established. And recently we did a uh, study with uh, alumni of the program, so I'll provide you with some results of that uh, survey, or it wasn't actually a survey, it was actually a semi-structured interviews that were carried out by um, alumni of the program, and then I'll finish up with uh, some conclusions. So this gives you a, a, a map, a world map of where the MDP programs were located. This uh, program actually began here in uh, Columbia University. Uh, Earth Institute received funding from the MacArthur Foundation uh, back in 2007, and they uh, launched an international commission on uh, education for sustainable development to practice, and I sh I, it's very important to add that word practice, to identify gaps in the training of development uh, practitioners and, and recommend improvements for um, professionals that work in the development space. And the results of this commission was the creation of this Master of uh, Development Practice program. It began with some seed funding from the MacArthur Foundation, uh, something like 11 programs initially were funded and uh, around the world. Uh, the program was launched 10 years ago, like I said, in, um, in New Delhi. And since then, it has grown. Uh, it's between 36 and 38 uh, programs. Uh, we're here with uh, Lucia Rodriguez, who's the director of the Secretariat of the MDP program uh, here in uh, Columbia University. So I have to be quite honest with what I'm presenting here today also about this program. Uh, you know, you get a sense of in that map where the programs are located. Uh, you can see like in North America, we uh, have more programs than in most other regions of the world. Uh, here at Columbia, um, also Harvard, uh, Thomas is going to uh, present uh, after me. Uh, Lehigh is in the process of joining the program. Emory and the University of Florida, where I'm located, uh, University of Minnesota, Reggie's University in Denver, Colorado, University of Arizona, and Berkeley. And I, I don't know if George Scharfenberger is uh, patched in, but if he is, hello, George. So another uh, thing that came out of this uh, commission was the recommendation of establishing uh, a program with uh, a strong inter interdisciplinary focus. 
recognizing that a development practitioner really needs a strong, holistic, interdisciplinary understanding of. And that was one of the things that they found that was a gap in uh, academic programs and development. So it was structured around these four pillars, uh, social sciences, natural sciences, health sciences, and management. And in each of the universities, they had core courses um, inside each of those pillars. Also, these pillars, they recognize there's a lot of interconnections and, uh, and um, interactions among, among these different pillars. The one thing that all the universities in the uh, MDP Global Consortium have in common is they have, a, of course, a very strong interest in development and also in sustainability. But the emphasis of the individual programs varies considerably. As you could imagine, you saw the, the map uh, in the previous slide. In some areas, uh, the, like the University of Botswana, for example, would have very different capacities than Columbia University or Harvard. So the way the program is actually implemented in different universities around the world actually has to be uh, quite distinct. Uh, I should also mention here that one thing that has been common across all of the programs is uh, what we what we call the global classroom. Uh, initially, it was uh, run out of here, out of Columbia University. Um, in the last number of years, it's been using uh, Jeff's book on the age of sustainable development. But it's a it's a foundational course because, as you'll see a little later on, the students that come into the MDP program have very diverse um, disciplinary backgrounds. So it's important to have a foundational course um, that's basically structured around in this case, the SDGs, so that everybody has kind of a common foundation of understanding sustainable development. Another thing that we realized early on in uh, implementing this program was the importance of um, having a balance among these interrelated student learning outcomes related to, to knowledge, uh, skills, and professional behavior. Of course, you're going to have very knowledgeable people, but if they lack the skills, they're not going to be very effective development practitioners. You could have very, people that are very knowledgeable and skillful, but if they have inappropriate professional behavior in intercultural tech context, they're not going to be very effective development practitioners either. So it's, it's, in, it's very important that students understand the distinction between knowledge and skills. Knowledge you can acquire rather quickly uh, through reading and study and so forth, but skills really require practice to, to uh, hone and to, to master. So you have to create within these programs uh, a lot of opportunities for, for practice. And you can see the, it's everything from communication, writing, oral communication, to using participatory methods, uh, having analytical skills and so forth uh, is what um, we cover in the program. Another important piece of the, of the MDP program is what we call the field practicum. And this is uh, generally between the first and second year of the master's program, which is like a 10 to 12 week period where students go off to different parts of the world. It, it could be right here in the United States. There's no problem with that. But in our case, uh, in the University of Florida, almost all of our students have gone to Latin America, Africa, and also in some cases in Asia. Uh, what it, the field practicum, um, the students have to contact a host organization and they have to define with a host organization a topic of mutual interest and, and define deliverables that the student needs to uh, uh, deliver at the end of the field practicum. And the types of host organizations are very broadly, everything from NGOs to public sector entities, uh, international organizations, private sector educational organizations, community-based, et cetera. And this is just uh, five minutes left is all I have. Okay, so I got to get moving. And there, you, this is just from the University of Florida, which is not one of the larger programs in the, in the network uh, where our field practicums have been carried out. But I'll just move along. So I want to get into some of these important lessons. First of all, like the SDG agenda, as I already mentioned, the, uh, the interests of students are quite broad. And this implies the importance of having personalized learning uh, because you want to be able to provide different options for students that have different disciplinary interests. So this implies the need for strong cross-departmental uh, collaboration, which in conversations I've had with some of you, I know this is a challenge because of 
institutional and financial arrangements within the universities. And it's important to have that collaboration because you want to offer a range of alternative uh, elective courses for the students. And also, in, in, in our model, uh, the faculty members serve on uh, student committees. Another important lesson is that um, from alumni and also from the employers of our alumni that it is very important what we've heard earlier this morning that students have this very broad cross-disciplinary and cross-sector uh, analysis uh, understanding of su sustainable development challenges and uh, for this reason although they have specific disciplinary interests they also appreciate the cohort model in which they get to work with uh, students with other disciplinary interests because in this way they're exposed to uh, an array of different uh, disciplinary uh, uh, interest. And I reached out to the directors of the MDP programs when uh, uh, I was invited to give this talk. And I said, what one thing would you recommend for this audience? And they said to stress the importance of integration inherent in sustainable development. And there's different types of integration across sectors, disciplines, and stakeholders. Uh, linkages, uh, we've already heard a few people mention synergies and trade-offs implicit in the SDG agenda. And then also looking across time because you have long, short-term, and medium-term uh, perspectives and needs related to sustainable development. Another important lesson is this importance of being able to reconcile this broad understanding and complex nature of sustainable development, which can be quite daunting and overwhelming, actually, for students once they begin to grasp what they're getting involved in, with a rather narrow space that one actually works in. So it's important that students understand that even if they're working on developing a curriculum or doing some sort of developing a monitoring and evaluation plan for sustainable development initiatives, that's fine. That's an important contribution. You're not going to solve everything in sustainable development in a two-year program. So I have two more minutes. Okay. Another thing that we have found is that in the MDP program, we have students coming in with very diverse perspectives of uh, sustainable sustainability. And you see different examples there, everything from degrowth to corporate driven development and so forth. For a program like the MDP, or if you want to have a program of sustainable development, it's important to place the program right in the center of those. You have to open up spaces to accommodate and critically discuss these different views on sustainability, sustainability in a program like the MDP. The, uh, the field practicum, which I mentioned before, really is the capstone uh, experience. It forces the students to, to gain a lot of knowledge about context and uh, about the conceptual underpinnings of their work. It provides them with an opportunity to actually practice, to gain skills, um, you know, like, we, like participatory methods and so forth, in a real world uh, context. And also is, gives them a, a wonderful opportunity to actually put their professional uh, behavior to test. And, complex uh, context, you know, often intercultural context. So I think I'll just pass over that. And finally, uh, uh, another important lesson, and this, I think it, you all would agree with this, that the students that come into a program like the MDP are often very passionate, driven individuals, and they're anxious to get involved in something. So it's advisable early on to identify opportunities for them within the local community to get involved. And there's just a list of uh, what our students have done uh, within Gainesville. Uh, some of these have been driven by the students themselves, developing these different types of working groups and so forth. I, I won't read through that list. With regard to the feedback from, uh, from our students from this recent alumni survey, you can see the type of knowledge areas that they have indicated are important to their employers and they think are trending over time into the future. And the things that we have talked about this morning uh, have the ability for abstract cross-disciplinary and cross-sectoral thought. Something that we didn't have in the original um, uh, report to the, the commission uh, that was financed by the uh, MacArthur Foundation is this idea of systems thinking, but it bubbled up quite high in this study with the, uh, with the MDP alumni. And the other topics there are also quite important. And of course, they're all included uh, in the SDG agenda. The last, and the last is really uh, talking about entrepreneurship. That's the role of the corporate sector, but also the corporate sector or, or the private sector that's quite small, entrepreneurs. 
With regard to skills, the one that was most mentioned was this uh, development of uh, analytical skills, because there's a lot of interest in, in uh, supporting or contributing to monitoring and evaluation efforts of uh, sustainable development initiatives. Uh, we've talked about the importance of data this morning. And then these other skills of cultural sensitivity and communication, critical thinking, project management, and networking. And I just want to show one more slide here. We complemented the, uh, the study with alumni with uh, a couple results from meta-analysis, comparative analysis on the same topics. And you'll see the list of things that 28 NGO managers with more than 10 years experience indicated as important for their employees or development practitioners. And also for 2,500 development professionals, uh, a DEVEX study that was carried out. And you can see that there's a lot of uh, agreement among these different studies about the types of knowledge, skills, and professional behavior that are important for development practitioners. So if you are getting involved in a program of sustainable development, I think this, this so, so type of information is very important to think about you know, creating opportunities for practice, uh, also emphasizing the importance of professional behavior, and also, um, of course, creating a hunger for knowledge. So I think I have to leave it there. I had a couple more quick slides, but I'll leave it there, and I'll turn it over to uh, Thomas. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. So a um, couple of big takeaways on, on what I'm about to present. And uh, first of all, it's a, a discussion on a journey to create an MDP program in the last couple of years at Harvard University, that small New England college up in the Boston area. And so I'm the director of the program, the Master's in Development Practice program, as well as the sustainability program there. And so, uh, of course, as, um, as Glenn mentioned, that the the uh, Global Association represents several different partners. Um, they engage at several different levels, not only in terms of the direct curriculum development, but also at uh, levels at the associate level as well. So there's a variety of different factors and uh, that you can engage with or levels you can engage with. And us being the more recent one, we're up to, as my understanding is, 38 at this point. Um, so it's a, a growing uh, organization. And what's the most important about this, it led us to um, a, a point of, um, of direction. So we knew where we were headed because of the work that the Global Association has been doing over the last 10 years. And I put that out as a model of what this chapter could do at the national level. We could think of other models like MDP that would help us, whether that be more technical, whether they might be related to policy or law or whatever discipline it may be, we think about how we can develop these models to accelerate uh, the development of programs. And so the Extension School now, the Extension School is going to be a little bit out of the box for many of you in terms of model, but I know that many of the universities do have Extension Schools. And I kind of like to say that it's, it's Extension School has really become the Nexus School and why that's so important. So the Extension School is 110 years old, and it's part of Harvard University that had this tradition of the, the Harvard Yard bars un, uh, opened up and allowing us to have education that was accessible to the community locally, affordably, and also lifelong learning. So those three major things are the tradition of the Extension School, which to me resonates a lot with where we're headed in the sustainable development area. And so we offer a master's in development practice is part of our program. Now, how do I do that from a curriculum standpoint? Well, we're Harvard University and we have the structure, some of what Glenn had said in terms of boundaries of paying your instructors, Boundaries of how do you get each one of the courses that are accessible to your students in an open enrollment environment. And so we draw from the Graduate School of Design, the Harvard Medical School, the Divinity School, the School of Public Health, and the porosity of that structure allows me to create this multidisciplinary environment. And I, and I know that that's something that is an incredible luxury to have. Also, it comes with administrative um, burdens, too. I have in my program, 150 faculty. And each year I have to up their contracts. We have over um, 980 faculty members as part of the Extension School. And so we administer one year contracts with each and every individual every single year. And so with that, we can also have our Harvard University ladder and tenure faculty, but also those who are outside our university as well, and even um, practitioners who are developing innovative areas of, of interest by our students. 
So what does our student body look like? Well, in this case, in the development area, we're seeing folks retooling. So our average age is about 37. And they're coming from areas around the world, um, and many of them uh, are outside of uh, the United States. 80% of my students are outside of Massachusetts. We are a distance learning organization. So that's the other piece of what we're doing to break the model. As a distance learning organization, we have a, a larger reach for those interested in sustainability. Now, the other thing that's uh, a, a real issue with uh, many of those pr pursuing a degree is how do they quit their job and afford education? And so part-time education is another area that we break the model as well. Uh, folks are not able to leave work and quit their jobs, you know, take care of family, et cetera. They need to do this part-time. And so we're flexible in that as aspect as well. So flexibility is a big piece of the success of what we're doing at this point and encourage uh, you as well. Um, because it, in many cases, our students are only taking one course a semester. It takes them anywhere between three to five years uh, to get their degree. Uh, many of them are retooling. Some of them are career changing. And that leads to a huge, if you will, diversity, diversity of the types of students that we have. We have students that go on to work for Greenpeace, and we have students that go on to work for Goldman Sachs. It is an enormous diversity in terms of what we're serving and who and what they're going on uh, moving forward. So with that very diverse uh, student body, um, flexibility, as I mentioned, is a, is, a, is a main factor here. And so breaking the model, and many of you um, probably have distance learning uh, initiatives going on at your universities. We're going, uh, we're just doubling down on this. We have about 17,000 students right now who are part of our extension school. And we look at three different modalities, those being on campus, those that are taking courses online and asynchronously, so they take them at the time that they need to uh, participate in classroom environments. And then also we have hybrid courses, courses that are held at, at the Harvard University campus and around the world as well. So we just continue to break this model of where is the campus, where is the access to students, uh, and both vice versa, access to faculty. Um, so a little bit about the MDB a curriculum, and I will make my slides available to anyone who, who would like them. So I'm going to go through some details here. Um, we have this mission around solutions. That's what we're doing. We're scaling up, uh, as, uh, as Jess was mentioning, it's all about action, and that's what we're about as well. And so our existing sustainability program that has about 310 students right now, that is our mission that has now blended into the MDP program. And as Glenn had mentioned, Essentially, the MDP program is putting a couple of guardrails on what we've already done in sustainability. There's the management, excuse me, there's the natural sciences and the social sciences, that is economics and policy and, and the built environment. And so we've added then management sciences on top of human health and well being. So that aspect of who we're delivering then is, in terms of education, needs to cover these four areas and allow for a lot of flexibility. So the global classroom, as Glenn mentioned, as well as fields of study, these are, if you will, the bookends of part of our, our program. Um, there's the guided uh, curriculum. I'm not gonna go that, over that in detail. Again, essentially that it's a la carte and once, once we get them in because there's such a diversity of the students. And that's what we're able to do because we're pulling across the entire university and elsewhere. Um, we also get into um, this aspect of uh, the field study work, and it's all about action, and that means that the students are working on a sustainability development action plan as part of the end goal. This is what they're doing. They're working with a client or a sponsor, if you will, in determining what it is they need to do. So they get the skill sets, the knowledge, and then, the, if you will, exercising the muscles of action. And then all our courses, and this is part of the uh, the program at the MDP is radically open in the sense that you can go on our website, you can see all of the courses, you can see all of the syllabi of all of the courses that are being taught and get a good sense of the type of curriculum that's out there. And then one other aspect that's kind of broken the model for us is we've recently partnered with MIT just down the road from us. They have something called a MicroMasters. If you haven't heard about MicroMasters, it's basically, uh, if you will, the stepping stone of getting into a program. For them, um, it's, a, it's a part of their admissions process. For us, we basically credit four courses towards our degree program. 
It allows for flexibility. It allows for greatly reducing the cost. MicroMasters are in the order of $1,000 to $5,000 to get and receive that, and it greatly reduces our cost to the student somewhere in the order of $10,000. Um, overall, a degree for our program is about thirty k. So we're actually reducing the cost of our program about a third. And these are available to any university. This is a pathway that you can sign up with them. And this is through the, um, the Poverty Action Lab at MIT, which is greatly aligned in the development practice in and of itself. So highly encourage those who are interested in, again, trying to get curriculum uh, up to speed in your programs, as well as, again, bending the cost curve. Um, so I'd like to finish up on who are these students and what do they look like? Well, for me, we just started our program a couple of months ago. And so we're open enrollment. So we're just getting a couple of students get and meet the requirements of enrolling. Um, Claire is uh, local to us. She's uh, working at the Harvard Business School. Um, she's on the avenue of um, the cheapest route for master's program. It's $40 a course if you're an employee of Harvard University. So think about that. Think about others, other people in your institution and the, and the tuition um, breaks that you get. This is a huge pool of people who are highly engaged and to ramp up the courses in enrollment to justify them. So it, uh, this is something that's really a nice strategy for us. Um, Nagwa Awad, she's based here in the New York, New Jersey area. So she has access. She's a working mom. She's in the um, IT sector and healthcare, and she's retooling, mid-career person. And the last one, Hadiza Hamas, she's, she's in Nigeria waking up at three in the morning to take our courses at four in the morning. And she's incredibly motivated. And what's so wonderful about the story of Hadiza, she's that next person who's going to start a program at the University of Abuja in MDP. So this is part of our role here at the US chapter is educating the next educators across the world. So a very important role. I had tons of messages throughout my entire very short um, presentation, but we'll, uh, we'll open it up for discussion now. Thanks. Good afternoon, uh, marvelous presentation. I'm John Dilliard from St. Francis College in Brooklyn, New York, and we are 2,600 undergraduates trying to diversify our revenue streams through graduate programs. And some of the stuff that, that you're doing, Thomas, seems to blend really well with things we're already sort of starting in process. Uh, there's a master's in healthcare management that includes a management portion of that. The issue we face is making sure we have enough instructors. So as a suggestion or a thought about maybe sort of another way to change the model, is there any possibility of doing something like instructor sharing among the US chapter so that we would open up our students to having instructors elsewhere, both to complement what we're trying to do and then just build the MDP? Yeah, it's a, it, it is an issue, and you know, again, as I indicated, the, the extension school because of the porosity of the instructors. In other words, I can I can pull faculty from anywhere essentially, anywhere around the world. Some of them are online, uh, and so I'm able to do that. Um, in terms of sharing, you know, that I'll say the word you know, multiple times, but the crustiness of our organization is that, you know, that that uh, the sharing goes one direction. You know, very similarly with MIT. So if you wanted to have students take our courses, which are online, as as an example, mm -hmm. they're more than welcome to do so and then be recognized by your registrar. Mm -hmm. We actually had students in Columbia University take our courses and, and had them uh, acknowledged as credit in their programs. So there, there there's that capability, the unlocking of education in an online format, essentially making it geographically agnostic, mm -hmm. um, helps that that process. Mm -hmm. We've apparently answered all the questions, Glenn. Thank you. It was great to learn uh, about the MDP program. When I first heard about it uh, a number of years ago, I thought it, it sounded to me like something that was feeling, filling a very strong need in the development uh, education we field. Um, I'm more of a comment than a question, and that is um, 
while thinking about master's level education is critically important to the SDGs, uh, many of our institutions are, are uh, very much engaged in what might be phrased sustainability across the curriculum, uh, undergraduate education, making it part of every student's education. Um, so that like we now at Dickinson College have a requirement that every student has to have a sustainability related course. And that can include things like a course on uh, arts and uh, civic engagement, um, where sustainability is woven in, in some light ways. And so I just want us to not lose track of that, that there are groups that work on this. There's something called the sustainability Sustainability Curriculum uh, Consortium, that's a group that we want to interact with. Uh, AISHI uh, does some things. So there's uh, uh, workshops that have been done by uh, um, Peggy Barlett at Emory University, and Jeff Chase, who I think is at San Diego State now. I think he's moved a couple of times. Um, they've trained about 600 faculty from a bunch of schools in how you integrate sustainability across the undergraduate curriculum. Um, and those that's his spawned. There's probably three dozen or more schools that now run these programs on their own campuses. So at Dickinson, we run workshops for faculty development to train faculty from arts and humanities, social sciences, physical sciences to integrate sustainability in the past. Just this past year, we've pivoted and focused on sustainable development as being part of that, um, uh, of what we're embracing. But there's a lot of work going on out there, and I'm hoping that we're going to see how we can participate and engage uh, that work in, in the SDSM. I, w I would second the, particularly the organizations, the AC and the, and the Sustainability Curriculum Consortium, the SEC. They're two great organizations to uh, to engage with. Yeah, we have a question over here. There's a question in the back on the on the left. Emphasis on systems thinking and also on on uh, field experience and practicums. But if you're running a, building a network, uh, two things seem to be important. One is quality control with something like a practicum. So, are you actually running practicums for the student in Nigeria at a local place, or how how would that work, or is that not happening with distance education. Right. Uh, okay. So a little bit more on the details. Um, so we have residency requirement of uh, a semester at, at, through our extension program. So that particular su student, Hama, uh, Hama, Hadiza Hama, excuse me, will be coming to, to uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts for the summer. We'll go over uh, who her client is and what she's going to be working on. But we are leveraging essentially a global practice at, at the local level. And so that's that's part of what what we're trying to do, and that's so that's part of our, if you will, our quality assurance of, of what's going on, and it certainly is as we're rolling out this program, it's certainly a, in front and center for us, who that client or if you will, sponsor is going to be, and how they engage with them is is very important, and that is part of the aspects that's going to be challenging to to scale, um, to to take your question and, and expound on it a little bit. You know, I, I visualize this as a, as a pyramid in terms of education, like mentioning the MicroMasters education at MIT is kind of the base of the pyramid, microeconomics, some data analytics, introductory levels of foundation, and then we move up in that pyramid to the next level of courses that are online but higher touch, and then we get to the top of that pyramid, and that's the field study work. And that, that is a, a substantial amount of, um, uh, uh, if you will, administrative support for that student, making sure that the programs that they're interacting with are of the quality that we, we that we want. And so, again, trying to bend that cost curve is like build out the base of pyramid as, as much as we can. And maybe Glenn can offer some more in his experiences in terms of the, the field study work. Yeah, in, in our case in uh, University of Florida, like I, I mentioned, our students actually have a committee. So, uh, it's amazing how diverse, like we've had students that have done joint law MDP degrees, uh, working on issues like human trafficking, uh, analysis of legal frameworks. For example, the forestry uh, legal framework was changed recently in Mexico. Uh, we've had business MDP working with entrepreneurs, for example, in South Africa, uh, with uh, corporate social responsibility, like in the tourism industry. But the thing is, they always have linkages to departments within UF, so they have on their committee uh, specialists in those areas. 
So they have to develop, just like in a, a scientific master's program, they have to develop a proposal. Then they carry out the field practicum. A lot of times they, they develop, in addition to the deliverables, they always have to develop like a, a final report where they get the, the opportunity to actually practice writing uh, an extensive document. So yeah, in, that, in our case, it's, it's very structured, uh, the way we carry out the field practicum, and it has a pretty high standard of, uh, of quality. And if I can just follow up with a comment, I, I think uh, if this network develops, alumni could be a very important resource yeah. because you'd have them all over the world and they'd be thinking, have the same systemic thinking and, and problem solving skills. But also yes, yeah. for universities, like I'm from the University of Alaska, we have opportunities in our state, which is like a developing country in a lot of ways, uh, that cannot be fulfilled by our students because we don't have enough. Mm -hmm. So I think there's an opportunity for sharing such opportunities as well. Just a really quick comment. It's, it, that's a really good uh, observation about the alumni. We, in some of our classes, the alumni now patch in from their professional positions to share their experiences and development with our students. So over time, and, and the, the network originally, I, I don't think it was envisioned how many students would actually graduate from the MDP when the MacArthur Foundation uh, initially uh, funded the program. But there are, I think, around 3,000 graduates around the world now, so it's it's an extensive uh, uh, resource uh, to draw on. Yeah. yeah, and absolutely second that. It's gotten to the point with my sustainability program that we're graduating about 100 students a year now. And so that's an incredible resource in terms of new projects for students to work on, TA uh, assistance for the instructors, being instructors. It's an incredibly engaged network of people that, that we tap. Can I just ask about your um, staff discount model, Thomas, and um, the amount it costs um, for a, st a Harvard staff member to take the whole master's degree, and uh, any further comments you've got on the, how that um, aspect of the program, what percentage might be drawn from staff, and how does that influence um, the quality of the program? and What's it contribute? Yeah, yeah, sure. So the tuition assistance program, the TAP program, has been around for uh, more, I think more than two decades now. It, it is, I, I just to be uh, very honest about it, it's not taken advantage of very highly. It's forty dollars a course. One could get a graduate degree at Harvard University if you're an employee for about six hundred dollars. That's that's the cost of it, and and. I understand we have something like 43 openings in our own our own division of continuing education. So it's a, it's an, in, an enormous, if you will, uh, benefit to our students. The U.S. National Science Foundation, and I just wanted to let you guys know that we also have a program that is designed exactly for this kind of approach. So you can get a if you have an active NSF grant and you want to have your graduate student engage in a non-research experience with an NGO or you know whatever policy, whatever, we have, you can get up to six extra months of um, support for those students to engage in this. So keep that in mind as you're putting you know, your master's groups together. Um, again, it's, it's very similar. Uh, you have to have a, uh, a coordinating entity so an, uh, a group that where the student is going to actually go and work, but we will actually help support that as well. Any questions? I mean, just, okay. just as a comment, you know, my own observation is, uh, you know, educating professionals are going to enter either the sustainability or sustainable development field. You know, by and large, the, the, what the earning power is going to be is, is probably either going to be the same level of where they are uh, prior to the entering the program and maybe even less as they exit the program. And, um, and so cost for many of the students is incredibly important. It's incredibly important. I'll just, you know, that is what we're faced with in this, in this field. And so as we as educators and whatever we can do with our institutions to whether it be scholarships, um, you know, tuition, uh, reimbursement, et cetera. This is incredibly important for us to accelerate what we're trying to do. Yeah, I'll send it back. 
Thank you for your incredible presentations and being um, an alum of Harvard myself. I have a few questions for you. I just wondered if either of you envisage anything in particular going forward, like a five-year plan or a 10-year plan, how you imagine that your programs in sustainable development could um, be expanded or change in what directions? What else would you bring on board? Thank you. Yeah, so go ahead. Okay. It's interesting that right now, I mentioned this uh, study that we carried out um, with the alumni uh, into the program, that one of the ideas was to see, well, what kind of changes might be recommended you know, in the, in the curriculum and the way the program's conducted. And that's actually funded with a grant that the Columbia University received from the Chia Foundation. And what they're doing is they're returning to the original report of the Commission on uh, you know, Sustainable uh, Development Practice to see how the program might evolve in the coming years. The other thing that surprised us about the program is that a fair percentage of our graduates end up going into doctoral programs. We didn't really expect that. So at some point, I think we might have to think about having an option also uh, for, for, for doctoral students because uh, a lot of the research activities they get involved in, in you know, around the world require more than 10 to 12 weeks of, of research. So it would be interesting to have at least that option for, because the faculty are, are they're interested. You know, there's buy-in there. They're interested in working with the students. And sometimes it would be, uh, you know, interesting to have them for, for a longer period of time working on really interesting issues. Yeah. Thank you for that moment of being able to think about this incredible question. Um, so a couple of things on it. Uh, Rob Liu, who um, used to be our dean of our summer school, which is part of the division in continuing education, uh, has recently started something called LabX. And what Rob is trying to do is uh, essentially accelerate the accessibility of very relevant case study work that would be accessible not only to those at Harvard University, but more in like a, uh, he was part of uh, running our HarvardX, which is part of edX, um, basically breaking the barriers of accessibility of, of education. And so I, I, I reflect on his vision, and that is in this era of urgency that, that Jeff reminds us of, um, the acceleration of what works is, is going to be key. And so within the next couple of years, I think that we can use uh, the various you know, networking technologies, et cetera, communities that brings awareness around what is relevant, what is uh, uh, successful, um, is incredibly important because we're past the days of just getting the funding, just finding the people. We've got to figure out exactly what are the strategies that truly work. And, and on as again, was Jeff uh, hammers us with an evidence-based uh, process. And so seeing the evidence is, is going to be incredibly important. Accessibility to that evidence, I think, is really the next next phase we're going to be getting into. Um, my name is Shannon Coburn. I'm an education manager at the SDG Academy. And uh, I just wanted to make everyone in the room aware of our resources. So SDG Academy is an online education initiative actually from, uh, from the SDSN. And we create online um, sort of graduate level, upper upper level courses on all of these topics, sustainability topics. Um, so if anyone is interested in learning more, uh, can... Yeah. Maybe you want to describe what it is. Yeah, absolutely. So, so they are um, online courses, like I said, MOOCs, massive open online courses through edX. We're now on edX as well. Um, so different, they pull together from the network that SDSN has created and experts across the field and across the world to bring together I think right now we've reached over 200,000 uh, learners around the world that work in in policy, civil society, academia, and just open to anyone um, with a mind to learn more about these topics, natural resource governance, micro, uh, macroeconomics, uh, early childhood development. I don't know if, Jeff, you want to say anything? Uh, so uh, let me add, uh, thanks for bringing it up, because it's uh, something also for us to contemplate. Uh, we have... The idea is a full curriculum for free online, not uh, an accredited program, uh, because that requires a university base, of course. But this is a full sustainable development curriculum at the MOOC 
level, what MOOCs can do. They can do certain things. They can't do other things. Let's be clear about that. But by full curriculum, I mean that it's about 25 courses now on many different dimensions of our issues from health, education, gender, poverty reduction, hunger, agriculture, land use, energy transformation, and so on. And it is an edX offering, and it's seen by tens of thousands of people around the world at, at any time. There's lots of participation, but we would like more participation and also more engagement and added modules and uh, different ways to do this as well. Somehow, we should also offer uh, an SDSN USA uh, series of lectures or something by webinar so that we have throughout the year uh, lectures that uh, were are being given by leaders uh, of our whole network and then students are assigned or are welcome or the public is welcome to uh, join or the uh, and everything in our uh, in the SDG uh, SDSN global world, all the offerings are, are for free. So we're trying to make this a very broad-based uh, mass accessibility feature. Uh, the materials are also being used for UN training now. So uh, there's a new cadre of uh, resident coordinators uh, that is being brought on specifically to lead the SDG era and a lot of these online courses uh, are being used for that so i just want to invite people to have a look sdg academy easy to find uh, but also to engage make suggestions missing curricula we produce a lot of courses but if you want to produce some MOOCs this is a, an opportunity to coordinate on that as well and i would like to have a large uh, basically uh, encyclopedic coverage of these issues built uh, and, why, and worldwide with worldwide accessibility. There's a lot of effort, uh, incidentally, to localize the courses to specific issues in different parts of the world. And so a lot of curriculum building uh, so that one sees all of this from the vantage point of different uh, different regions, but that can be different regions also within the United States. Or uh, a this curriculum as we have it right now is not especially a U.S. curriculum. So we could even imagine a group course on SDGs in the United States. Such a course does not exist, but that might be quite a nice thing for us to group, uh, manage, and develop. Because if you think about it, uh, all our students should take such a course specifically, what does this mean for the U.S., all the things we're talking about? There's no place they, they can find that specifically right now. So I like my idea. Uh, and uh, I rather like the idea that we do it together. Uh, so count that as a proposal, not just a, a balloon over my head. Uh, why don't we do a course on... SDGs in the United States. I don't know how we're going to do it, but if you're interested, sign up. Sign up, by the way, for all of what we're talking about means send an email to Caroline or to Maria. Okay, that's what sign up practically means so that we're engaged uh, for the moment. One other question I want to ask all of you as a group. I want you to be able to contact each other. Your names are on the website as attendees of this meeting, but no contact information. So I don't quite mean this, but by a show of hands in principle, are you happy to have your email addresses next to your names? Is there anybody that does not want their <laughs> email address? And you can submit that in private, but there's too much concern actually about not enabling the contact information because I don't want everything to come to us. I want it to go between you. 
So uh, quite seriously, if there's anyone today that just says, don't put my name on this list, I don't even like it. Or for many reasons, I'm not even supposed to be here today. Uh, and my president thinks I'm somewhere else. Whatever it is, if you have that reason, let me know. Otherwise, oh, God, I don't know if this is possible or not, but I want to suggest that the default is your email is going to be next to your name because I want you to talk to each other. The idea is not a hub and spoke model. The idea is a full graph, okay, a complete graph where you're all nodes and you're all connected to all other nodes. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, we'll do it by tomorrow, not today, just so Truly, if someone doesn't want that contact, we will leave the name off. But otherwise, all your emails will go alongside your names. And today, you're just on a blog site announcing this, but we'll have an SDG, SDSN USA website within the next few days. And that will also be open for you to post stuff on this as well, so that it really is an open feature. Okay? Good. Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in on the SDG Academy stuff for a minute. I, uh, as sort of as a testimonial, I've taken several of the courses already. Um, I've integrated two of them in existing courses that I teach at St. Francis College, and I'm going to try to use it. Well, the St. Francis College has become part of the University Partnership Program, um, where we're going to try to integrate more of those courses throughout our curriculum. So not only are the courses just very good to take in, 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 in um, sort of enlarge your own educational experience, but they could be used as ways to try to integrate sustainability across the curriculum. So I really encourage you again to take a look at what's there and, and uh, um, um, enroll yourselves and, and think about how you can use them in your classes. Yes, I'm Mike Mann for the University of North Dakota. I think when you talked about your model in terms of how you, you know, do the, the master's and even PhD programs online, I think probably some of us from smaller universities might think that it's difficult to do at a smaller scale, but at North Dakota, I re reformatted our PhD in energy systems engineering, environmental engineering, to do almost exactly what, what you've done. We offered online. It's very flexible, recognizing the students that are interested in energy or, or in environmental engineering is very broad broad topic area. So this is why I think with the right kind of planning, right faculty buy-in and taking advantage of everybody across the whole university that I think is doable at almost any level. So. Yeah, it's a, you know, for, for us, um, uh, online education was an evolution. You know, it started off with, uh, I think in the 1960s, there were videotapes of our courses that were then handed to naval, naval officers and staff to go on submarines to take courses. And that was like our first entree into distance learning. And then since then, um, you know, kind of like the, uh, the Wall Street Journal in the sense of once you create stuff online, it's very challenging when you create it for free to roll that back. So as our courses became online, it was always seamless. It was like any of our other courses. Um, so for those of you, I would more than happy have a discussion with around, if you're thinking about distance learning, um, and uh, what we've had to do in terms of staff and the gross underestimation is the, if you will, the back office and what it takes to, to run a distance program. It's, in, it's incredibly challenging to maintain the qualities. We heard the question earlier, um, but to be able to, uh, again, make uh, your courses accessible. And uh, not, not only am I available, my, I know my staff who, who does the online production uh, they're more than happy to speak with folks about what they've done and what they, they, they do. To give you a sense of what we do on a weekly basis, uh, we run about um, 500 courses a uh, semester, 
and about 60, 70% of them are online. So we're producing um, 350 two-hour shows every week, every single week. And the students expect them to be up, recorded, ready to go within an hour or two. And that's the expectation, and that's what we deliver on. It's a, we're like a mini production house at this point. But that's what it looks like. You know, it's 350 two-hour shows, 14 weeks straight, don't miss a beat. Get everyone right. Or we'll hear it. We'll hear it from the students. Yeah. Good. I think I think we've answered all the questions. Thank you, everyone. All right, we're um, in the stretch run here and um, want to turn attention to a question that all of you must spend time thinking about. And frankly, uh, President Bollinger said this morning uh, how important it is for all of us to think about how the issues of sustainability play out in practice and on the ground. And one of the challenges in that regard is the politics of advancing sustainability. So we now have a panel. Um, one of three of whom are present with us in a moment. A second will arrive momentarily, and a third will be Skyping in uh, at the top of the hour. But I want to start with uh, Daniel Squadron. Uh, Daniel is a former New York State Senator. Um, or do we have getting a signal from the back? Uh, a false signal from the back. Um, <laughs> Test. We, uh, we will jump to the Congresswoman on, uh, on the screen at the moment. We'll get the signal that she's ready to go. So uh, we will have that interruption at some point in a, in a few moments. Uh, Daniel is a former New York State Senator, one of the youngest ever elected, um, and chose uh, a year and a bit ago to leave the State Senate after nearly a decade to launch uh, with others uh, a group called Future Now. Uh, and he's going to tell us a little bit about this. It is a group uh, focused at, in making change happen at the state level, as we've discussed over the course of the day, and really thinking about how to make sustainability uh, and sustainable development and all of the related elements that we've had under discussion here today a part of the political agenda at that more disaggregated level. Um, the focus really is on state legislatures, which is an underattended to part of the political conversation in many places across this country. But let me ask Daniel to tell us a little more, bit more about what he's doing. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for having me. I am uh, speaking uh, to this group, which is so focused on global issues, uh, so focused on research and knowledge and facts. Um, I, I'm really put in mind of the old Monty Python sketch, sketch or line now for something completely different. I'm here to talk about politics, which uh, some would argue, of course, I do not subscribe to this, is the opposite of the sort of rigorous fact-based analysis and uh, work that you all, uh, many of you do with your lives, and um, to talk about state government, the uh, smallest, uh, really powerful node of government, really um, structurally around the world, but certainly in this country. Uh, you know, I think people will often put cities, large cities like New York, certainly um, ahead of state governments and state legislatures when it comes to influence. But uh, of course, I'm here and uh, I wouldn't have um, had the very generous invitation from Professor Sachs and uh, others who organized this uh, if, if there wasn't a similarity in a relationship. And one thing that uh, I have found uh, in the political arena and uh, I have found as a real connection to the work of the Sustainable Development Goals is uh, that the ideas, uh, and more importantly, the idea of goals that are measurable is actually a really powerful one in the political sector. And even beyond that, in a country like ours that's riven by uh, what seems to be uh, reactionary or non-fact-based politics, the idea 
of returning to facts and to goals that are about broad human development are wildly popular. So with that, I'll pause. I hear that uh, Congressmember-elect Ocasio-Cortez is available, and um, we'll hear her perspective from the House, I guess. So um, welcome. <laughs> welcome, Representative-elect uh, Ocasio-Cortez, thank you very much for taking time out of what I know is a very busy scramble to get yourself ready to take office in just a few weeks uh, to be with us here uh, and to address the, the group that's gathered as part of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network uh, for the United States. Uh, Jeff Sachs asked me to, by way of introduction, uh, mention how proud he and so many others are in this room of what you're doing to bring new leadership to the Congress and uh, we're especially eager to hear about the Green New Deal, but please tell us whatever you think uh, the audience might wanna hear about how to bring sustainability into the political conversation and how to make it a, a foundation uh, in a much more fundamental way for the kind of politics that I know you're trying to advance in Washington and, and others care about in this group all across the country. Thank you. No, of course, thank you all so, so very much and thank you for, really having the the energy and the ability and the will to really organize and convene so many experts, academics, uh, activists and organizers in in really getting us to a collective vision for our future, especially when it comes to the climate, to our climate, and especially when it comes to what we're forming out here in, in, in what is taking shape as the Green New Deal. Um, I cannot I, I really cannot underscore enough the importance of movement-based legislation, which I think is what a Green New Deal is starting to shape up to be. And when we say movement-based legislation, what we mean is that very often when we create uh, legislation, some critical constituency or some critical expertise gets left out, whether it's policy making that happens without uh, information from frontline communities with the direct experiences, whether it's uh, without scientific consensus, as we're seeing with this administration, or whether it's without the navigation of the current political uh, you know, obstacles that we can have or the knowledge of those political obstacles. It's really when we come together as a movement that we can develop comprehensive legislation like a Green New Deal. Uh, as, as many may know, what we are currently pushing for, even though we are, I am not sworn in yet, um, is, a, is a select committee to be established to uh, create and really research and develop a Green New Deal by 2020 so that as we are doing the critical organizing of winning back the presidency, the Senate, and maintaining a House majority uh, in 2020, if we can accomplish that, then if our select committee gets established and we get the job done, we can have legislation ready to go on day one to save our planet. And that is the, the political strategy that we are going in with. But when it comes to the actual content of what a Green New Deal is all about, uh, what we need to do is get to 100% renewable and clean energy uh, within 10 years. The IPCC report says we have until 2030 for it to be done, not for it to be legislated, not for it to be an idea, not for it to be drafted. We have until 2030 to get the whole job done. And so many people would think of a deadline like that as just a reason for despair, a reason to throw up our hands and to say, well, it's not possible, we're all gonna die. <laughs> Which is pretty much what, uh, what, uh, how a lot of people have felt in this presidential administration. And what we're here to say is no, we refuse to accept that as an inevitability. We, we refuse to accept uh, the current political reality, which we know is not working for us and we know is not serving the majority of Americans. And we know that uh, we can get the job done ourselves. And so uh, a lot of this is comprehensive policy and there are really big, bold, ambitious ideas that are being discussed uh, in part of getting, getting this job done. You know, we are talking about the potential of implementing a federal jobs guarantee so that we can put 
all people to work at a living wage and have their health care covered uh, in the pursuit of switching to 100% renewable energy. There, there are ideas being discussed on how we can get pay equity uh, with child care covered, with environmental cleanup uh, being a, a a much more expanded industry for labor. Um, there's so many ideas at the table and how, and we really need to convene these ideas, distill them and figure out what is workable in order to get our goals. Uh, just yesterday, I was able to meet with, uh, with Senator, Senator uh, Ed Markey of Massachusetts, and he established the first select committee on climate 10 years ago. Uh, when when the House was lost, when we lost the House in 2010, one of the first things that John Boehner did was eliminate the select committee. And so uh, so but before before all of that happened, uh, Senator Markey, who was then in the House, established the first select committee on climate. And what they did was that they built a trove of knowledge. They built a lot of work and a lot of the work has already been done. Uh, in terms of the nuts and bolts. So we're not starting from scratch. What we're doing is that we're picking up on a lot of the work that's been accomplished and we're really taking it to a next level, making it much more aggressive. But one of the things that, uh, that Senator Markey told me yesterday was if we set the ambitious goalpost, it will be met. If we set it, if it's, uh, if it's realistic, if it's and when I say realistic, I don't mean a cynical watered down compromise. I mean, if it is possible within the scope of reality um, in terms of our capacity, our ability to innovate our technology, um, which is always so much bigger than we think it is. Uh, if we push ourselves and if we push ourselves uh, to really set goals that have not been set before, it will be met. And so we saw that. Uh, when, when, uh, when you know, over 10 years ago, we passed the first fuel economy bill in since the 1970s. Uh, for almost 30 or 40 years, we set uh, we set gas efficiency standards for cars to be 23, 27 miles an hour, and the 20 something miles an hour per uh, sorry <laughs> miles per gallon. Um, 20 odd something mile, uh, miles per gallon range. And it stayed that way for 30 or 40 years. There was little to no innovation done. And uh, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, when we decided to push that and we said, you know what, we need to increase these efficiency standards and we set the goalpost to be as ambitious as we could at the time, what happened, industry innovated and the goal was met. And we right now have no choice. We have no choice. If we're going to survive, if our children are going to survive, we have to get this done. It's simply the mandate of this moment. And I, I believe, and it's always been my belief, that when this country, when us as a nation have, have faced dire, dire threats, we've faced them many times before, we have always found the ability to to really rise to that challenge. We have innovated, we have, uh, we have come together, and we have really surpassed all political challenges in order to ensure our survival and also our thriving in, in the face of that challenge. So, um, so we're really excited. You know, This is going to be intersectional legislation. This is legislation that seeks to, yes, get us to 100% renewable energy, yes, protect our shores from rising sea, sea levels, but also to use that economic activity as an engine to introduce social and racial justice in the United States, because it is so often and too often that the frontline communities that experience the the worst impact of what is going on tend to be black, brown, indigenous, or poor. And so it is unsurprising that some of the worst disasters with the most unjust recoveries have been in places, uh, have been in the aftermath of storms like Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, or Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, or with the water in Flint, or, uh, you know, or throughout this country. And what we need to do is realize that when we legislate with the most vulnerable in mind, 
that is our best way at guaranteeing comprehensive policy. This is not about catering to a small sliver of the population. This is about addressing the needs of all of us and leaving no person in this nation behind. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, thoughts or questions or comments from the floor? Uh, you stunned everyone into silence, um, except for Jeff, who is never at a loss for words, and the microphone is coming to him. Alexandria, we're thrilled where you are, although we'd be uh, more thrilled if you were here today, but uh, you are with us, and uh, thank you for the message. And uh, thank you for uh, the boldness, of course, and the instruction to the group. Uh, we are going to be a, a, a national think tank of solutions, uh, and that's the purpose uh, of uh, this group, which will be put in motion for many years. Can you give us a sense of what you hope would be a timeline to uh, interact with the, the nation's uh, universities uh, if when, when the select committee gets established, uh, how we might think about our own timeline so that uh, we can calibrate on our end here? Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that question. Really, the answer is as soon as humanly possible. Um, and one of the things that I think is, is funny when people say, oh, it's totally impossible for us to get to 100% renewables in 10 years. Um, first of all, I, you know, we, people said it was impossible for us to, to go to the moon uh, within the span of one decade. And we, we did it. So I'm always, I, I'm always skeptical of people uh, telling me that certain things are impossible. You know, it's it, in the words of Mandela, it is always impossible until it is done. And our, the best thing we can try to do is to try to achieve the impossible. And the worst thing that can happen is that we get it, we still get it done faster than what the reasonable experts said it, it will take. Um, so, you know, my answer would be to start coalition building uh, as soon as possible. Um, and my my view on this is select committee or no select committee, we will be introducing Green New Deal legislation in two years, uh, whether it's whether it's through an informal coalition of progressive uh, members of Congress or whether it's through the actual coalition of a committee. Uh, this is going to get introduced no matter what. And we need to start building those coalitions as quickly as possible. Um, and I, you know, I, so I can say a year we should be uh, seriously start drafting. I can say by September, but really the answer is if, if we try to start, you know, on day one, uh, that, is, that is the pace that, uh, that the planet is really asking for us, very, us to do. And very clear. And uh, yeah. but by the way, one of the things when we discussed uh, energy transition this morning, uh, we heard from uh, a number of uh, wonderful uh, campuses about the dozens or hundreds of engineers that are on tap actually to uh, do a lot of the heavy lifting of the analytics and the modeling. Uh, we uh, look down uh, to uh, New York City modeling in great detail. You'll find it fascinating. Uh, every building in your district, uh, it's uh, we, uh, our colleague uh, Vijay Modi has uh, the energy use building by building for every building in the in uh, NY14 and every other oh, yes. district. Absolutely. <laughs> so we're going to get this done, but uh, I think the urgency and the timeliness for the group is very, very clear. So we have another question, yeah. President Cabrera. And while the microphone moves, I'll just jump in from the stage and ask you a question, because your your point about the goal in politics. Oh, I'm Daniel Squadron. I uh, was a state senator in New York for nine years uh, from the other two greatest counties, lower Manhattan and Brooklyn. So 
um, which were the two greatest in those days, but uh, and now run an organization focused on state legislatures called Future Now. Your point about politics, the goal being more possible than people realize is so well taken, but it's also so often true in politics that it's not the goal that's impossible, it's just every single step along the way that is. And so if you could speak just a little bit, because I think sometimes in this group, there's so many great ideas that are so obvious the moment we're faced with them, so compelling when we hear you talk about them, but still so difficult. How could it be that a select committee is even a challenge? I mean, it, you just made the case so brilliantly. Why would anyone, I think we had a democratic majority in the house now, why is that a challenge? Well, you know, it's uh, you'd be surprised. Uh, you'd be surprised that Congress is a profoundly human place, uh, as much as as much as media and talk about policy tries to make it seem as this very objective uh, place where everyone checks their egos at the door very diplomatically, and we always do the rational and correct thing. And it's, you know, we are in America and our democracy is a, is an experiment in, in flawed human beings engaging in uh, self-governance. And so I think that um, there are a lot of legitimate uh, concerns in that there are a lot of people who have done a very comprehensive work already and they don't want to see that work thrown away. So I think that uh, there are very legit. There's a lot. There was a lot of legitimate resistance from there. I think we've assuaged a lot of those concerns. But there's also concerns over jurisdiction and people saying, "Listen, I've worked 20 years to chair a committee, and now you're going to try to establish another committee that is going to take this slice of jurisdiction away." You know, I've dedicated my entire career to get seniority, which is an issue that Democrats have, by the way. Republican, the Republican Party has term limits for committee chairs. So their committee chairs rotate uh, very frequently and they don't have to wait 30 years to chair or their entire career to chair a committee. Um, but this is a this is part of the Democratic Party rules. And so uh, you have people that feel like they put their entire lives into something and they don't want to feel like that work was done for naught and that we're starting from scratch. And so one of the things that we're really working on and uh, assuaging is that this is not about starting from scratch. This is not about throwing everything away, but this is about raising the bar. And uh, and I will say that I think we are winning. I think we are gaining momentum. Just uh, just about an hour ago or 45 minutes ago, Need, uh, Representative Nidia Velasquez came out in favor of the Select Committee on a Green New Deal. She is the first incoming House committee chair to endorse the Select Committee, which is a big, big deal. So we are now at almost 20 Democrats who have come out in favor of it, and it just really speaks to the profound impact of out, inside out of an inside outside organizing strategy. You know, it's uh, there's so many folks that come in and and certainly after I won my primary, there was this pressure of saying, come on, kid, like, come in, you'll build your relationships, you'll take 30 years and then you can be in a position where you can be very effective. And we said no to that, too. Um, because we don't we don't have the time. We just don't have the time. And uh, and so we tried instead, instead of working on building our relationships with uh, instead of working on building our relationships inside the chamber, we worked on building our relationships with national coalition organizers and to say, hey, listen, I don't need to go golfing 30 times to get to curry favor with someone. We just need to ask their constituents to ask them to hop onto this bill, and they will. And, uh, and that is the beauty of democracy. And, uh, and I think that that, that is, again, is why it's so important for us to link 
everything together between the academics and the experts who know the goalposts and know how to get there to the frontline communities that will be able to pressure their elected officials to get it done and to say, hey, this is something we care about here in our homes. It is possible. Is it wildly ambitious? Yeah, but also, you know, I defeated a $4 million 20-year incumbent and everyone told me it was impossible too, but we can get it done. We just need to commit to our community. Thank you. And, um, and one last note, one last note is that uh, there's there's always this, um, one of the big pieces of criticism that we always get, and certainly that I always get because whatever with the media obsession and the right wing and whatever, is, uh, is that there is this idea that members of Congress have to be everything in one person. It goes to this like kind of weird, false, savior idea that we have about elected officials, but we're not saviors, we're public servants. And uh, I remember I remember uh, when I was taking in, in economics, a, a public, an economics and public policy class when I was an undergrad, and so often in these classes, you, you really see this difference between what is optimal and what the actual law is. And it's like, oh, geez, like, why, uh, why is this profoundly inefficient rule the rule? Or why is this very suboptimal thing uh, the actual law of the land instead of the optimal thing? And I remember my, my professor said at that time, he said, listen, as an economist, as an academic, as an expert, my job is to tell politicians what is best. It's not my job. It, and it's their job to get it done. And I think it's important to acknowledge that because my job isn't to have all the answers on my own. My job is to listen. My job is to listen to you, to get the plan about what needs to get done. And it's your job, it's part of your job, along with organizers, along with activists and advocates. Uh, it's your job to figure out what the optimal plan is and my job to take that plan and get it done. And I think that we've proven so far that we're pretty good, or at least we have a knack for getting some things done. But we, there's no way that we're gonna do it alone. It's going to take all of us. And I just thank everyone again in the room for, for being part of that army, because that's what it's going to take when we have a global threat, we have to answer it with the global ambition. So, so thank you very much um, for that. You do have a lot of folks here eager to be part of the uh, network feeding ideas into the mix. Oh, we have a question in the back. And I'm, Just, oh, do you have uh, time for one more, one, one, one more question? Yep. On exactly. Okay, so we're, we're gonna ask each speaker um, as we go through the rest of the program to introduce themselves very briefly. Thank you. Um, Alexandria Angel Cabrera, I'm the president of George Mason University, just across uh, the river from your new home. Bienvenida a Washington. I look okay. forward to uh, seeing you in, uh, uh, in our school. Just a quick question, and I, 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 I love the energy you're bringing to our neighborhood. I hope you don't lose it. Uh, one question, any chance, this may be a little naive, any chance that we can get at least some marginal bipartisan support uh, of any Green New Deal uh, legislation? Uh, I actually think we can. I do think that we can because, uh, because what this is, is the jobs bill. This is a jobs and infrastructure bill. And the way that we need to message this is the urgency of the bill is coming from the global climate crisis. But the a lot of the value and the importance of this bill comes from really what senator markey calls is the is a demand for a blue collar revolution what we are asking for is to put hundreds of thousands of roofers of electricians of steel workers to work this is a jobs bill this is a this is a new deal this is a 21st century new deal and what we need to do is, is when we message that, which has been the, the historic, um, you know, uh, weakness usually in legislation like this, but we are starting to, I think, make a lot of headway. 
uh, when we message this as a jobs bill, this is a jobs bill first. This is a, a community investment bill first. Uh, that it's enormously popular. And uh, one of the things that we're talking about is that, frankly, the president has no political ideology. He has um, an, a media objective and, a, and personal objectives, but he doesn't have a concerted political ideology. Just uh, Bill McKibben of 350.org was just telling me five years ago he was signing a letter in support of climate change uh, policy. And so, um, and like real climate change policy. So really, when you have a party that is so governed by the whims of whatever the day is, if we can control the day, then we can control the whim. And uh, and I think that if we build, if we build the political reality and to really put it on Republicans and to say, listen, like our first goal is that we need to we need to get it to pass the House. We have democratic control of the House. So now that we have democratic control of the House, if we can get it to pass that chamber, it's actually a lot easier than if we got control of the Senate and not got and didn't get control of the House. Because now that we got control of the Senate, we have a finite amount of senators that we're going to say that we can go to that are Republican or that are uh, more conservative Democrats. You can go and say, are you going to vote against the jobs bill? Are you going to vote against the jobs bill? Are you going to vote against infrastructure? And that suddenly changes the political calculus for them. That's a lot harder for them to do than to say, are you going to vote against climate change? It's no, are you going to vote against jobs? And for those folks, once we get uh, legislation past the House, I actually think that there's a, there's, there is a decent chance uh, that we can build the political will and political pressure if we message, if we're consistent about uh, what this legislation really is. Uh, Representative-elect, um, thank you very much uh, for your support for the sustainability agenda. Uh, congratulations again on your uh, recent election, and we thank you especially for your time this afternoon. All right, um, picking up where we left off, Daniel. <laughs> Could you tell us a little bit more so about it's a, the- It's an appropriate and painful se segue uh, for me, um, but appropriate is the same way we it started talking about, you know, academia and facts and knowledge and global. We just heard from just about the most galvanizing and inspiring uh, person elected to Congress in, in a long time um, with a real vision for this. And now we will go from there to the exciting, glamorous world of state legislatures. <laughs> but again, it's painful. You wouldn't want to do it in a class you teach, but it is correct because a lot of what Congress member elect was talking about there, a lot of the SDG agenda and an agenda for sustainability and um, reasonable development over the next decade is uh, going to be driven, must be driven and can only be driven at the state level. So, you know, we are trained, and, and she said it so well, we are trained to see individual elected officials as saviors. They aren't. Uh, in fact, um, when they're viewed too much as saviors, you see the kind of cult of personality that has some very dangerous undertones in the White House. And we are trained to see the federal government as more powerful than any other layer of government. Well, for better or worse, that is not really how the framers would have it. And even today, the state governments have this enormous ability to drive forward policies, the policies that you see throughout the sustainable development goals. And in fact, I would argue there has not been a major federal policy since the 1970s that didn't start at the state level. Now, a number of those federal policies are the corporatization of politics and government, are the reduction of uh, uh, meaningful uh, or intelligent regulatory regimes, but whether left, right, or center, state governments are where federal policies start, and whether or not they get taken up by the federal government, they have an enormous impact. When you look at the size of California's economy, or you add up California and New York and Florida, say, or Illinois, um, you are talking about major nation-size economies. 
And when you talk about the structural powers they have, Clean New Deal could be largely, not fuel efficiency standards, unfortunately, but in many other ways, largely driven at the state level. Uh, certainly our education system is overwhelmingly driven and defined at the state level uh, from early childhood through higher ed. Um, uh, when you talk about some sort of other basic environmental health and healthcare issues, you know, Obamacare was Romney care famously before it was uh, Obamacare. And before that, actually, I'm glad we have Representative Gabbard joining us. It was actually Hawaii care going back to the late 70s where they had largely figured out the challenge. State governments are an enormously powerful and completely ignored node of influence. Not actually completely ignored. That wasn't true. And I need to be careful what I say in this room. They are focused on quite a bit by narrow special interests. Narrow special interests that have a specific financial reason to focus on state legislatures. When you go up to Albany, which uh, I did, and 148 or so miles from here, it gets cold, the architecture is strange, but it's not empty. The halls are full, but they're not full of the people that Congress member elect Ocasio-Cortez was talking about, the activists and the organizers and the academics. They are full of the lobbyists for the narrowest special interests with the most to gain in a narrow financial sense. We have left these nodes of influence and power to them, and we have gotten the government that results from that, not just at the state level, but at the federal level. Today's dominant strain of politics was you know, created as sort of a radical uh, a radical uh, move in the 60s, started in some of the halls of academia, but it was, it was pretty far out there. It became mainstreamed in the 70s through a group called the American Legislative Exchange Council and a number of other strategies focused on the state level, well before Ronald Reagan brought it to the Oval Office. If we want to achieve these goals, we have to do it at the state level. So then the final challenge is how do you take the UN Sustainable Development Goals or that way of thinking how do you take you know, really deep, thoughtful work that's nuanced and sophisticated and apply it to state government? Well, it's not as uh, impossible as you might think. Uh, we've actually tried to translate the Sustainable Development Goals into something called America's Goals. And the reason to do that is, let's be honest, there are some branding challenges when you're talking about local politics with some of these ideas. But as we just heard, and this is true, and we've seen the polling and we've done the research to show it, there is not a substantive challenge when you are talking about the electorate. Overwhelming majorities of the electorate, true majorities of both parties and independents support this agenda, the America's Goals agenda, which is sort of the specific wording that we've focused on, but is really a reflection and translation of um, the Sustainable Development Goal agenda. It is extraordinary because you wouldn't know it hearing about politics. Power brokers, the narrow special interests that fund politics are not who I'm talking about. But if you want to go directly to the electorate, there's no better place than state legislative districts where you can knock on nearly every door in order to win races or not knock on them to lose. And it is the place that I believe this can take hold and it will be blocking and tackling, clearing the field, use whatever mixed metaphor you'd like for exactly the kind of federal Green New Deal we just heard about. So Daniel, I would just echo what you said about the opportunity at the state level. I've just uh, come from spending three years running Connecticut's Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. And one of the things we got done was to launch the first in the nation Green Bank to radically ramp up the deployment of clean energy, uh, renewable power, uh, energy efficiency, and a range of other supporting technologies and infrastructure investments. So I think you can see um, examples across the country uh, where that kind of activity is paying off. Uh, by the way, six states have now followed Connecticut in developing green banks, including the state of New York, uh, and about a dozen countries have. So it's not only that we can influence uh, the, the sort of development of policy across the nation, uh, we can actually shape it across the world. Can I ask, was there big enthusiasm, a lot of national media attention, covers of magazines, that sort of thing? One has to be prepared to receive the reward for this kind of work at a different time and a different place. Um, but I think uh, there are many in this room, uh, many of us who've chosen life in a university, 
who don't expect uh, adulation of the crowd and are eager and willing to do it just for the sheer sense of achievement uh, that we put down a marker and signal the right way to go. Um, and you know we're lucky. Uh, we're lucky in the world that there are people willing, uh, without that kind of a personal credit, to do the hard work. So I thank you again, all of you who are part of that uh, think tank uh, in support of sustainability that Jeff has described this network as being. Uh, let's see if there's another thought, comment, question um, for Daniel. Um, as you might be able to tell, I'm filibustering in support of uh, uh, Representative Gabbard getting here, right here. Can you talk a little bit about this divide that we see um, in the urban and rural areas of our states and in the importance that we have on the rural parts of our states, um, but recognizing the work that we have to do in the cities? Sure. Well? And North Carolina is a great example of it. In fact, just an election there that again reflected this divide, almost like two states had elections in North Carolina and one side happened to be bigger than the other. But um, you know, the city's point is actually a really important one. It's a little like the federal government point. Um, and, you know, and I, I would not sit up here and tell you the federal government is not important or cities aren't important, uh, mostly because I want to have credibility um, with all of you, not necessarily because I don't believe that that's somewhat true. If not true, certainly true relative to the kind of the conventional wisdom, the level of focus, resource and attention. The reason the federal government gets so much focus and attention is its power is obvious. I would actually argue that when you look at its obvious power, a lot of that comes out of the Department of Defense. It actually our vision of its power is Social Security and Medicare and the Department of Defense, none of which are new policy issues. And and but nonetheless, and with cities, I think it's because the potential for visible action is just so clear. You know, you frequently you have uh, uh, governments that are more responsive, partially because of a political, urban, rural and suburban increasingly divide partially because that's the work of cities. You know, cities are exciting places because they are delivering the services directly. They are the ones who are getting the solar panels installed and approving the certificates of occupancy for those new energy efficient buildings under building codes. Um, but let's remember cities are creations of states. Uh, they are, I mean, literally, as we know in New York City, as I knew during my uh, 25 minute delayed subway ride up here. Um, the services cities provide, or a lot of them are actually provided by states, and even when they're not, they are provided uh, under rules and regulations and corporations that are um, uh, creations of the state. So, you know, I think that uh, the temptation to work with cities is important. I know a lot of great work happens um, with cities, uh, and, um, you know, in my time in office, actually, because of where we were politically, I found a lot more success myself, even as a state official, working with the city and pushing them. I know you had Dan Zerilli this morning. He was a you know, partner which took two or three times a week about resiliency in my district and therefore around the city, uh, around uh, New York City. But I, I, we need to be able to uh, have state governments that are taking this on, partially because the city strategy to the point you were really making, I think, leaves out rural communities when you leave out rural communities, uh, it's very hard to achieve these goals. And certainly whatever goals you achieve, you do in a hyper polarized sort of broken or breaking democratic environment. It's the first reason. The second reason is states are where the power is. And everything you want to do in that city, you can do in the state. Everything you want to do in the state, you can't do in the city. And so I think it's really important, despite the political challenges that come with it, and just the unpleasantness of dealing with state government and state officials, present company accepted, um, it's really worth that work. And, and, it, and it, but it does require a reorientation. All right, further comments? Yes, in the back. Thank you. Hi, I'm Asma Latif. I'm with Bread for the World, um, which is an anti hunger organization based in DC. Um, it was really exciting to hear Alexandria talk about the, tw the 2030 deadline. She was doing that in the context of the IPCC report. But as you've been engaging folks around that 2030 um, timeline, what has been the reaction to that? I mean, does it seem, does 
is it, how do people respond to that? What do you associate it with? Is it, is it the UN goals or, or is it uh, goal setting in general? And how, how do people respond to that? And then in a, a related question, we've been you know, tr engaging our domestic anti-hunger partners on the SDGs. And it's really hard to translate the SDGs um, in to organizations that have not been familiar with the global um, context and not familiar with the MDGs. Um, and with limited bandwidth, they, they're struggling with how do you adapt this framework and what is the value add of this framework to the work that they do? So any insights you have on those questions? So I was hopeful because Jeff was out of the room when you first asked. I wanted to tell you a secret, so he's not listening, which is good. Um, so, uh, and this is around the 2030 question. It's an important one. In politics, the idea of 2030, the idea of a decade from now, is not what I would call a sword. It's not what you lead your political attack with. But I would say it's a shield. Because you know what the SDGs are, SDGs are and America's goals is a, sort of a simplified or distilled version of it are a bunch of targets that to the presentation we just heard earlier seem unrealistic. The biggest issue, you know, I said they're very popular across political spectrums. That's true. I didn't say they were very credible across political spectrums. In fact, as you do public opinion surveys and you go from left to center to right, from far left to left to center to right to far right, in fact, you see a, a, an essentially continuous line of decreasing belief they should happen. By which I mean on the far left, people say, yes, not only are these the right goals, the only reason they haven't happened to date is political corruption. And on the far right aside, who has a different view of society and life and death, um, but sort of the, the right or the moderate right, the mainstream right, yes, these are the right goals, this would be a better society, but it's pie in the sky, it's simply not realistic. That credibility uh, issue is the biggest one. 2030 is an important shield on the credibility question. Here's a vision, here's a set of goals that would be a better society, 70 or upwards of 75% of people agree. Two thirds of them say, but it's not realistic. And then you say, by 2030 it is. And they say, aha. If you lead with 2030, it feels irrelevant to people's lives, right? And politics really, at the end, people are pretty smart about their short-term self-interest in politics, in my view. Um, and th they're pretty good at sniffing out exactly what they're being sold. And I, 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 would, I would say that's even reflected in the 2016 election. And um, you need to, you want to offer them something that will impact their lives in the short term and is also credible. 2030 does that. Second thing is the idea of the UN, the Sustainable Development Goals, international norms, uh, flies uh, sort of like a lead balloon. And, um, uh, but the idea of goals, outcomes, and me accountability, measurability, is really appealing. Now, measurability, you know, a, a rubric with 17 metrics, each on a 16-point scale, is not appealing to people. That's just sort of offensive and alienating but specific, clear accountability and measurability that people can own themselves is a lot of the appeal of this. And you know, I think actually a lot of the genius of going back to the MDGs, this, this whole concept that we'll talk about all moving in the same direction, not about a litmus test to get to that direction. Um, and and uh, to your final question, uh, you know, I, I, I think that translating them is critical in the American political context. I think it's true of a lot of these brands. I think that any brands that have been seen to be elite or liberal or even Democratic Party affiliated, all of these do not capture a majority of the imagination of this country. They certainly don't expand beyond the urban and suburban places that we're now doing okay into, the, into other more rural parts of the country. So I think that's something that's sort of new and pure and not driven by an interest group. So in the state context, I talked about the special interests. The idea of an agenda that has a bunch of elites and academics and, you know, behind it, as opposed to the, the same old interest groups, even the ones we agree with, the ones that we call partners when they're on our side and interest groups when they're on the other, um, I think does have real appeal for folks. And that's one of the pure things here. This didn't come out of one of the folks who does have a financial interest in state government. It came out of this sort of outside you know, behind the curtain, very deep analytic 
framework. And I think that's actually help, helpful, not, not harmful. So Daniel, thank you very much. I think in the spirit of trying to keep the uh, program on time and to ensure a, a full uh, bit of time to discuss uh, the future of our network, uh, which Jeff is gonna lead us through, uh, we'll bring this part of the program to a close. Please join me in thanking Daniel and uh, the representative elect as well. Thank you. I really thank you for having me. I will never follow Congressmember Ocasio Cortez again. So forgive me for doing it. Thank you for being here. Congressman, uh, Congresswoman uh, Gabbard is on her way. Uh, so it's uh, just her uh, meetings finishing and then making it uh, uptown. Uh, so she'll be joining us at some time in the next uh, 20 minutes or so. And in the meantime, let's get started on brainstorming. We'll wrap up by four o'clock uh, as, uh, as promised. What do you think? What are we gonna do? Uh, let me put a few things quickly on the agenda and then uh, open it up and uh, roving mics uh, for brainstorming. First, uh, contact information. We want to facilitate the networking. We want you to bring in others who you think should be part of this, uh, other schools or other colleagues of yours or other departments that are really important. Somehow, a quick note of some key places in the university, key interests or capacities in your university that you want to really highlight. We're really working on X. This is something very exciting happening here. We would love more uh, networking on so-and-so. We're ready to host a, a group to talk about this particular issue and so forth. So. I don't exactly know how to collect that information, but our team will be collecting that information with you. And we will facilitate all of the intergroup contacts so that we're not uh, meant to be a filter or a valve or uh, a, uh, a blockade of uh, the interconnections. I want to repeat the idea of your schools taking on the challenge of organizing your states somehow for greater engagement and use the umbrella of SDSN to carry that. That comes with certain uh, help, I hope, uh, and uh, certain usefulness for the other schools that you reach out to. By the way, technically, all your schools need to be members of SDSN. So there is a membership process. It's uh, not an arduous one. There is no financial commitment or anything that is a burden from a university senate or president or any other point of view, but it's a registration process so that you're formally in membership and just make sure that you get that part done. Uh, and again, uh, Caroline and her team will be facilitating that. A couple of things uh, that I would like to suggest. One is that we have at least another meet, uh, and we'll have many meetings, but at least another New York based meeting in September for those of you who can make it. The September 23 to 28, I think, is the General Assembly opening week. There will be the SDG Summit on September 23, 24, uh, but that's an inside, uh, inside the house uh, operation of the UN, so that's not an open thing for us. But there's lots of interesting events going on around that because there will be about 160 or 170 heads of state coming specifically for that. 
as well as for a climate summit that the Secretary General has called. So you'll find it interesting. And we have normally, as I said, a two-day conference, International Conference on Sustainable Development, which is Thursday, Friday, I believe. Help somebody on our team. Who knows? Thursday, Friday, which is 2627. Anybody know? Get out your calendar. Okay, I think it's the 26th, 27th of September. I would recommend that we have a, an SDSN USA meeting around that time. And then some side sessions, you'll go to other things because we usually have heads of state coming to say interesting things when they come up from the UN uh, that day. But we'll have our group meet one of those two days mm -hmm. and we'll reserve a, this room or uh, another room like it so we have an SDSN USA meeting. But I would like other universities to be hosts of meetings either on specific topics or of this group uh, during the year or the following year. Uh, and right now, we're basically kind of on our own uh, financial bottoms uh, on this, which is that uh, SDSN will provide, uh, thanks uh, to Jen Gross, whom you met, and uh, other uh, very generous uh, supporters of this effort, the ability to have our secretariat, our team, our uh, in operations. But generally for meetings, uh, we're asking for hosts that can hold the local accommodations and so on uh, on a local budget of some kind and that people travel on their own uh, expense uh, almost always uh, in in these matters. So it costs something, but it's not crushingly heavy. And I hope that uh, people can uh, make an offer to uh, to host uh, such uh, such events and we will act as a, at least a clearinghouse to help facilitate that. We want to add in more members because we absolutely were at 39 states represented among our founding group. And I would like to get to 50 states for obvious reason. And I think there are a number that said we want to join, but the notice was too short. Uh, and uh, there won't be a problem in doing that, but we will aim to do that. And we'd welcome your suggestions and ideas and colleagues and why didn't you include so-and-so and so forth, which would be enormously helpful. In terms of what we should do as a group, well, first, one more thing. In terms of what we should do individually or in small groups, think about the cases you heard about the city engagement or the state level engagement. I will be happy to do what I can to help you in that. And by the way, when you want to have a an event in your state capital to say, our state really needs to get on top of that, one of the things our network can do is help to provide some interesting guests or speakers or other suggestions uh, that would be helpful for you. Uh, and that absolutely is a core part of this. You want to launch in your state an SDGs in your state uh, process, and it would be helpful to have people coming from around the country to say this is a wonderful thing and why it's important and some, uh, and, and some good examples. That's what the network can do, I guarantee it. Uh, really interesting guests, speakers, opportunities. That's the fun part that uh, Alejandro was talking about. Let's have fun with this and consider ourselves supporting each other to really pick this up. And when you go to your mayor, and if the mayor says, I, I don't really know about this, but what do you think? We can get New York City, Los Angeles, and others to directly call and say, this is a good thing. This has uh, been really helpful for us. And that's another piece of the, uh, of the uh, connection. Also, we can help make links for you 
almost any place in the world where you would like links and where you're working. And that, to my mind, is the greatest thing uh, because everyone wants to make the connections. And for our students, it's we saw you know, the wonderful internship programs uh, that uh, Glenn showed us. Phenomenal. We have 900 members all over the world. You want to do something, name a country, we have a member there, almost, almost. We're aiming for all 193 UN member states. We're not quite there yet, but that is also what we're aiming for. But for most countries, I'd say probably covering 95% of the world's population, we're there. And so that is another kind of service that I would like us to routinely we would like to have a field program in such and such country. Do you have a good contact uh, for us to? Why not? Because we probably do. And I know most of the counterparts would be delighted to have uh, that kind of contact. I'd like us to do at least <coughs> two things together. One is a course on SDGs in the USA. Again, I don't know how we're going to do it but I want you to volunteer. Uh, and uh, I want you to volunteer particular subjects that you're interested in, because what we'll do is put on an eight week or 10 week course where we're five minutes or 10 minutes in front of the camera or uh, organizing an hour session on a particular theme. Let's get that organized. We'll figure out also how to pay for it and so on. That's not too expensive and, and we we will get that solved, I promise, as a kind of core function. But I love the idea of a course that all our students can take that is not about the SDGs that they can find, but a course about the United States and the Sustainable Development Goals and other regions of the country and differences across regions and particular challenges in different parts of the country. That we don't have, but come on, let's do that and then show our congressmen and senators and, uh, and uh, others as a teaching tool. I think that that would be a nice thing to do. Second, I would like a, uh, a group of us, and I hope that means all of us, but it might mean some of us, to work on essentially the Green New Deal or essentially the energy transition uh, and to take up this challenge as a group, uh, because I do regard that as probably the issue that has the highest significance with the highest technical content, with the most that still needs to be put on the table for ideas and realism and getting the job done. And my suggestion is we are in December, December 3, 4, my watch is wrong, December 4, and uh, I think we should uh, say that we will have a report, not the definitive everything, but we will have a report by June on this issue so that we're not completely out of sync with the political cycle. But I think what we heard is that if we have something by June, we will be ready for some congressional hearings in the fall and probably the real workup of details will be in 2020 in advance of the election cycle. And so June will not be a final report, but it will be a statement about the core principles and the regional aspects of the energy transformation and the accelerants of the energy transformation. And that would be a great thing to do as a group. So I'm going to ask you, I'm, you're, you have to volunteer for that, to want to do that, and to want to pull in other colleagues on that as well. And we'll, again, be kind of mass communicating back and forth. And, but I would like to put together a group so that we can say to uh, Alexandria and to uh, other uh, congressmen and senators, to Senator Markey, uh, a good friend, we're working on this, uh, universities across the country. And it is also the case, you know it very, very well, 
and, and I want to emphasize something. This is not a partisan effort, obviously. We're coming from all different political uh, places, locations, geographies, alumni, boards, students, everything. There's no attempt to force anybody into anything uncomfortable. That is for sure. Nobody speaks for anybody else in this also. This is a voluntary organization. So do not worry about getting waylaid or pulled into something uncomfortable. You will not, I promise. But I do want to say, I believe one of the greatest strengths of this effort could be that as universities, we are not partisan and we speak to our local representatives and the representatives are going to be from both parties, but wherever they are politically, they are proud of your universities. They have to be your core constituents for them, but they are proud of their universities. Their children are going to your universities and they're wanting to build your university. So when you give them a message, they will be responsive across the board. And we have, by the way, a great excuse for me to shut up now uh, because uh, we have a fantastic uh, representative, Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard, here with us. And I could not be more thrilled. Tulsi, thank you for joining us. We just had Alexandria on the line talking a bit about the Green New Deal. And uh, you are uh, awaited with phenomenal excitement. And I, again, I want to say on behalf of all of us, we're grateful for your leadership because it's very special in Congress. And we're very, very happy that you're here. Please. Aloha. You're right, Jeff. We are very proud of our universities. And I know we have someone here from the University of Hawaii. There she is. Welcome. Aloha. <laughs> I hope your jacket is warm enough. These are the things we have to weigh because we're not used to them. Um, I, I'm just so grateful to be here. This kind of came about by happenstance. I was just passing through New York yesterday. I was supposed to be on a train a few hours ago, but I saw Jeff last night and he mentioned what you all were doing and gathering here today. And I was really thrilled uh, to be able to come and, and just join the conversation. I hear the day has been inspiring to be able to gather the best minds from across the country who are looking at our future, the future of our country, the future for our people, and how we can make sure that it is one that is not only livable, uh, but that prospers. There's nothing more fundamental to us as people than having clean air to breathe and clean water to drink and a safe place to live. These are values and principles that bind us all together, that transcend a lot of the differences and the, the divisiveness that we deal with in Washington and that often get in the way of making real progress on legislation and on these issues, even though really at their core, they're fundamental to our very existence. And so as we look forward, I see great opportunity. There are great obstacles, no doubt, but there is great opportunity if we can focus on that existential need that we all have and that we all share in making it so that these priorities are at the forefront. But as we look at the crises that we are facing today on many levels and how we must change, we can ask ourselves those tough questions about how is the way that we live our lives impacting our today and our future? How is the food that we are eating and where is it coming from and how is that impacting our today and our future? The ways that we are working, the ways that we are living in our society. What this will require, the kind of transformational change that we know that we need will require having very clear achievable objectives, having a clear vision for where we want to go, where we need to go as a country and having a real strategy to affect that change that both addresses our short-term needs as well as what we know are the long-term needs 
how to achieve that long-term vision, and then to make that investment of the necessary resources to execute this strategy. And this is where having all of you come here today and what seems to be a bit of a historic gathering is so critical because this will require harnessing all of the resources that we have in this country, harnessing the technology that we have in this country, and keeping that focus and that discipline on where we need to go and how we need to get there. I think one of the biggest frustrations in Washington these days is we are so reactive. There's something new popping up every single day and you turn left and you turn right and you're reacting, you're reacting, you're reacting. And meanwhile, time passes by and we find ourselves much farther back, much farther behind than where we need to be and in a much deeper hole. We are not making progress. We're regressing. Coming from Hawaii, for so many reasons, I'm so grateful. But one of them is that we have the opportunity to learn from the great lessons that have been shared with us by those who have come before us, our indigenous leaders. In Hawaii, we would call them our kupuna. Those who in their lives lived in a very sustainable way, thinking not just about how to feed their families and their children, but how to live in a way that would sustain for generations. They provide the model for us as we look at all the tools that we have available to us to develop sustainably, but making sure that it's built on that foundation that they have laid down for us. And in Hawaii, this is called ahupua'a. This is something that we've grown up in Hawaii and understanding that protecting our environment is not a conceptual thing. It's not a political issue. It's a way of life. In Hawaii, the ahupua'a consisted basically of a slice of land starting at the very top of the mountains and going all the way out to the shore and often following the boundary of a stream drainage. These ahupua'a varied in size depending on the different parts of the island or the economic means of those places. But really what it was is a belief that the land, uh, the ocean, the clouds, and the rain that came were all interconnected and all provided the resources that people needed to live and survive and thrive. The responsibility that we have to take care of these resources, to utilize them, not just for the sake of consumption, but to utilize them based on the needs of our people and the needs of our society is the framework with which we need to see how we can rebuild our own future. In Hawaii, we have a number of initiatives that we've been working on. Uh, most recently, the Hawaii 2050 Sustainability Plan that seeks to do just that, build off of the model that was set forth by those who came before us, but use the tools available to us uh, to make sure that our home is, is livable and thriving and sustainable for generations to come. Uh, we have our work cut out for us in Washington. A lot, much, a lot more progress needs to be made. And part of the problem, the, the obstacle that we often face there is people on quote unquote different sides of issues are not even willing to have the conversation. Again, this is where as Jeff was talking about as I walked in, where each of you have such a, a powerful role to play because you're not coming in the door with a partisan label that often says, well, you're not on my team, so I can't talk to you, or we have nothing that we share. You already have that open line of communication, that relationship that brings with it a lot of power and opportunity and influence to break things down to the basic needs in our communities that we share, whether it is from Hawaii or from New York or from Missouri or Kansas or Alabama or any state in this country. And that is a powerful um, opportunity that you can leverage for good. To me, these conversations have to uh, start on what we in Hawaii call aloha, which is respect, love, and care, that common bond that we share. And I want to close on a quote from Queen Liliokalani, 
uh, about what aloha really is, because to me, this is at the heart of what we are all trying to do. It is at the heart of this uh, higher level of consciousness with which we are approaching how we need to live our lives and how we make sure that our future uh, exists for the next generation. Queen Liliokalani said, and wherever the native Hawaiian went, he said aloha in meeting or in parting. Aloha was a recognition of life in another. If there was life, there was mana, goodness and wisdom. And if there was goodness and wisdom, there was a God quality. One had to recognize the God of life in another before saying aloha. But this was easy. Life is everywhere, in the trees, in the flowers, the ocean, the fish, the birds, the peely grass, the rainbow, the rock, all in all the world was life, was God, was aloha. Aloha in its gaiety, joy, happiness, abundance. Because of aloha, one gave without thought of return. Because of aloha, one had mana. Aloha had its own mana. It never left the giver, but flowed freely and continuously between giver and receiver. Aloha could not be thoughtlessly or indiscriminately spoken, for it carried its own power. No Hawaiian could greet another with aloha unless he felt it within his own heart. If he felt anger or hate in his heart, he had to cleanse himself before he said aloha. During these times where we are seemingly surrounded by hatred and anger and disrespect and bigotry, where there is such a lack of recognition of that which binds us all together, the Queen's words are a perfect reminder of our interconnectedness, of that which we share which provides us with that pathway forward on how we can overcome these obstacles and bring that light of love, of aloha, to the forefront of our work. Thank you for your service and your leadership in building that path for everyone. Mahalo. I think an, an idea that came to mind uh, in uh, listening to, uh, to the Congresswoman is um, one thing we might think about uh, in addition to getting together, maybe choosing one day where all of our universities and colleges are having an SDG open house across the country. And that what we're doing is inviting the communities in, the political leaders in, the governors, the mayors, the Congress people in, and that it is a kind of national discussion of these issues because this is something else that as a network we could do. And uh, that brought that to mind. So if I could put that on our agenda for brainstorming as well, uh, I would uh, like, to, like to suggest that. So uh, we have uh, 17 minutes for, uh, clarifications and ideas, discussion, and uh, the floor is open again. Please, and the mic, uh, please, whoever has the mic, uh, let's uh, hurry, and I promise I'm not gonna say very much, <laughs> or I'm gonna try not to. <laughs> so uh, thanks everyone for an uh, inspiring day. I'm Jonathan London from UC Davis. Um, one of the things that seemed really important about the SDG process in other countries is this really rich um, 
collaboration between civil society and the academy. And I think we, we've had some, some of that represented here. I'd love to see for future steps even more of that to really think about whether that's the business <laughs> community, which we have a little bit here, uh, but uh, NGOs, INGOs, also a lot of emphasis in the SDGs about youth leadership. Uh, and um, really thinking about intergenerational connections um, that uh, that can be really powerful, uh, that sort of el elder youth um, alliance. Uh, and then I think just continued focus with um, Ocasio-Cortez uh, statement about movement uh, legislation to think about how are universities connected to social movements and needing to still keep our objective rigor on the one hand, but also this kind of open university community partnership, I think would be a powerful uh, direction. Th thanks, thanks a lot. Hands up. Yep. If so. Great, please. Jeff, uh, thanks again for the, for the leadership and getting us organized. <clears throat> um, just as a reminder, Angel Cabrera, George Mason University, we would love to uh, to host this group. I think the the Washington region, for all the reasons that now are obvious, would be a good uh, good place to meet. So, Wonderful. Uh, uh, nuestra casa es su casa. Um, the the question about uh, the global dimension, you briefly mentioned it earlier. Just uh, as I as as you know, we're working the context of APLU, the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities. We've created a, a network, which is actually in the nascent stages, but it's uh, it's growing. We have about 80 uh, universities from all over the world dedicated to global engagement. And, and as part of that, uh, we see aligning our research and service missions uh, with the with the uh, sustainable development goals. Although our commitments go even beyond that into uh, really favoring the the exchange of uh, of people and ideas and students and so on. Uh, by the way, all the universities here are uh, welcome to join the movement. It's globally engaged universities. There's a website. The process of signing is also very, very simple. But the question, and, and I look forward to exploring this also offline with Maria and Caroline and you, but uh, any thought that you may have about what is the global dimension of this? And I realize how important it is the local connectedness of, of the goals. But uh, but some of us are also very interested in helping students understand the connectivity of the goals uh, on a global level. Thank yeah, you. Th thanks a lot. And very, very briefly, could we, could we plan on an event uh, either in the spring or fall where we meet at uh, George Mason and then plan actually to fan out to Congress, for example, for discussions or use the base as the opportunity to have a meeting and an engagement with the Washington uh, politicians. I think that'd be fantastic. So we'll follow up on that. And then uh, this is a global network, so we'll connect. Uh, our network is 900 uh, members now, probably significant overlap as we were discussing. We'll figure that out, but we'll figure out how to put these efforts uh, to merge them, and, or not merge them, but connect them uh, closely uh, so that your effort is, uh, I hope, given a boost by this and also more connections. Uh, but uh, we'll, make, we'll make that alignment work. Please. Yep. And then we'll go around. Hi there. Uh, ben Packard with Earth Lab at the University of Washington. And I'd just put a, like to put a plug. We heard about the importance of um, governors, mayors, and CEOs. And uh, the Global Compact is, seems to be uh, continuing to grow momentum in the corporate community. And all of us, to make this local, need the relevance of the corporate community in our respective geographies. So I'd love to hear in future meetings more about how we can work together and in sync with the Global Compact. Wonderful. And just a very quick mention of that. Uh, I mentioned this morning Jackie Corbelli. She'll be working with the Global Compact and making that connection. Uh, Lisa Kingo, who directs the Global Compact, is a close colleague of mine at the UN, will make sure that that connection works and actually also helps to support business communities throughout the country. And so it's, it's a very good idea, and we'll follow up on that. Hi, I just uh, I love all the work here and all the connections we've been making. Um, in addition to the policy work and the research, I'd also like to um, encourage us to think about actual actions, so projects we can do between universities and cities that are actually going to sort of 
further either what we're doing, build the next generation of leaders, or actually like, prove out our methodologies. Do you have some suggestions you want to make right now? Um, Cross-cutting ones like homelessness would be a particular interest, but also Mayor Garcetti co-chairs the group of 420 climate mayors. So if we wanted to try something very specific with all of the energy around climate, I think that would be great. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Ellen Pickett, Stony Brook University, School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences. Um, this has been a very inspiring day. And in the spirit of let no goal be left behind, yeah. <laughs> and being, I think, the sole person attending who works on the ocean, um, I, I will volunteer my services over the coming year to help fill the gap in the U.S. Um, report Wonderful. On, on oceans. I also, Ellen uh, is one of the <laughs> world leaders in marine ecology and in complex uh, marine uh, food chains and uh, why unidimensional uh, models of fisheries don't work. And she gave me a great education in this many years ago. And uh, this is a perfect time to integrate this into our into the planning and thinking of uh, of, of uh, this network. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, I also thought that maybe for the meeting in September, you know, SUNY Global has a great facility much closer to the UN, and we could look into using that as a base Wonderful. for our conference. It's on 55th in Lexington. Um, and I would love to work with those of you in New York on a New York-based plan. Thanks. Thank you. Wonderful. Great. So I just um, wanted to reiterate the fact that um, all of this is going to need some funding. <laughs> so um, one of the things that I want to bring... introduce yourself to everybody? Yes. <laughs> so I'm Maria Yule from the U.S. National Science Foundation. But more importantly, I'm actually from the Belmont Forum. And that is a group of 29 other NSF-like organizations that have come together to support inter- and transdisciplinary research, solutions-oriented research. Um, we've had lots of different calls for proposals. Um, right now, we have one that's open on ocean sustainability, um, so have a look at that. Mm -hmm. Food security and safety is coming up, so for the food security group. Um, but we are also looking at putting together a call for proposals in the next, let's say, 15 months or so that will focus on pathways and earth system targets for the SDGs. Wow. So I ex wholeheartedly expect... <laughs> that this group will um, coordinate with their uh, researchers in your universities to get them to work with their international counterparts to have fantastic approaches for this. Um, so I just want to say that there are groups out there that have heard this. We're not, you know, we don't have the billion dollars yet. <laughs> um, but we are able to put things together. And I do want to encourage you to not underestimate the convening power, but the voice that you have to bring to your national funders, okay? Don't underestimate that. That's a great idea, thank you. Uh, please, over on the other side of the room, thank you. Uh, oh, okay, Paul, and then uh, we'll go to the other, yeah, then we'll go over here, yeah. Uh, thanks, Jeff, and also thanks to Maria and Caroline and Giovanni and your whole team for a very exciting day of conversation. I'm particularly excited about the third element that you had mentioned in your opening remarks about the USSDSN having the convening power to support a political process to, in transition to sustainability. I think that's where the biggest value add can be done. And after hearing Ocasio-Cortez and uh, Tulsi Gabbard, I'm more convinced that this is the moment if we just create a network that is uh, doing things in the sustainability field without a distinctive character, we are probably going to not get noticed. There are already at least a dozen that are floating around in my head. People mentioned ASHI and Global Compact and, and, and you know, the dozen. So how do we distinguish this network in terms of its implementation power? I think we need a focus, and I think the focus could be we take Daniel, uh, Squadron. Uh, yeah, his uh, idea seriously, then trying to do something at the state level, or maybe have a few foci 
state could be one, cities could be another, maybe there are a dozen themes, half a dozen themes. But I would be very interested because my university having 23 campuses across Pennsylvania is a natural place to implement SDGs in our campuses. We are committed to it, we are doing it, we are bringing together a number of other local networks, but we need support. You mentioned uh, the SDS and USA being able to draw new types of talents. Well, I would like to see a structure that allows us to focus on these few themes, and we would be happy to contribute to the state level implementation of SDGs. Excellent, thank you very much. There's perfect ideas. Oh, yes, please. Paul Perrin with the University of Notre Dame. Um, one of the activities that we've done with our students is as we present each of the SDGs is they, they start to articulate and identify not only the synergies between them, but also the potential conflicts between them. And I wonder if, is, if there isn't an opportunity for us. Um, I, I think that we ignore the, the tensions and the conflicts and the synergies between them at our own peril. Um, if, if we can't find a way to articulate these as an ecosystem and not as 17 individual goals. And one way we might start to do that would be to, to start to do a more formal mapping. We saw pieces of it, but formal mapping of the tensions and the interconnections so that when we meet with decision makers, we're not going in with idealism, which I think is, is warranted in a lot of cases, but in this case, I think we really have to be able to help them think through the pros and cons and the, the different interactions there. Great, thank you. There are some good analyses of this, which uh, I'll both share and think about what that might mean for our group also. Please. Sure. Let's uh, uh, all be brief and uh, we'll try to get all the comments in. Yeah. Very brief. Uh, Gene Morse, University of Buffalo, representing the SUNY Global Health Institute. Just two quick things from NIH uh, perspective. I think the Fogarty Center has a really nice model of trying to figure out how to bring together academics with government, with communities through their application process because you can't get funded unless you bring all of those together. I think in the U.S. we're not as good at that. And the other thing is that the NIH has re-engineered re all of clinical research through the Clinical and Translational Science Institutes, making implementation, which is really the, the thing that's been staggering. For example, most clinical trials don't enroll people to study what we're trying to study. So they've reorganized everything. Very good models there through NIH that I think will complement the NSF. Perfect. Thank you. Please, uh, Clayton, and yeah, and then one, two, three, four, and that uh, five, and then uh, that will finish it. No more hands. Uh, thanks, Professor Clayton, for our uh, executive director of ideas for us. Um, in your opinion, what is the number one thing that we need to collectively accomplish by the by 2020 in order to achieve the goals by 2030? The clarity of what to do, by far. The actual what to do, not the motivation for doing it, not why it's so important, but the actual what to do. This is what is fundamentally missing. And this is fundamentally what serious science engineering implementation science is about, the actual what to do's. Okay. Uh, John Aki, Alabama Party, uh, Auburn University, Alabama. One of the... Uh, proudest things that uh, Auburn University does is uh, we have this International Quality of Life Award uh, that was launched back in 1994 in conjunction, in conjunction with the uh, United Nations uh, International Family of the Year. Actually, as a matter of fact, yesterday evening at the United Nations, some of the individuals who have uh, actually worked so hard to promote the quality of life at the global level were recognized yesterday. So for the past 25 years, we have been doing that one, and we are very proud of that. I thought that would be a good practice for other universities. Phenomenal. Thank you very much. And we'll make that known when we get our website up, and I think that should be featured and explained. Please. Sorry, who's next? Yeah. One, two, and then uh, one, three. Three more. Okay, okay. thank you. I'm uh, Tim Jackner from University of Cincinnati, where I've just taken up the deanship of the College of Design, Architecture, Art, and Planning. And I notice there are 
are at least a few others from the creative professions broadly defined on the fringes here. I noticed a few on the fringes of the Habitat Conference in Quito in 2016. We take part in these UN events, but I think it's, I would like to encourage those in these professions to help move our professions a bit more to the center of the discourse. There's a lot of, a lot of knowledge coming from the scientific, from the economic, from the political directions. I think the design professions broadly defined as going from art through design, architecture to planning, have potentially a lot to contribute to this. And that, so anyone, immediate invitation, introduce yourself to me before leaving the room. But I, I would be very interested in being a part of this in the long term. Fantastic. One thing we'll do is suggest some thematic groups and thematic efforts for people to indicate participation in those. We had a long discussion yesterday with the, some wonderful architects actually coming from France about exactly these issues also. So we said we would try to have a conference in the spring on uh, urban design, uh, quality of life, uh, and uh, um, probably in New York. But we'll also try to get a thematic group around this idea for the US. Yeah, please. Thank you very much for a wonderful meeting. I learned a lot from both listening to people around, uh, listening to people at the at the table, but also talking to people during the meetings. I wonder if it's possible to organize a significant part of the next meeting around ideas that come from people who are in the room and that they submit as things on which to act. Because there is so much knowledge and so much experience in this room, it would be a shame to not benefit from it during our next meeting and to organize a significant significant part of the event around what people here would like to do. Wonderful. And again, I hope we can use a website and active contact so that we're not waiting between meetings, but we're actually brainstorming actively. And I think uh, final speaker, so <laughs> please. Hello, um, I'm Vera Mitzner. I'm from the National Council for Science and the Environment. I'll be very brief. Um, so we are a Washington-based, nonpartisan, not-for-profit organization, and we advance informed uh, political decision-making on environmental issues through science. So we have around 100 uh, universities in the U.S. as our members, and many of these universities are rep um, re representatives of these universities are in this room today. I just wanted to underline that we are a great resource. I'm very happy to ally with you and uh, anyone here because we talk to policymakers and we talk to researchers and we really work hard to establish this bridge. So that's our mission. And um, you can please come to talk to me if your university is not a member or if you want to engage somehow. Bravo, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of a marvelous opening day. I feel like we have a, a lot more to discuss uh, and a rich agenda. I apologize uh, for not having as much discussion as we need, but we packed in a lot today. It's only the beginning. People traveled uh, a long way and I'm really grateful for that. I hope you feel that it's something exciting to continue. I'm very, very excited myself about what we're going to do together, and I look forward to uh, the very active continuation. We'll figure out how to use all virtual means to keep us uh, connected in between uh, the uh, real uh, gatherings when, when we are together in person. We have a date in Washington. We have another date in New York. Uh, we have uh, invitations uh, in other parts of the country. We have the launch of the Mexico network in uh, March for those of you who may have particular interests uh, or desires to, to be present there. I would like us by next year to produce a MOOC. I would like us next year to produce a report by June. Uh, and uh, I think uh, maybe next year, let's say not maybe, let's aim to produce one national SDG day on our own campuses if we could aim to do that next fall, uh, probably in a year's time, but all across the country uh, that this is put on the agenda. 
And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I apologize for uh, finishing three minutes late, but uh, thank you very, very much. Safe travels home.